written, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Honourable members, I respectfully acknowledge that we are sitting today on the land of Aboriginal people and pay my respects to elders past and present. I thank them as First Australians for their careful custodianship of the land over countless generations. We are very fortunate in this country to have two of the world's oldest continuing living cultures in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose lands, winds and waters we all now share. Honourable members, I have to report that I have received from His Excellency the Governor a letter in respect of assent to a bill. The contents of the letter will be incorporated in the record proceedings. I table the letter for the information of members. Honourable members, I have to report that the writ issued by His Excellency the Governor on the 29th of June 2021 for the election of a member to serve in the Legislative Assembly for the Electoral District of Stretton has been returned to me with a certificate endorsed thereon by the Electoral Commissioner of Queensland uh, of the election on the 24th of July 2021 of James Robert Martin to serve as such member. I table the endorsed writ for the information of the House. I now call the Honourable Member forward to take the oath of allegiance and of office. Honourable Members, on behalf of the Parliament, I welcome to the Queensland Legislative Assembly the new member for Stretton. Uh, are there any matters of privilege? Mr Speaker. I call the member for Corrupted. Mr Speaker. In the debate on the defamation model provisions and other legislation amendment bill on the 15th of June 2021, my reference to all other jurisdictions was made to the three states outlined by the member for Clayfield. This was not intended to be a sweeping statement to reference every other Australian jurisdiction. My remark was made off the cuff, and I accept that without context it could have appeared to be misleading, and I apologise for that. However, I can assure you, Mr Speaker, that I did not intend to mislead the House. 
Uh, thank you, Member for Corumba. Uh, Honourable Members, I lay upon the table of the House the Statement for Public Disclosure Expenditure of the Office of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly for the period 1 July 2020 to 30 June 2021. And it's down. <laughs> Former Treasurers have to say these things. Uh, Honourable Members, in accordance with Standing Order uh, 11, I advise that I have discharged Mr Les Walker, Member for Muddingborough from the panel of temporary speakers, and I have appointed Mr James Martin, Member for Stretton, to the panel. Yeah. Honourable Members, I report that pursuant to the relevant provisions of the Crime and Corruption Act I report that pursuant to the relevant provisions of the Crime and Corruption Act 2001, Mr Michael Woodford has been appointed as the Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Commissioner for the term of three years, commencing 22 August 2021. Mr Woodford was admitted to practice as a barrister of the Supreme Court of Queensland in 1998. Throughout his 22 years of practice, he has worked for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and at the private bar. He has extensive experience in criminal litigation, including uh, appellate work and administrative law matters, as well as being retained as counsel in various inquest and inquiry matters. This appointment of Mr Woodford has the bipartisan support of the Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Committee. On 19 August 2021, I tabled the relevant notice of appointment as required under the Act. Honourable Members, on the 27th of May 2021, the Ethics Committee tabled its report number two. 06, which dealt with allegations made against the member for Morani and Mr Troy Thompson. The committee found Mr Thompson in contempt for disorderly conduct and recommended that the Speaker ban Mr Thompson from the parliamentary precinct under Section 50 of the Parliamentary Service Act 1988. Accordingly, I advise the House that on 16 July 2021, I issued a direction which provides that Mr Thompson should not be permitted to enter the Queensland parliamentary precinct. This direction is intended to apply indefinitely until revoked. Honourable Members, on 19 July 2021, I tabled a ruling regarding matters of privilege relating to a complaint by the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. It alleged that a member for Nindri deliberately misled the House on 25 May 2021. I ruled that the matter did not warrant the further attention of the Ethics Committee. I now refer to the matter so that if any member wishes to exercise their rights in respect of that matter, understanding orders, they should do so immediately. <coughs> Honourable members, I wish to advise uh, members that we will be visited in the gallery this morning by students and teachers from Nunda State School in the electorate of Nudgee. Yeah. And finally, members, I wish to draw your attention to the tie I'm wearing today. I, I try. Members, I, uh, I purchased this tie at an opportunity shop. It is bearing the Queensland uh, emblem, the coat of arms. And I mention this to the House today because uh, it's important to note that once upon a time, a public servant of some description, an anonymous person wore this tie, doing their job for the state of Queensland. And it's very important to note that uh, that tie is now being worn by the Speaker of the Queensland Parliament. But it's very important also to note that we're all on the same team. We're all here to serve the people of Queensland. Yeah. Honourable Members, are there any appointments to be announced? Will the clerk read the list of petitions lodged? The following Honourable Members have lodged paper petitions for presentation and e-petitions which are now closed and presented. Mr Perrett from 4,205 petitioners requesting the House to provide Gympie Hospital with paediatric doctor and ward. Mr Muckleberg from 499 petitioners requesting the House to install noise abatement barriers along the Bellflower Road, Sippy Towns. The following honourable members have lodged e-petitions which are now closed and presented. Mr Andrew from 363 petitioners requesting the House to ensure that the height of Rookwood Weir's wall is raised by a full one metre to restore the Weir's capacity to the original promise volume of 76,000 millilitres. Mr Perrett from 236 petitioners requesting the House to investigate the numerous accidents and near misses at the David Drive and Bruce Highway at the Puma service station at Coorra, Queensland and to reduce the speed limit from 100 kilometres to 80 kilometres per hour around the site. 
Mr Carter from 586 petitioners request the House to repurpose the vacant Eventide residential aged care facility hostel accommodation area at Charles Towers as desperately needed residential accommodation for elderly low income earners. Mr Hart from 275 petitioners request the House to review the existing conditions and placement of identified troubled tenants to make sure they are located in supervised appropriate accommodation. Mr Hart from 1,274 petitioners request the House to change the Bail Act and introduce a range of measures to halt the increase of youth crime in the electorate of Burley. Mr Stevens from 514 petitioners request the House to allow the recommendations of the Griffith University research team regarding the condition of the water of Lake U months in Mermaid Waters to be immediately actioned and maintained that budgeted annually until the lake has been restored. Mr Macdonald from 1,933 petitioners request the House to acknowledge the Warrego truck decoupling station in Gatton as the truck driver's workplace and install adequate toilet facility for these workers. Ms Pugh from 548 petitioners request the House to establish a statue of our most capped Queenslander Claire Pokinghorn at Suncourt Stadium. Honourable Ryan from 925 petitioners request the House to increase funding for community legal services in the Morton region. Mr Hart from 1,422 petitioners request the House to hold a public meeting in Palm Beach to listen to local residents and answer their questions on the plan to extend the right rail south along Gold Coast Highway through Palm Beach, Cromwell and Tugan. Mr Domedo from 3,051 petitioners request the House to legislate that all vehicle manufacturers must provide electronic warning devices in new vehicles that alert the driver to the children who are left unattended in a vehicle. The following lodged e petition sponsored by the clerk and our closing was entered. 3,021 petitioners requesting the House to demonstrate compassion and care by legislating to strengthen puppy farm laws. 820 petitioners requesting the House to replicate New South Wales 2016 legislative changes and amend strata title legislation to provide model bylaws that can be adopted by special resolution to protect lot owners and tenants from smoke penetration from other, other lots or common property. 89 petitioners requesting the House to install pedestrian crossings at both car park entry points at Ripley Valley State High School, State School, sorry. 4,792 petitioners requesting the House to amend the Manufactured Home Residential Parks Act to protect residents from an unscrupulous price fixing and alleviate unwarranted pressure on the QCAT grievance process. 562 petitioners request the House to address the problem of litter by undertaking a statewide litter awareness and education program, increase litter fines, strengthen litter laws to allow on the spot fines and to adequately resource local governments to enforce litter legislation devolved to them by the state. 2,296 petitioners request the House to legislate to respect advice of the Independent Scientific Panel commissioned by the Queensland Government which recommended the ban on petroleum gas activities and the unacceptable risk associated with gas <laughs> fracking in the channel country of Queensland, the floodplains of Katai, Thunder, Lake Eyre Basin. 751 petitioners requesting the House to mandate local councils to allocate 25 per cent of council owned caravan parks as permanent housing. 720 petitioners requesting the House to consider giving the people the choice of more direct democracy in our system of government and a voice on contentious issues by introducing citizens initiated referendums. 229 petitioners requesting the House to alter the various state and council housing guidelines and laws and make compulsory the installation of solar panels and batteries for all new, used and rental houses before contracts are signed and to remove all wood burning fires and stoves and not allow them into new buildings. 547 petitioners requesting the House to implement the duty of care imposed by Justice Broomberg by stopping all new coal licences which have not begun mining coal and take other measures to lower emissions throughout the state. We have been away for some time. Uh, notifications of the tablets are called the clock. I inform the House of the tabling of certain papers in accordance with the notification and tabling of papers document emailed to members. Uh, honourable members, uh, just by way of advice, I will be not wearing a mask um, for uh, the duration of preliminary business and uh, through my time in the chair, uh, which may also apply to other uh, members in the chair at certain periods, uh, the reason being that uh, it is uh, very uh, unexpectedly that we are interrupted. As you are aware, there are no standing orders which allow for any interjections of any kind whatsoever but they do occur, apparently, from time to time. So uh, that will be uh, the way we will be proceeding going forward. Uh, I, um, 
Are there any ministerial papers? I call the Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr Speaker, I lay upon the House the public report for ministerial expenses for the period 1 July 2020 to the 30 June 2021. The report shows that government's office expenses for the period before and after the 2020 general election. The report shows higher charter costs and domestic travel due to increased travel for official purposes during the period of the election, as is the, as is the case every election year. I commend the report to the House. Thank you, Premier. Are there any ministerial notices of motion? Are there any ministerial statements? I call the Honourable the Premier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, Queensland has recorded no new cases of COVID overnight. In fact, yeah. Mr Speaker, it's a double donut day. So we love those and I'm very proud of Queensland. We have 23 active cases. We have 1,979 total cases since the pandemic, pandemic began. 11,257 tests. So if I can urge Queenslanders, if you are feeling sick at all, to please go and get tested. 15,621 vaccines were administered yesterday by Queensland Health. And I can advise uh, Mr Speaker that Queensland now has 51.3% of eligible people have had one dose of the vaccines. We've hit that magical 50% uh, mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 3176 have had two doses. So that's great news today. Mr Speaker, Queensland can be proud of its handling of this pandemic. While COVID's Delta strain brings fresh waves um, of concern, especially in New South Wales, Queensland was able to contain our Delta outbreak in little more than a week, and I thank all those uh, families that participated in home quarantine. As I've said many times, the credit for this belongs to every single Queenslander in this state. Nine days after the first case of our Delta outbreak, we were out of lockdown. We have now gone nearly four weeks without a case in our community. If you compare Queensland with uh, New South Wales and Victoria, our children are at school. Our businesses are open. Our restrictions continue to ease. The clear lesson is that if you go hard and go early, you can get on with life. But, Mr Speaker, no one pretends that the sacrifices necessary for our safety are easy or that our battles with this virus are over. We, we, we must make the most of this window of opportunity to encourage as many people as possible to get vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. This week, I announced that a new mass vaccination hub will open at the Boondal Entertainment Centre, eventually adding another 3,000 vaccinated Queenslanders a day. Yeah. Further announcements will follow in coming weeks, making the process of registering easier. Mr Speaker, no one wants another outbreak. I know the decisions we have made to keep <laughs> Queensland safe are tough. I know the impacts on families are hard. Starting next week, we will start a trial of allowing children in boarding schools in hotspot areas to return to their families in time for the September school holidays. They will be allowed to quarantine with their families at home. We will use technology that will help in the supervision and care of these families. And we'll also closely monitor trials that are, that are currently being conducted in South Australia. Mr Speaker, as difficult as these days are, they are better than the havoc of having the massive outbreaks that have cost dozens of lives, lives shut entire jurisdictions and left families completely unable to live as we do in Queensland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, our quarantine hotels, which have been our frontline defence during the global pandemic, were never made for quarantine. And as Australia contends with the dangerous and deadly Delta variant, including very concerning growing outbreaks down south, we are finding it increasingly more difficult to contain the spread. We are stretched to the limit. We must have alternatives to our hotel quarantine system that better protects Queenslanders. As this House knows, we've been calling on the federal government to establish fit-for-purpose regional quarantine facilities for a long time. After all, quarantine is a federal government responsibility. Right. And while we welcome the recent signing of an MOU with the Commonwealth to build a quarantine facility at Pinkenbar, a regional quarantine facility like Howard Springs in the Northern Territory has always been our goal. It is a no-brainer. Away from the dense populations where um, people can be spread out with lots of fresh air and right beside an international airport. Two facilities are better than one. A 1,000-bed Queensland Regional Accommodation Centre at Wellcamp, jointly with the Wagner Corporation, will greatly reduce reliance on our hotel quarantine system. Yeah, yeah. The first stage is set to be delivered for use by the end of this year before any other planned facility. 
we are getting things done. Yeah. Yeah. AMA yeah. President uh, Dr Omar Khorshid welcomed the announcement, saying it was good news. We desperately need fit-for-purpose facilities as part of our longer-term COVID strategy to open up but remain safe. But, Mr Speaker, this pandemic is unpredictable. We don't know what is around the corner. None of us thought we would still be here in 18 months on dealing with Delta. Quarantine remains our first line of defence and we will continue to do everything we can to keep Queenslanders safe. Here, here. Mr Speaker, I'm proud to represent this state every day, but I have never been more proud than the moment Queensland was chosen to host the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic here, here. Games. For months leading up to the announcement, people would say to me, do you really think we can do it? Do you think Queensland can actually host the 2032? Order, member for Kiwana. You have no idea. Uh, through the chair, Premier. That's right. That's right. Order. <laughs> the 100 metre dash has not started yet. <laughs> Premier, you have the call. It was almost as if they dared not dream such a thing was possible. But the Olympics are all about dreams that come true, but only if you work for them. I'll never forget watching images of celebrations back home here at South Bank as the decision was announced. To see the people yeah, yeah. erupt in celebration <laughs> told me how special this achievement is to all of us. Yeah, yeah. The Olympics is the biggest event on the planet. It has an audience of billions and, as we saw in Tokyo, the ability to lift and unite us like nothing else. Our pitch was simple. We are a sports-loving, open, welcoming, inclusive place, optimistic about the future and how we can make it better. The fact that we are, all, that we are also one of Order, the most beautiful members. places on the planet is the icing on the cake. Only 23 cities in the world are Olympic cities. For Brisbane to join them gives us enormous advantage as our economy recovers from the pandemic. Yeah. These advantages include over $8.1 billion of infrastructure, economic and social benefits, $4.6 billion uplift in tourism and trade, and more than 100,000 jobs. But it gives us something else, Mr Speaker. It gives us hope. Mr Speaker, we alone have become the beacon of 2032 to aim for. It marshals the cooperation of all levels of government and all sides of politics to work towards a common goal. Businesses, large and small, are eager to share in the transformational opportunities the Games represent. Our mayors and local councils are already planning for the economic uplift. But there is another advantage. It's the power of the Games to inspire us all. Yeah, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker, it was only a few weeks ago that when we watched and cheered and wept as the Olympic story was retold in Tokyo. Faster, higher, stronger, together. Mr Speaker, if Queensland was a country, we would have finished seventh in the medal tally. Yeah, ahead yeah, yeah. of the Netherlands, Germany, <laughs> France, and Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an outstanding achievement. These were the Olympic ideals on display along with exemplary sportsmanship and sportswomanship. We shared the bursting pride of their families, their loved ones, their coaches, their whole team. Mr Speaker, this is the Olympic flame that is most important to keep burning. It's for every Queensland child doing that extra lap of the oval or the pool dreaming that it could be them in 2032. But this time the stands will be filled with their families. And Mr Speaker, the medal tally is continuing to grow at the Paralympic Games. Yeah. Today I'm proud to confirm that Queensland's inspirational Olympians and Paralympians will be welcomed back with a parade throughout the Brisbane CBD on the 8th of October. Yeah. I hope as many people as possible come and show them our appreciation and enthusiasm for the day when we'll turn out to be the Olympic host. Yeah. I've always said that Queensland's best days are ahead of us. Now they include the biggest event in the world in Brisbane, Queensland, 2032. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we've all seen the distressing scenes in Afghanistan in recent weeks. My heart goes out to the people of Afghanistan and our Afghan community here in Queensland who I know are worried for their family and friends facing upheaval in uncertain, uncertain times. I also know many of our Australian Defence Force personnel, past and present, particularly from Townsville, have served in Afghanistan and will be struggling with the recent developments. Mr Speaker, Queensland is assisting with the Australian Government's evacuation of Australians and Afghan nationals who worked alongside our troops. A flight of evacu evacuees has already arrived in Queensland and two more will be arriving in the coming days. They will quarantine in a combination of Queensland Government run and Australian Defence Force run hotel quarantine outside of the international air passenger arrivals cap. Mr Speaker, we will continue to work closely with our local Afghan community and the Federal Government to support the evacuation and settlement of refugees and to ensure those people who arrive in Queensland have access to the support that they need. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, yesterday I received the tragic news that two Queensland-based soldiers had died in an army vehicle rollover near Dotswood, outside of Townsville. The soldiers, a 40-year-old warrant officer and a 29-year-old private from the Brisbane Bay 7th Brigade, were reportedly in the region participating in an exercise. ADF set up a major incident room at Laverack Barracks and QPS Forensic Unit is investigating the incident. I extend my sincere condolences to their family, friends and the entire ADF community who are mourning the loss of two of their own in such tragic circumstances. Yeah. And Mr Speaker, finally, since we last met, family and friends of our dear colleague Duncan Pegg gathered at the Gabba for his memorial service. Later this week, there will be a condolence motion when we will have the opportunity to say more in this House. But let me say today that the event at the Gabba was a moving celebration of his life, a fitting farewell for Duncan at Queensland's home of the sport he loved. Of course, there were tears, Mr Speaker, but there were wonderful stories, inspirational memories, beautiful music, and of course, a video montage of Duncan's greatest hits in Parliament. Yeah. Duncan's brother Graham gave us a meaningful insight into the strong family foundation that guided his life, and it was my honour to speak at his service. Mr Speaker, it was a pri privilege to have had Duncan as Stretton's representative in our government. Yeah. And today, it is a great honour to welcome the new member for Stretton. James Martin to our team. Yeah. James was elected in the by-election held on the 24th of July. And while there are big shoes to fill, Stretton is in safe hands with a strong local member now to carry on Duncan's great work. Yeah. James has worked closely with Duncan since Duncan was first elected. He's been there every step of the way, fighting for quality schools, health care, better roads and public transport. He'll continue on the path that he and Duncan set for Stretton. I'm sure you'll join with me in congratulating and welcoming the new member for Stratton to the Queensland Parliament. Yeah. I call the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Since we last gathered at our last parliamentary sitting, Brisbane has become an Olympic city. Yeah. Like Paris 2024 and Los Angeles 2028, the world is watching us prepare for Queensland's biggest project. We are focused on getting our state ready for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics and the opportunities the Games will bring to Queensland. The global exposure will be four times greater than the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games. The Games will be our biggest job-creating project, surpassing both Cross River Rail and Queens Wharf Brisbane. Current modelling puts the total economic and social benefits for Queensland from hosting the Games at $8.1 billion, and 91,600 full-time equivalent jobs are expected to be created. There will be a 10-year pipeline of construction industry jobs, trade and investment opportunities and legacy projects. Major projects include the Athletes' Village development within the North Shore Hamilton PDA, a project of the State Development Department's Economic Development Queensland. The North Shore Hamilton PDA is one of the largest waterfront urban renewal projects in Queensland, with an expected end value of more than $5 billion. North Shore Hamilton will undergo a spectacular transformation. The Games will do for this precinct what Expo 88 did for Southbank. In legacy mode, the village will deliver housing supply across many key markets, including aged care, re retirement living, social and affordable housing, key worker, hotel, built to rent and traditional residential. We're also creating a world-class sporting venue and an amazing sporting legacy for Brisbane and the South East and the state at the Gabba. The Gabba Pedestrian Plaza will provide the link to Cross River Rail as part of our upgraded and integrated SEQ transport network. Roma Street will become the state's biggest public transport interchange. The finalised scheme for the Roma Street Priority Development Area offers easy access to a new key Olympics venue, new housing and expanded parklands. More than two hectares of new publicly accessible open space will be added to the Roma Street parklands, as well as new residential buildings that will include social and affordable housing. The Palaszczuk government is ensuring the Games becomes the catalyst for strong economic growth, more jobs and better connected communities as part of our COVID-19 economic recovery plan. I call the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Speaker, COVID-19 continues to pose new challenges for Queensland, but I'm pleased to report our economic recovery plan is working and our state's economic performance is strong. 
Speaker, there is no question that prolonged lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria are hurting our economy, in particular our tourism and hospitality sectors. But unlike their counterparts in Sydney, Canberra or Melbourne, thanks to our strong health response to the pandemic, Queensland businesses can operate freely in our state. And to help them, we are delivering a jointly funded $600 million support package for Queensland businesses. That includes grants ranging from $10,000 to $30,000 for businesses that have seen a 30 per cent fall in turnover because of lockdowns. It includes $1,000 self-assessable grants for sole traders, and I'm pleased to inform the House that applications for those grants open today. The $600 million package is on top of our $50 million tourism and hospitality sector support package. This package included the waiving, refunding or deferring of a range of state fees, charges and taxes for tourism and hospitality businesses across Queensland. A $20 million COVID-19 cleaning rebate scheme is also available to help cover the cost of professional cleaning for businesses with a confirmed or suspected COVID-19 case. Speaker, our government's economic policies are working. Employment in July was up 95,000 compared with March 2020, and the unemployment rate was 5.2 per cent, having fallen in recent months to its lowest level since 2009. Speaker, Queensland has still created more jobs than any other state or territory since the onset of the pandemic. And not only have we created more jobs than any other state or territory, we have created more jobs than all states and territories combined. Speaker, retail trade in July 2021 was up 11.5 per cent compared with its pre-COVID level, with the housing sector also performing strongly. This is no wonder, Speaker, with Queensland being one of the few places in the world to have crushed a Delta outbreak in just eight days. Yeah. Speaker, we know how dangerous Delta is. We see what Delta is doing to other jurisdictions. The people of New South Wales deserve all our sympathy and support. However, the actions of their government must be questioned. The New South Wales government did not go hard. The New South Wales government did not go fast. Now, as they drag down the national economy and the morale of their own people, all they talk about is opening up, regardless of the health consequences. It is an obsession shared by the federal government. Scott Morrison botched the vaccine rollout. Scott Morrison botched international quarantine. And, Speaker, it is no accident that these LNP governments keep falling into these errors. That's because these LNP governments are chock full of crazies. They don't believe in border controls. Some of them don't even believe in COVID. When these crazies complain about businesses or borders, they are using code. What they are really complaining about is they don't want us to fight the virus. They want us to run up the white flag and open the borders to an uncontrolled outbreak in New South Wales just because they say they have hit their vaccination target. Speaker, what the last two years have shown is that a health disaster quickly becomes an economic disaster. Speaker, our government will not subject Queenslanders to an uncontrolled outbreak of the virus and the needless disease and suffering that follows. We are not going to subject Queenslanders to needless economic destruction and mass unemployment that would result from an uncontrolled COVID outbreak. Speaker, Queensland and Western Australia are the powerhouse states who now carry the nation. We have demonstrated that our way is the only way to protect jobs and the economy. It is now time that all LNP politicians stand up and unequivocally support the strict implementation of all health advice. And most of all, in this House, that includes, that includes... Order! Order! Treasurer, do you have anything further to add? Uh, on reflection, I would also perhaps ask that you uh, maybe withdraw um, unparliamentary language. I believe 
in the current climate particularly uh, the term crazy may reflect on people's mental health as referred to individuals as opposed to used for an idea. I withdraw. I call the Minister for Education. Thank you, Speaker. And can I join the Premier and others in welcoming the new member for Strengthen, James Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker, our school students, principals, teacher and teacher aides, school leaders and support staff have shown great adaptability and resilience over the past 18 months in dealing with the reality of living through a world health pandemic. Our school communities, government and non-government have worked together during this time to ensure minimal disruption to learning. This was on display again in the recent lockdown in early August. Almost overnight, our schools commenced remote learning for some 391,000 students across 575 schools in the 11 lockdown LGAs, a truly magnificent effort. Of course, schools remain open for children of essential workers and vulnerable children with attendance levels around 6 to 7 per cent. All schools were prepared for the lockdown, with over 500 resources uploaded for students' remote learning and online resources for parents and carers also available. More than 150,000 bottles of hand sanitizer were delivered to schools, deep cleaning undertaken, as well as more than 1.7 million face masks, including more than 500,000 small child-sized masks distributed to ensure our schools were COVID safe. I am proud to advise that every one of these masks were manufactured locally in Brisbane, and I thank students and staff for wearing their masks. Yeah. Speaker, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all staff, students and families, particularly from Ironside State School and Indrapilly State High School, as well as Brisbane Grammar School and Brisbane Girls Grammar School, both in my electorate. Their willingness to do the right thing and follow isolation and quarantine directives meant Queensland was able to avoid further outbreaks and incredibly lift the lockdown. Amen. We know that this has been a challenging period for many students and their mental health and wellbeing is paramount. That's why, we, that's why we're rolling out our nation-leading $100 million student wellbeing election commitment to employ 464 additional health and wellbeing professionals in Queensland schools over the next three years. I'm pleased to advise the statewide recruitment exercise for the first tranche of these positions began on the 9th of August. The student wellbeing package will also provide secondary students with 20 state schools of the greatest need free access to a GP based at their school. The expression of interest inviting schools to participate in the pilot closed on the 20th of August, and I'm very pleased to announce a total of 50 schools have applied. Because of these efforts, Speaker, Queensland is the only state on the eastern seaboard of Australia with all schools fully open. I thank all staff and school communities for their amazing efforts. Yeah. I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, we know it's a matter of when, not if, COVID-19 returns to Queensland. That's why we need to get as much of the community vaccinated as quickly as possible. Yeah. Queensland has come a long way in our vaccination journey over the past six months. From the beginning, we've said vaccinating our population will be no small feat. But today, I'm proud to say that Queensland Government has delivered more than 1.3 million vaccine doses. That's our amazing health staff in action. Yeah. This is in addition to the two million doses delivered by our GPs and community pharmacies and other providers. And I want to remind everyone in this House, the only reason why community pharmacies are vaccinating in Queensland and led the way across the country was because the Palaszczuk government called for this to occur. Now, of course, we called for it to occur from February. We finally Order. did get it approved. Mr Speaker, Queensland's vaccination rollout program continues to expand as we get more supply. This means 3.4 million vaccinations have already been administered in Queensland. We're opening up more community vaccination locations, extending hours at existing centres, establishing more outreach clinics for rural and remote areas, setting up temporary pop-up clinics for at-risk communities and offering... Uh, sorry, Minister. Um, member for Corumban, um, you will, as you have done, put your mask back on, mm -hmm. uh, as I've uh, requested members to do, and you will not quarrel across the chamber with the member for Pine Rivers. 
The Minister for Health and Ambulance Services has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're establishing uh, special walk-in weekends for our First Nations people. Last week, Queensland Health administered 121,855 vaccine doses to Queenslanders, breaking the record for the greatest number of vaccines administered in a week. And we are continuing to supercharge our rollout. We now have mass vaccination hubs that deliver an incredible 4,000 plus doses each day. In just over a fortnight, more than 50,000 doses, doses were delivered by our hard-working staff at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre's Mass Vaccination Centre. And as the Premier announced on Sunday, we're providing greater mass vaccination capacity by bringing the Boondall Entertainment Centre online next week. This will allow us to upscale even more capacity. In addition to capacity, we're also scaling up accessibility to the vaccine. In the past couple of months, we've rolled out new community vaccination locations in Rockhampton, Gladstone, Townsville, Cairns and Mackay, utilising showrooms, universities, community centres and showgrounds. We've also ramped up our outreach, outreach clinics across the state. For example, we're rolling out outreach clinics in Ingham, Burdekin, Hewenden and Charters Towers throughout this month. We've been ensuring that our border communities have adequate protection against the threat of the virus emanating from New South Wales, with vaccination outreach clinics being stood up at Gundawindi, Inglewood, Warwick and Munungai. In the states far north, our outreach vaccination teams have been visiting communities across the Cape. Due, due to increased supply this month, we've been able to bring forward the vaccination rollout for the communities of Awakoon, Cohen, Kawanyama, Lockhart River, Pompuyua, uh, Hopevale, Wujawujul and Laura. We're seeing very good uptake in these communities. For example, nearly 90 per cent of the eligible community uh, on Pompua has now received their first dose, which is fantastic. Statewide, 51.3 per cent of Queenslanders have now received at least one dose, and more than 31.7 per cent are now fully vaccinated. As we continue to get additional supply from the Commonwealth Government, we will continue to accelerate our vaccine rollout. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all the Queenslanders who have come forward so far to be vaccinated. And can I encourage every Queenslander who is eligible to receive a vaccine to make arrangements to do so immediately by registering with Queensland Health, talking to your GP or visiting a local community pharmacist. You can help lift Queensland out of this pandemic and get us back to normality. I call the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Can I also uh, welcome the new member for Stretton uh, to the Chamber and one of the best performances in a by-election one, one can recall. Uh, th Speaker, the infrastructure boom in Queensland is pushing ahead at lightning pace thanks to Queensland's strong health response. Compared to other states like New South Wales, our construction sites remain open with jobs surging ahead. Last week I travelled up Queensland's coast to see the Palaszczuk Labor government's record investment in transport and roads electrifying our economic growth. From Roma Street to Rockhampton, I met hundreds of workers in jobs because we're backing Queensland infrastructure. Yeah. My week started underground at uh, the Cross River Rail's future Roma Street station, where the tunnel boring machine Merle broke through. An awesome sight as a three-ton slab of rock uh, cracked, broke off in front of us, Mr Speaker. It was quite a sight. I congratulate the 2,900 workers who have already uh, worked on this transformational project uh, with such a major milestone achieved. Next stop was North Lakes with the member for Bancroft and the Assistant Minister for Hydrogen Development and the member for Bundamba, uh, where the Palaszczuk Labor government is supporting Hornibrook bus lines to create Queensland's first all-electric zero-emissions bus depot. Yeah. Better yet, the, six, the 16 e-buses in the fleet are going to be manufactured in Queensland, yeah. creating yeah. dozens of jobs on the Gold Coast, Speaker. Further north, I join the members for Nicklin and Caloundra on the $301 million Bruce Highway upgrade between Mons Road and Maroochydore Road interchanges supporting 380 Sunshine Coast jobs. In the next day, uh, in central Queensland, I met 160 contractors at an industry breakfast, all of them keen to get a slice of the $1 billion Rockhampton Ring Road, Mr Speaker, the city's largest ever road project to start next year. This included uh, Jono and Kelvin from a, a First Nations civil engineering company who are thankful that this government is creating jobs for central Queensland workers. I also visited the $194 million Rockhampton North, Northern Access upgrade uh, with the members for Rockhampton and Keppel, and which I am happy to report is now open to traffic. Yeah. Uh, going north, we, I then went to the Mackay and Whist Sundays in North Queensland, where we've locked in more than a billion dollars of road and transport projects, an investment I know that the member for Mackay has campaigned hard for. Yeah. 
This includes a $31 million to duplicate the uh, Proserpine Shoot Harbour Road, uh, a road the LNP cut funding to. That's where I met Miles, a 35-year-old road-working veteran who's super supervising for road tech. Sadly, many people like Miles lost their, their jobs when those uh, opposite sacked 700 road tech workers. The last stop uh, was the far north, where I joined you, Speaker, and the mem member for Cairns, uh, as work started on our uh, separated cycleway for, uh, as part of the $481 million uh, Bruce Highway duplication on the Cairns Southern Access. Uh, this will create one of re the regional Queensland's longest off-road cycleways, encouraging more active transport for both residents and for tourists. Our record investment in roads and transport is creating more than 24,000 jobs over four years, driving Queensland's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Unlike those opposite, Speaker, we build, we build and they cut. That's the truth of it. The, the people of Queensland will never forget the cuts made by those in opposite under Premier Newman and, the, the, and his local government minister, now Leader of the Opposition. Order. The Labor government's strong health response, Queensland is open for business and infrastructure is booming. Yeah. Uh, before calling the next uh, speaker, I just wish to advise members that I, uh, in the interim, uh, didn't waste my time uh, while we were away from the parliament. I've done a course in lip reading behind masks. So you're aware. Thank you very much. Call the Minister for Communities. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in June this year, the Palaszczuk Government launched the Queensland Housing and Homelessness Action Plan 2021 to 2025, backed by a $2.9 billion investment to help more vulnerable Queenslanders into homes sooner. This is, the, this is the largest concentrated investment in social housing in Queensland's history and includes a new $1 billion housing investment fund to boost housing supply across Queensland. We are already making good progress on our commitment to fast-track projects and initiatives that will increase the supply of social housing. I'm pleased to announce to the House today that we are on track to go to market in October for expressions of interest for new social housing supply. We will be inviting the market to make project proposals that respond to any of the three elements of the Queensland Housing Investment Growth Initiative, uh, those being help to, help to Home, Quick Starts or Housing Investment Fund. These projects will complement the work already underway by my department to increase the supply of social and affordable housing by almost 10,000 over the life of our housing strategy, contributing to Queensland's plan for economic recovery by creating jobs and supporting vulnerable Queenslanders. In the first month of this financial year alone, we awarded contracts for the commencement of 65 new homes across Queensland in suburbs such as Zilmia, Varsity Lakes, Narain, Redcliffe, North Toowoomba and Arakoon. This is on top of the 2,480 projects that already commenced under the previous action plan. Our partnerships with community housing providers are supporting the construction of new social and affordable housing in far north Queensland, Brisbane, the Sunshine Coast, the Gold Coast, Wide Bay, Townsville, Logan and Ipswich. It's important to remember at this point, Mr Speaker, that in 2013-14, those opposite commenced zero new social homes in Logan, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast or Ipswich. In contrast, the, the Palaszczuk government is growing our social and affordable housing stock. One example of this work is a partnership with Churches of Christ Housing Services to support the completion of 83 new homes on Bribie Island in June 2021. Yeah. Last week, I joined Churches of Christ Housing to turn the sod on a new development on the Sunshine Coast, which will see 40 affordable homes built in Little Mountain. We also recently celebrated the completion of 16 new homes in partnership with Regional Housing Limited in Vunderburg. Yeah. Mr Speaker, through these and other projects, we will continue to deliver, uh, to deliver more social and affordable housing in Queensland. Yeah. Is there any other government business? I call the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I'm not moving those motions right now. Thank you. Are there any personal explanations? Are there any reports to be tabled? Are there any notices yes, of motion? Tabling, oh, tabling reports, my apologies. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I table the public report of office expenses, Office of the Leader of the Opposition for the period 1st of the 7th, 2020 to 30th of the 6th, 2021.
Thank you. Uh, and whilst I have the opportunity, I wish to advise honourable members that I have received from the member for Surface Paradise that he will be um, advice that he will be absent from the sittings of the House, occurring 31 August 2021 through to 16 September 2021. And the member's notification complies with Standing Order 263A. Are there any notices of motion? I call the Leader of the Opposition for his first question. Question time will conclude today at 11.20am. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. At a time when Queenslanders are banned from coming home, why has the Premier prioritised a sporting entourage over everyday Queenslanders? Yeah. I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. And let me say from the outset, Mr Speaker, that uh, we want to see as many Queenslanders get home as safely as possible. That's why the government is already looking at um, uh, some extra um, uh, additional hotels that we'll be able to bring online to deal specifically with the domestic travel. The reason that the, the hotel quarantine system is packed at the moment is because we've had uh, so much international arrivals with the domestic arrivals, Mr Speaker, that's really stretched the resources, Mr Speaker. And uh, what also we've been doing is we've actually been taking in extra charter flights above that international cap. So we would have charter flights coming in from overseas that we weren't notified of basically until the day they arrived, which meant that our, our, scrambling, our, people, were, our people were scrambling, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, member so, for Toowoomba South. Mr. Speaker, as those member for Toowoomba South. Member for Corumban. My lip reading is working. Today, Premier has the call. That um, uh, many parents have been contacting us about their children who are in boarding schools, Mr. Speaker, and we are looking at a. Uh, we are, will be trialling a home quarantine with a specified app there to allow those students. Especially, you know, some of them are minors, Mr. Speaker. Um, I had an example just recently. I Order, Member for Kiwana will cease his interjections. We want people to come home when it's safe to do so, Mr. Speaker. Safe to do so. Order. Yes. And the mandatory quarantine is is what is needed to keep Queenslanders safe. That is the advice of the Chief Health Officer, Mr Speaker. That's right, that's right. They wanted the borders open. That's right, Mr Speaker. All right, members. Mr Speaker, I might direct the member for Kwana to have a look at what's happening in New South Wales, Mr Speaker. There are reports at the moment, reports at the moment, that their hospitals, that their hospitals... Pause the clock. Get Premier, Premier. Premier, please resume your seat. Member for Corumban, you're warned under standing orders. Member for Kiwana, you're warned under standing orders. And Member for Gregory, you're also warned under standing orders. It wasn't immediate, but it did come. Thank I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Westmead Hospital is now only caring for those with COVID, while other patients have been moved into makeshift ICU, Mr Speaker. That's what's happening in New South Wales at the moment. And let me also say, Mr Speaker, New South Wales will not reach their peak until October this year, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, they are reporting around 12,000 cases a day over the last couple of days, Mr Speaker. We've had 1,900 during the entire pandemic in Queensland, Mr Speaker, and the member for Kiwana and those opposite are criticising us for keeping Queenslanders safe. Well, sorry, you're on the wrong side of the fence. The the Premier's time has expired. I remind uh, all members that comments will be directed through the Chair. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition, please uh, ask your second question. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. I refer to the Premier's comments that the sporting entourage is not counted in the cap. Sharon is a cancer patient stuck interstate following her mother's funeral. What does Sharon have to do to not be counted in the cap and return home to Queensland? Yeah. <laughs> 
I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, people who, are, um, who have medical conditions are exempt from that tax, Mr Speaker. We have made that very, very clear, Mr Speaker. Very, very clear that the exemptions are separate to that cap, Mr Speaker. Now, in relation to, to that particular individual, the Health Minister has, has assured me that the exemptions unit is dealing personally with her, Mr Speaker. And that is the right thing to do, to go through the exemptions unit, Mr Speaker. But, Mr Speaker, let me quote this. And this is a very interesting quote, Mr Speaker. This is what someone said about the Mango. Let's just be very clear. Our people are passionate for the game. We've got the facilities and we're willing to play our role to keep the NRL season afloat. Yeah, who said that? Who said that? Oh, just look over there. The member for Toowoomba South. The member for Toowoomba South. So, Yeah, nice own bowl there. You got him to touch on that one. So, Mr. Speaker, so, Mr. Speaker, we will work very closely. Mem <laughs> Someone with a very deep voice. Mem mem member for Tormund North, um, you warned understanding orders. <laughs> Has the Thank call. you, Mr. Speaker. Look, I just remind those opposite to have a look what's happening down in, in New South Wales, Mr. Speaker. That's not a laughing matter. That's not a laughing matter, Mr. Speaker. That's not a laughing matter. And and if and if Queenslanders had listened to to this lot opposite, imagine where Queensland would be today. And COVID would be the because they call for the borders to be open. Mr Speaker, the Queensland uh, Health Officer takes all, um, all care in dealing with requests that come to her for a whole variety of reasons. The exemption unit has been increased because we know this is a very concerning time for families and we have moved quickly today in looking at prioritising those minors who are isolated away from their families in boarding schools or in other parts of Australia that need to come home to their families, Mr yeah. Speaker. And I, res I just remind those opposite too, as the Treasurer has said, it is states like Queensland and Western Australia that are continuing to function. Our economies are open. Yeah. Our economies, people are enjoying... Premier's time has expired. And that would all Premier's time has expired and I ask you to resume her seat. I call the member for Redlands. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Premier and Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on the regional benefits of hosting the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games? I call the Premier. <laughs> well, the Deputy Premier was making a joke. Oh. Uh, order. Order, members. I'm not the one wearing a flowery mask. Well, all members, my back's feeling good today. I can stand up all day. <laughs> when the speaker stands, any presiding officer, the House will come to complete silence. There are no exceptions, and I expect that that will be adhered to. Member for um, Everton, uh, your interjections were designed to interrupt the Premier. You are warned under standing orders. Member for Nanango, you are also warned under standing orders. Premier, I ask you to withdraw the comment related to the Member for Everton. I withdraw. Thank you, Premier. You have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the Member for the question. And as the Deputy Premier was reminding me, which I said I already know, it is the member's birthday today, so yeah. the member for Redlands, a happy birthday. And
and uh, isn't she lucky to enjoy her birthday with all of us? <laughs> to which I said, for her birthday, you can ask me a question. <laughs> but Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, many happy returns. And it's a significant birthday too. 21, that's right, <laughs> if only. But Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the, um, the, the members raised a really good question and that's about the impact that the Olympics are going to have um, right across our regions, Mr. Speaker. We know in the Redlands that the Redlands will be um, hosting the uh, Whitewater Centre, it will be built for the, the canoe event and the venue will have a capacity of 8,000 with a mixture of permanent and temporary grandstands. After the Olympics, it would continue as a whitewater centre, emergency service training and an adventure park, Mr Speaker. And as we know, the Olympics will benefit all of the state with events uh, across the southeast, but also in uh, Cairns and Townsville, uh, Toowoomba, uh, Ipswich, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast. There is something in this for everybody, Mr Speaker. And we also know that we have um, around 84 per cent of the venues already built, and that was, that was actually received very warmly by the International Olympic Committee uh, when we presented uh, to them in Tokyo uh, just recently. We know that there's going to be um, uh, a whole lot of opportunities for Queensland businesses to also uh, benefit from the Olympics whether that is in relation to uh, procurement, uh, making sure that they uh, are able to tender for different works, and the fact that it is 11 years away gives us uh, time to plan. The other good news is if you think about uh, where the Olympics have been held, like Tokyo just recently, next is Paris, and the next is LA, this is really sending a signal to the world that medium-sized cities such as Brisbane and a state such as Queensland can host such a magnificent world-class event. Yeah. The International Olympic Committee was also very positive towards the fact that we had hosted uh, the Commonwealth, a very successful uh, Commonwealth Games. And we know that the Olympics will also generate up to 100,000 jobs and also over $8 billion in economic and trade benefit for many, many years to come. So um, I ask all members to get behind it and to continue talking Mr. about Speaker, it right across the state. Premier's time has expired. I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. Where is the health advice that permits an NRL entourage to enter the state while grieving Queenslanders are locked out of their home? I call the Premier. Mr Speaker, I, um, I thank the member for the question. There is an exemptions unit that right. deals with people who are either have uh, bereavement issues or medical issues, they are dealt separately to the cap. This is a pause for two weeks to enable our hotels to enable our hotels to be able to cope. We are at the stage where there was over 5,000 people in our hotel quarantine. There was one week where we had 1,900 people who rocked up to Queensland, Mr Speaker. We don't know when they're arriving. No, we don't know when they're arriving. They turn up and then our agencies have to scramble for hotels. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker in relation to the Chief Health Officer, she considers uh, separate issues on a daily basis. And can I uh, thank the Chief Health Officer for the outstanding work that she has done to the people of this state, Mr Speaker. Every day she gets up, like me and everybody else on my team, and we thank Queenslanders for the work that, we, yeah, that they yeah, are doing, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. I mean, in terms of having a double donut day, zero cases, the fact that Queensland was able to get on top of that delta so quickly to go so hard and so fast enables our economy to open up. And we've seen how good the economy is going with you know, 5.2% unemployment and more than 90,000 jobs generated since the pandemic, Mr Speaker. This is in stark contrast to what's happening in New South Wales and Victoria, Mr Speaker. We have not seen anywhere near the peak of New South Wales. And if you want to see a health system in crisis, you will see it in the very near future in New South Wales, Mr Speaker. And Queensland stands ready to help, Mr Speaker as does every other state and territory when that time comes. Mr Speaker, we don't know what the future holds. This book has not been written. These are uncharted times. 
but we will do everything in our power to make sure that Queensland continues on the path that it has been going. The exemptions unit will deal with exemptions, Mr Speaker, and the Chief Health Officer will make decisions in the best interests of our state. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker. Order. I call the member for Mirabar. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Premier and the Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on how the Palaszczuk government's economic recovery plan is delivering uh, and creating jobs for Queenslanders, and is the Premier aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Premier. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Mirabara for the question. And, uh, Mr Speaker, our economic plan is working. And why is our economic plan working? Because we've been able to get on top of the health issues, Mr yeah. Speaker, to deal, to deal with COVID, Mr <laughs> Speaker. And in Mirabara, we have uh, the example of we have the $600 million rolling stock expansion program where we're procuring initial 20 new six-car passenger trains to be uh, manufactured in Mirabara, an election commitment, Mr Speaker, but also too, we're seeing um, the supports going into the local Mirabara hospital, Mr Speaker, upgrades to roads, the schools. Every time I, I go to Mirabara, the, the member has something new to show me. Um, whether it's Works for Queensland money going into the local uh, parks, Mr Speaker, this is a member who delivers for his community, Mr Speaker. Puts them first, putting Mirabara first. Um, but, Mr Speaker, we also know that um, uh, those opposite, you know, you know, one minute they're all together, next minute they're split apart. But it was really interesting to see some comments that were made. I think it was around the time of the Stretton by-election. Now we know those opposite. I think they had like a one in a million candidate or something. That's right. That's right, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, Mr. Speaker, the, the day after the by-election. Someone had a bit of a dummy spit, Mr. Speaker. Ah. Campbell Newman. Campbell ah. Newman. But, Mr. Speaker, don't get so excited here because I wouldn't be surprised if it's just an LNP setup, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. You know, once with the LNP, always with the LNP, Mr. Speaker. And I don't know how, you know, the, the, uh, how Newman's apprentice, Newman's apprentice over there, you know. The old right-hand man, you know, he was probably there. Just pretend to leave the LNP. Just go over there, mock up some, you know, fringe votes for us, and then you'll be able to come back, Mr. Speaker. Honestly, honestly, it has to be all pre-arranged, Mr. Speaker. We smell something there that's not quite right, Mr. Speaker. So that's right, that's right. We'll see what's happened. We'll that's right, that's right. That, well, they used to call for the borders to be open. So it'll be interesting to see where he's getting his instructions from. But, Mr Speaker, on this side of the House, we will continue with our economic recovery. We will continue to make sure that we have growth across our state, Mr Speaker. And we will continue with our strong health response, Mr Speaker. And we will continue to put in place those necessary measures that are needed to keep Queenslanders safe. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question to the Premier. If Queensland hospitals are for Queenslanders, why aren't Queensland quarantine host hotels also for Queenslanders? Uh, before calling the Premier, uh, Leader of the House, uh, you will put your comments through the Chair. I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in case the member for Kwana wasn't listening, there are exemptions there for people who need access to medical services, who have bereavement issues, Mr Speaker. That is separate to the cap. We've got a pause at the moment, Mr Speaker, so our, so our quarantine system can ease. And, Mr Speaker, what is one of the reasons that have been putting pressure on our quarantine system is that we are taking above the cap that has been set for international arrivals, Mr Speaker. If the cap comes below what it's supposed to be, Mr Speaker, we can take more people coming into Queensland. So perhaps the member for Kwana might want to pick up the phone to his friend, the Prime Minister, down in Canberra and ask him as to why that is not happening. We are getting charter flights that, are, that are, we are finding out on the day, scrambling to get hotels because this is above the cap that was set by the federal government, Mr Speaker. And just to clarify again for the House, in relation to 
the, the, uh, the uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan, that is separate to the cap, Mr Speaker. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can, but over 5,000 people coming into Queensland was going to put stress on the system. It was going to stretch our resources, Mr Speaker, and we had to get that under control. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Ipswich West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is of the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Planning, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Can the Deputy Premier update the House on the progress of providing quarantine facilities in Queensland? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Ipswich West for his question. I know that he knows that keeping Queenslanders safe is the foundation of our economic recovery. And if we're going to continue to keep Queenslanders safe, we need fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities. Hotel quarantine was incredibly valuable in the early stages of the pandemic, but it has let us down with the Delta strain. Leaks from hotel quarantine have led to outbreaks here, but more devastatingly in New South Wales. We need new options for quarantine, not just urgently, it's not just urgent, it is in fact overdue. And that's why I was pleased last week to join the Premier at Wellcamp Airport to announce that we would build a new purpose-built accommodation uh, facility there in what is the perfect location. It is adjacent to an international airport. It has a buffer from residential areas. It is a greenfield site ready to build on. And in fact, construction is underway right now. Mr Speaker, the Doherty Institute says that quarantine will continue to be necessary even when we meet those vaccination targets. And if we had have got the go-ahead to build it when we first suggested it in January, we would have it built right now. We would be using it right now. But we got sick of the excuses from the political masters of those opposite. Let's run through the Prime Minister's excuses, shall we? First of all, he said there wasn't enough detail. So we gave him a lot more detail. Then he said, then he said, big planes can't land there. And so we sent him a picture of his big plane on the tarmac after it had landed there. And then he said, and then he said, it's in the desert. And we said, no, no, Toowoomba is not in the desert. And then when we announced it, what did he say? Oh, you should have done it months ago. Oh. After all the excuses, he said, you should have done it months ago. Well, where they are failing, we are acting. Where Morrison has failed on the vaccination rollout, Queensland Health has stepped in and are delivering. And where Morrison failed on quarantine, we are stepping in and we are building a dedicated quarantine facility. The first 500 beds will be ready by Christmas. The next 500 in the first quarter of next year, months ahead, months ahead of the Commonwealth's proposed pink and bar facility that won't be online until closer to the middle of the year. Uh, Honourable Members, um, apologies for the interruption to question time. We've received advice from the Queensland Police of a possible protest activity, including attempted intrusion of the precinct. Uh, as a precautionary measure, Queensland Police advise that the precinct should be locked down until the protest uh, protest activity has ceased. I've directed uh, the implementation of this advice. This includes no access in or out of the precinct during the lockdown period and further advice will be provided uh, as it comes to hand. Thank you. I call the member for Thank Madhuribar. Thank you, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question to the Health Minister. Ca sorry. Can the Minister guarantee all surgeries performed at Caboolture Hospital have been done by surgeons qualified to perform them? I call the Minister for Health. 
Um, I thank the member for his question. And, um, the issues raised uh, both in yesterday's media reports and today are very serious allegations. Uh, when uh, I was first contacted uh, mid-July uh, in relation to these allegations, I sought advice from Caboolture Hospital and Metro North HHS in relation to those specific allegations, and those were the ones that were reported yesterday. I can advise that um, each of those allegations uh, were thoroughly investigated by the Caboolture Hospital's Performance Management Committee, but some of those, of course, at least one of those have gone to the coroner, and the coroner has chosen not to further investigate in relation to that particular um, deceased person. Of course, the Department of Health have also, and through the Clinical um, Excellence Queensland, have been doing additional work. But there has been additional claims made today. So, uh, in addition to the information I received yesterday, because the media report said today uh, that there were people coming forward on social media raising concerns about the care they received, I can advise today, Mr Speaker, uh, that we are setting up a phone line uh, for people to be able to ring in, because I want to know if there's issues. Now, I don't make any, any preconceived allegations around Caboolture Hospital. Can I say, I know the staff there work extremely hard each and every day to provide quality care to, to the patients. But I want to make sure that if there's people out there who do not believe that they've had the care at the, at the level that they believe they deserve, then they should come forward and provide us with the information so it can be properly considered. And I want them to do that. Um, and, and it needs to occur not just on social media or through media reports, but coming forward to the authorities. So can I advise the House that Queensland Health is establishing a dedicated phone line available to anyone who wants to raise concerns about the treatment they have received at Caboolture Hospital? They can phone uh, 3647 9559. It will become available from midday today. It will be open from 8am to 5pm, seven days a week, and it will be staffed by a clinical nurse consultant. I'm setting this up to ensure that anyone who has any genuine complaints can come forward and they can be properly considered and investigate. Um, I, I advise the member that I have been um, advised by the Department of Health. I'm answering the member's question. I am answering the member's question. There are various bodies that complaints can be raised to, as the member knows, both the hospital... Order, members. Members to my left. Mr Speaker. The minister's time has expired. I call the member for Cairns. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Will the Treasurer update the House on the impact the Federal Government's withdrawal of JobKeeper is having in Far North Queensland? Uh, sorry, uh, Treasurer. Members to my left, questions will be heard in silence. That includes no moaning, no groaning or any other interjection. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member for Cairns for his question, a very serious question that impacts on the people of not just the Far North but all parts of Queensland. The member for Cairns knows full well the burden COVID-19 uh, has had on Far North Queensland. Right back to the start of last year, when it was known only as a novel coronavirus. Far North Queensland was the first place where the Palaszczuk government announced an economic support package. And credit where credit is due, the federal government's JobKeeper program enabled many businesses in Cairns and the region to keep their heads above water. It's exactly why our government pleaded with Scott Morrison to continue JobKeeper. Because one thing we have learned from COVID, and that is that the virus is relentless. It mutates, it seeks to infect every human being. It comes Leader contact. of the Opposition, Deputy Leader of the Today, Opposition. Today, businesses in Cairns are open and able to trade uh, because the people of the far north de defeated the latest Delta outbreak. But their customers cannot reach them because of the closure of international borders and, of course, severe lockdowns, long prolonged lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria. That is why JobKeeper Speaker should have never been withdrawn. And that's why JobKeeper is required right now. 
as, as much as it has ever been, it is required right now. That should come as a surprise to no one. It comes as a, no surprise to the member for Cairns or the member for Cook or the member for Barron River or even you, Speaker. Yet somehow it came as a surprise for to Warren Inch, Speaker. Moments after we announced a jointly funded $600 million package, what did he do? Pause the clock. Pause the clock. He missed Pause the clock, um, Treasurer. To please, to his region. please resume your seat. Member for Butterham, you warned. Understanding orders, you're making no attempt besides the mask to uh, mask the interjection. Treasurer, you have the call. He missed the unique opportunity to stand up for his region, to do his job, Speaker. We all know, of course, that Warren Hench was very happy to use his power and his number in the party room to bring down Malcolm Turnbull. He's the fellow that caused Malcolm Turnbull to lose the Prime Ministership. But when he is called on to stand up for his community, he does absolutely nothing. Because it is typical of the spinelessness of the LNP. Uh, those Speaker. comments are unparliamentary. Those comments are unparliamentary. I ask you to withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. It is typical of the lack of courage and the weakness and the cowardice of the LNP. Speaker, call it what you may. That is typical of the LNP. So today I call on Warren Inch to do Leader of your the opposition. Job, Speaker. I call on Warren Inch to do your job. And of course the Leader of the Opposition will do Order. nothing. The Leader of the Opposition will do nothing. He will, he's happy to bleed in this House, happy to interject, but will not stand up for Queensland. He won't stand up. The Leader of the Opposition won't stand up to Warren Inch. He won't call on him to use his power use his power to bring back JobKeeper. So I say, Warren Inch, Scott Morrison, do your job and bring back JobKeeper. Treasurer's time has expired. The Leader of the Opposition, you're warned under standing orders. Uh, I call the member for model. Mr Speaker, a question uh, to the Health Minister. Can the Minister confirm that there was not a permanent or acting Director of Surgery at Caboolture Hospital for five months in 2020? I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to follow up on that uh, for the member. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Aspley. Uh, my question is of the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations, and Minister for Racing. Can the Minister advise the House of the arrangements made to adjust the Year 12 exam timetable and accommodate the People's Long Weekend at the end of October? Yes. I call. Yeah, yeah. Member for Nanango, you're under warning. Uh, you can leave the chamber for one hour. Aww. Feel no pity, Member uh, for uh, uh, McConnell. Um, <laughs> the member knows full well. I call the Minister for Education. And thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for asking me for the question because I know his constituents are very much looking forward to the public holiday on Friday, the 29th of November. And um, can I say that it coincides with World Teachers Day? And listen to them opposite already. No vision, no alternatives, not anything coming from them. And you've got all and South Coast MPs complaining that their hotels are full. Oh. And what I've heard is when we announce the, da the, the date, the day after, the traffic on holiday letting websites went up 6,000%. Oh. Let me just add that again. 6,000%. And what did we hear from the members on the Gold Coast? Nothing. Come to the Gold Coast on the long weekend. We'll welcome you. No, nothing at all. The member for Corumban, a lot to say about lockdown, helping those New South Wales people over the barricades into Queensland. You want a leg up? I'll give you a leg up. Come on in. Come on in. You're fine. Yet when it comes to the economic boost that moving this public holiday is going to give to Queensland silence from both the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast members. Well, we're here to look after those businesses. And it was wonderful to work with the Minister for Tourism. We spoke to the tourism sector and they were very keen on the economic benefits that occurred when unfortunately the ECHO got cancelled last year and we moved the public holiday to the Friday. The economic benefits were incredible and they were keen to repeat 
repeat that again with another Friday. Now, the school holidays actually finish on the 5th of October. And when you look at the window of opportunity between that date and um, school is starting in mid-November, there's not a lot of Fridays and Mondays left. And to, and to suggest by the opposition um, um, Minister for Education that somehow we left no stone unturned in deciding this, um, this date is absolutely completely wrong. Um, and I really do welcome the QCAA, the non-government, government sector coming together, and it was very easy. We moved the exam period, which I addressed at the press conference, Speaker, I might add. Yeah. I, I addressed it straight away, like as if we didn't know the exam period. Very simple, very simple thing to do move from the, from the 29th to the 22nd, and I thank them very much for doing that. But rather than whinging and whining coming from those opposite, you would think they'd have some vision. You would think that they would want to have the economic boost that this public holiday is going to provide to the, to the tourism sector. But what do you get? Stone Mr. Silence. Speaker, Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Glasshouse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question to the Premier. Who is ultimately responsible if it is found botched surgeries cause death in Queensland public hospitals? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. If the member has any um, allegations, uh, we're happy to look at those, uh, <clears throat> those allegations, Mr Speaker. Um, so, but, Mr Speaker, I will remind uh, the member opposite as well, Mr Speaker, about um, he might want to have a close look at what's happening in New South Wales at the moment to see the overwhelming, the overwhelming response that is happening, that is happening with dealing with the Delta virus, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, in some hospitals, my understanding is they're not doing any surgery. They're not doing because people have COVID and they are dying from COVID, and they are not at the peak. The peak is in October. October. Order. So, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if, if, the, if the member has any allegations about anything specific, please raise it with the health minister, and the health minister will get back to the member. But there seems to be a denial on that side about what is happening That's in right. New South Wales and Victoria, Mr. Speaker. A denial, an absolute denial about what is happening down there. Well, on this side of the house, we'll do everything we can to prevent that Delta outbreak happening here, Mr Speaker. Um, but we will be ready in case it comes, and we will once again go hard and go fast, Mr Speaker. And I thank Queenslanders for their hard work. Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, is there a point of order? Yeah, just a point of order on matters suddenly arising. I think I inadvertently may have said 29th of November at some stage. Of course, it's Friday the 29th of October. I just want to correct the record, Mr Speaker. I, I Thank you. Uh, order, Member for Chatsworth. Um, that's that is not the worst. That's not the worst mistake you can make, Minister. An extra public holiday. Uh, can I just also, before calling the member, um, advise members: if you are um, interjecting, please do not remove your mask uh, for two reasons. One, it's a health issue, and two, it's very, very obvious. I call the member for Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Can the Minister update the House on the pressures on the health system in Queensland and how they compare to other jurisdictions? I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, take the Premier's interjection. Um, and I... Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Jordan for her question. And as we know, uh, all health systems across the country are under incredible strain right now. Uh, member, certainly, I'll take sorry. that interjection. It wasn't in a good space under the LNP, that's for sure. Uh, Minister, Minister, pause the clock. Um, member for Madhurabar, you are warned under standing orders. Uh, those comments were clearly not directed through the chair. They were directed towards the Minister. I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, yeah, I 
again, I don't think the LNP can talk about the health system when uh, they still have not acknowledged and apologised for what they did to uh, the health system and the sacking of staff. But, Mr Speaker, um, look, the system has been under incredible pressure. We're very proud of the investment uh, that we have made, including in this year's budget and the additional funding that we have put in uh, to open up additional beds. And in fact, uh, on top of the $100 million prior to the budget for Care for Queensland, an extra $163.5 million to uh, provide another 351 beds available in the next 12 months. So this will help with some of those pressures, but we also need to understand that the pressures um, keep having peaks and troughs. And the reason why is because our staff are doing such an incredible job of playing catch-up and then we end up having an outbreak and then we have lockdowns. And so the most le recent lockdown not only slowed down elective surgery again, but we had over 400 health workers in quarantine. And as of today, because of the outbreak that started on the 31st of July, we still have some health workers in quarantine today because they are family members of uh, the Indrapilly cluster. So that had a significant impact as well. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, we know that jurisdictions across the country are doing it tough. Even Western Australia, uh, prior to the most two recent cases, um, had announced that they were putting a suspension on their elective surgery. Sydney is actually turning away COVID patients. It is so distressing to hear what is happening in Victoria and New South Wales right now, where people are being turned away and, sadly, people who are being managed by the health system in their homes are dying from COVID. Dying from COVID, and actually one in five people who have died from COVID in the current New South Wales cluster, which is now over 20,000 people involved in that cluster who have been positive, one in five have actually contracted it while they were in hospital and then died as a consequence. So this is what we have fought for 19 months to stop happening. This is why we have tried so hard. We've stockpiled, we've trained, we've converted and uh, transitioned our hospitals to have these negative pressure rooms to do everything we can so that people don't die at home and people don't get turned away who are positive patients and we don't run out of ventilators. That's what we have done and worked hard to avoid. I'm very proud of our health workers. I'm proud of our Chief Health Officer. I'm proud of being part of the Palaszczuk Government and the great work that we're doing. Speaker. I call the member for Maywa. Speaker, my question this morning is to the Minister for Health. Today is Overdose Awareness Day. Despite Queensland being the second highest state for pharmaceutical overdose deaths, we're the only state without any federal or state funding to supply naloxone, which reverses the effects of opioid overdose. Will the minister commit to fund frontline alcohol and other drug workers to supply free, life-saving naloxone, or is the government too afraid of being seen as soft on drugs? I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Um, putting aside the cheap political comment at the end there, this is a very serious issue. Um, and when you talk about mental health, when you talk about crime, when you talk about youth crime, uh, when you talk about homelessness, you have to talk about drug and alcohol as well. Uh, you have to acknowledge that this forms part of all of those issues and they're all interlinked. Uh, in fact, I raised this with the Assistant Minister of the Commonwealth responsible for mental health and said, the National Partnership Agreement that we are negotiating now on mental health, will there be a dedicated funding stream for drug and alcohol support? That the Commonwealth steps up and supports us in targeting this area, understanding how important that is in the mental health? And the answer was no. No, we are not having any dedicated funding in this space. We'll continue to, to uh, talk about funding in the broader concept, but we're not funding any particular programs or facilities. Uh, we have uh, got strategies around drug and alcohol, uh, but the job's never done in this space. It is a very, very difficult area, and we know it's a growing area. But we can talk about drugs. You only need to listen to our Queensland Mental Health Commissioner, who will tell you the consequences of alcohol as well and the impact that that is having on our community. Um, which can be far greater still. So we have to tackle both of these areas. Um, I don't think any government should be closed off to any ideas. You have to be willing to look at all models, all initiatives, what works and what doesn't around the globe. Because no one's had all the answers to this. No one has solved the problem of drug and alcohol abuse and addiction. But we are absolutely committed on working on these areas, working with stakeholders, uh, both public and private. Uh, working with all three levels of government, 
Uh, and importantly, I hope that the member also is ensuring that his colleagues are asking these questions of the Commonwealth, because I know those opposite won't ask that question. Uh, they won't ask why the Commonwealth aren't investing in drug and alcohol, why they're not playing their part, why they're not considering that as part of the negotiations under the National Partnership on Mental Health. But I'll continue to raise the issue, because we can't do this alone. We can't fund everything out alone, and the Commonwealth just keeps stepping back on all of their responsibilities when it comes to health, mental health, NDIS and aged care, all of these areas. Housing, I'll take that interjection from the Treasurer, um, and we need more support financially, resources from the Commonwealth as well, because this is not just a Queensland problem, it is a national problem. Uh, but as I say to the member, we are committed to looking at all initiatives. I won't rule anything in or out, but I'm not playing cheap top politics with this issue. I'm not too scared to look at anything. We will look at what works <laughs> and what doesn't, <laughs> and we will make sure we work on evidence-based policy, because that's what the Palaszczuk government always has and always will do. Speaker. <laughs> Speaker. Order. I call the member for Keppel. My question is of the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Can the Minister update the House on the Government's record investment in regional roads? I call the Minister. Oh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you for the member for Keppel, a great advocate for regional roads and getting a lot done in her electorate of Keppel. Uh, Speaker, over the last 18 months we've seen more than $1.5 billion in new and accelerated funds going out onto regional roads as part of this government's response to the COVID pandemic. We've, as part of our four stimulus packages, we're seeing more than 2,700 jobs directly supported. And anyone who goes out into rural uh, Queensland and country Queensland can just see how much is getting done. The level of uh, positive feedback from mayors is very, very strong, with more than 95 per cent of that outside of TMR's metropolitan region, Mr Speaker. More than, uh, more than uh, most of that $1.5 billion um, uh, is going out. Sorry, uh, Minister. Please resume your seat. Pause the clock. Member for Southern Downs, <laughs> you're more than understanding of us. Thank you, Member for McConnell. I call the Minister. It is good to see the enthusiasm over there from the Member of Southern Downs, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, the road safety is very much our, our commitment. $1.7 billion over four years have been allocated road safety initiatives specifically. That means more overtaking lanes, better intersections, widening, sealing. We're going to seal $100 million worth of dirt roads to sealing as part of the stimulus, uh, Speaker. And in the Calliard electorate itself, can I just say, in the Calliard electorate, we're doing 55 road upgrades worth almost $200 million over the next four years, something the member for Calliard doesn't inform his electorate of at all, Mr Speaker. And I make that point because only weeks ago, uh, the estimates committee process happened, of which the member for Calliard is actually on the committee, paid $24,000 annually to be on the committee and contribute. And he did not ask one question. He did not say one word. Order. Member for Chatsworth will cease his interjections. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Uh, point sorry, of order, Minister Mr. Paul. Please resume your seat. What is your point of order? Arose on a matter of privilege suddenly arising. The Minister had indicated on Twitter this was the case. I corrected him because I looked at the Hansard. The member for Calliard did ask questions during the interview. Uh, no, no. Please, re please, resume, please resume your seat, Member for Kawana. There's not a I'll point of order. To you, Mr. Speaker, that is a separate issue. That is a separate issue, Parliament. and I will uh, look at your correspondence and I'll give it con consideration at that time. I call the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Speaker, the member for Calliard did not ask me a single question in four hours of estimates committee. Not, not one. He, he might be, Mr. Speaker. He talks big on social media. Media, but he's quiet as a church mouse when he comes to Parliament, Mr. Speaker. And he wants to take that silent treatment. He wants to take that silent treatment to Canberra now, running for the federal seat of Flynn, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, he wants to be elected. He calls himself the voice of rural Queensland, but he's more Marcel Marceau, Speaker. You know, the, the, and maybe Canberra needs a Marcel Marceau, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but that kind of silent treatment is just fake. It is fake, Mr Speaker. It's not good enough to go out there on social media and to, to be all tough and then come in here and not do your job and, and, and give, dish out the silent treatment. Speaker, the roads in Calide are so good that I hear that they're so good that, that I hear that the former member for Sandgate 
who were under the Newman government, is being encouraged to join the Chinchilla branch, Mr Speaker, travelling along our regional roads to join the LNP Chinchilla branch to run in case the member for Calide gets up in Flint. They can't even find a local candidate in Calide. They've got to import a former Newman government MP from South East Queensland, Mr Speaker, into the Chinchilla branch. That's how bare Mr. the Speaker. cupboard is, Mr Speaker. The That's member's how time has expired. I call the member for evidence. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Health Minister. Can the Minister confirm that all surger surgery, surgical deaths at Caboolture Hospital in the past 12 months have been fully investigated? I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for evidence for his question. As the member uh, should be aware, um, not every death is investigated. Unexpected deaths um, are automatically um, referred to the coroner, and the coroner makes decisions as to whether there is uh, an investigation that needs to occur in relation to those deaths. Um, I'm aware, as I say, uh, one of the three that were referred to in the Courier Mail article yesterday, um, the death, uh, was referred to the coroner and they chose not to further investigate. So uh, I have no information before me that in any way says that any deaths that are unexpected haven't been referred to the relevant authorities and properly investigated and considered by the coroner. Uh, in putting the question to me, if the member is asserting there has been, by all means, contact my office today and provide me with that information, because simply putting these questions, uh, making statements about bungled surgeries and deaths without any evidence saying It is an offence on the people Order. who work every day in our public health system to attack them and make allegations without making sure you have the evidence to back that up. Mr Speaker, they come in here asking these open-ended questions, which do make an imputation on the health system. These questions today are making an imputation about the quality of care being provided by the health system. Now, as the Health Minister, if there is not care being delivered at the, the quality and the standard that we expect, I want it being investigated and I want action. But let's make sure that it's not done on a letter that says I have it on good authority, which is what I was sent in mid-July. I have it on good authority. This has happened. Make sure that the information is brought forward to the relevant authorities, and whether it's uh, to the HHS whether it is to the Director-General and the Department of Health, whether it's to the Health Ombudsman, whether it is to the coroner, whether it is to my office. There is many channels to raise allegations around genuine complaints around the quality of care in any public health system in Queensland, and they will be investigated. But don't simply come in and say, have any of these deaths been investigated? Leading, putting out there that somehow there hasn't been, that there's been unexplained deaths that have been you know, shoved under the carpet. The fact is that there are processes in place that the hospital and the HHS are required to follow. And if those on the other side have any information that says that has not occurred, then by all means bring it forward. And bring it forward to the Triple C if you think that there is any serious corruption allegations. Don't just do it through the media and in this parliament. Mr. Speaker. Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Rockhampton. Mr. Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen and Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Will the Minister update the House on how important its policies to develop Queensland as a renewable energy superpower is to Queensland's economic recovery? I call the Minister for Energy. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. And can I start by acknowledging the member for Rockhampton's dedication to his role as one of Queensland's three hydrogen champions? And, uh, Speaker, the question is important because our nation is at an historic crossroads. It's important because we know that the policy decisions that we make now will determine the future for generations to come. And, Speaker, history will record that in Queensland we have made the right policy decisions. It will show our historic economic recovery. It will show our historic jobs growth, 300,000 more Queenslanders in jobs now than before the pandemic. It will show historically high levels of investment in Queensland. And from this, 
it will show historically high levels of investment in renewable energy projects in Queensland. In fact, Mr Speaker, 192 projects proposed at the moment, and it will show the largest energy budget in Queensland history, Mr Speaker. History will record under the Palaszczuk government investment in renewable energy is at an historic high. In fact, 60 gigawatts of renewable energy projects proposed. Now, Speaker, this government is taking another historic step. I can inform the House that for the first time in history, structured consultation with regional communities across Queensland will maximise the local benefits from renewable energy developments. Regional communities can have their say now on how renewable projects are developed to benefit them and to benefit their families. Consultation is now open and for the benefit of the House I table this historic consultation paper and I urge members representing regional communities to encourage their constituents to have their say, to have their say about how they will truly benefit. And Speaker, the other fact that history will record is this. When it comes to driving investment in renewables in Queensland, we are going it alone, Speaker, just as Queensland is going it alone with a much needed well camp quarantine facility, Mr Speaker. History will record that Prime Minister Scott Morrison just does not back Queensland, whether it's in the battle against COVID or supporting the job opportunities that come with investment in renewable energy. History will also record, Speaker, it was the LNP in Queensland that wants to turn back the clock, backing nuclear, not renewable, Speaker, backing new coal, costing and causing existing plants to shut down. Regional Queensland, Speaker, should not be ground zero. Regional Queensland should not be ground zero for dangerous, expensive or outdated technology, Mr Speaker. History will record that it was Prime Minister Scott Morrison that wanted to hold Queensland back on renewables, just as he has held this state back on the battle against COVID, Mr Speaker. His preferences for energy are discredited and they're dangerous, Mr Speaker, just like his rollout of the vaccine, Mr Speaker. History will record it was Prime Minister Scott Morrison that failed this nation on quarantine, on vaccine and on renewable energy. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Tula North. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. Can the Minister guarantee Caboolture Hospital won't lose its surgical accreditation with the Royal Australian College of Surgeons? I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I understand reaccreditation is going on right now. Draft report has been provided uh, that shows that it's a favourable outcome. I'll wait for the final accreditation. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Mackay. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Tourism, Industry Development and Innovation and the Minister for Sport. Will the Minister inform the House if there is any further assistance available for operators of marine tourism operators with berthing costs for their vessels? And is the Minister aware of any alternative um, approaches? I call the Minister for Tourism. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for the question and, and acknowledge uh, her keen advocacy for the recovery of the tourism industry in the Mackay and Winstonday's region and the advocacy of so many other members uh, around this uh, issue. The Palaszczuk government has committed uh, $1 billion in direct support for Queensland's tourism operators during the pandemic, and we are continuing to listen. Marine uh, tourism operators have told us that they need ongoing help with the cost of berthing fees in privately owned marinas. And the Palaszczuk government is, from today, rolling out a second $3 million round of our COVID-19 marine tourism assistance scheme. It will provide up to $20,000 to operators up until 30 June next year. This is part of the government's recently announced $47.75 million tourism and hospitality sector lockdown package. Uh, last year's first round, Mr Speaker, saw 130 applications approved from Port Douglas to the Fraser Coast. After feedback from operators, we've made this second round even easier. Marine uh, tourism operators will no longer have to pay their berthing fees up front to be eligible to apply. This second round of support underscores the importance of marine operators to the industry in delivering first-class visitor experiences. Uh, we know lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria have locked out more than 80 per cent of Queensland's tourism customers, and that's having an ongoing uh, huge impact to the industry. But we equally know that uh, industry has noted on numerous occasions that they want to see more action from the federal government. They want to see more action from the federal tourism minister, uh, Dan Tian. 
And I, and I note uh, the remarks made by the, the Treasurer earlier today. Uh, that's why we need JobKeeper. And that's why I've written to Mr Tian backing calls from Queensland's tourism industry for the federal government to deliver a targeted JobKeeper-style uh, wage subsidy. Emergency measures are desperately needed to sustain Queensland's tourism and hospitality industry until business capacity, confidence and visitors are restored. Uh, it's time also, Mr Speaker, for those opposite to put that pressure on the federal government as well to step up while there's still a Queensland tourism industry to throw a lifeline to. Uh, JobKeeper, as uh, the, the Treasurer said earlier, was an extraordinarily important package which sustained and helped uh, all Australians so significantly through the desperate uh, situations of the pandemic last year. But the, it cutting, being cut off in the way that it was has caused extraordinary pain, particularly to the tourism sector and to other sectors of our economy who have not been able to recover in the same way due to the remaining closure of international borders and the extensive lockdowns that we've now seen in Victoria and, uh, and, uh, sorry, in Victoria and New South Wales, and the impact that that's had particularly on our Queensland tourism industry. So a targeted response that continues that sort of support, not just to aviation workers, but to others in our important tourism sector is what's vitally needed, and I call on everyone to support and raise their voice up with the federal government. Mr. Tom has expired. I call the member for Butterham. Mr. Speaker, a question to the health minister. Sunshine Coast resident Cynthia has been waiting on the Sunshine Coast hospital waitlist since September 2020. She's been told that, and I quote, she may be offered an appointment in January 2022. End quote. How long will Cynthia have to suffer in pain on Queensland's ballooning hospital wait lists before she can receive surgery? Uh, the period for question time has expired. <laughs> I'm sorry, Member. Um, I did want to interrupt your question. Uh, order, Members. Members will leave the chamber quietly if you are doing so, uh, as a courtesy to other, uh, other Members. I call the Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I move the business program motion circulated in my name. Uh, and uh, in doing so, I know the opposition have been eagerly awaiting uh, to come back to Parliament and have the uh, debate on the business motion. Um, Mr Speaker, in uh, moving this motion, I would like to congratulate uh, James Martin, the new member for Stretton, uh, on his election to the seat and wish him all the best moving forward. And James and I got to work together many years ago, and it's wonderful to know that we now get to work to together as members of parliament. I know he'll do an incredible job, uh, and I know he's got big shoes to fill. It's a sad day, but a very happy day as well. Um, but I know you will uh, do Duncan proud uh, for what you're, you're going to do for his community and for your new community. Uh, Mr Speaker, turning to the motion before the House, members will note there is uh, one bill for consideration during this week's sitting, namely the Public Health and Other Legislation, further extension of expiring provisions amendment bill without, within the motion. Um, however, in addition to this bill, the House will consider eight portfolio committee reports, noting the Economics and Governance Committee has two reports into the recent estimates hearings, with debate on those reports commencing shortly. This will take approximately seven, just over seven hours, seven and a half hours to complete, and I look forward to hearing and contributing to this constructive debate. This afternoon, the member for Stretton will have the opportunity to deliver his first speech to this chamber, a speech which is certainly one of the highlights of any member of Parliament's career, and I am sure that all honourable members will give the occasion the respect we all have been afforded during our first speeches. The Premier and the Minister for Trade later this week will move a motion of condolence for the former member for Stretton, which I know there are a number of members wishing to contribute to that debate. As such, that condolence motion will be allocated three hours, with up to ten minutes for the Premier, Minister for Trade and the Leader of the Opposition or nominee, and five minutes for other members. This condolence motion is currently scheduled to take place from 3 p.m. on Thursday, and I've been advised the former member for Stretton's family will be in attendance for the debate on this motion. The sitting week after any break is always busy, and this week is no different. I thank the members of the Business Committee for meeting last night to discuss the potential business of the House. I also thank the member for Kuwana, who informed me via correspondence of the approximate numbers of members on their side uh, who may contribute to the condolence motion as well this week. And, uh, and of course, um, next week's sitting as well, where we'll have a further condolence motion. Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that the opposition and the crossbench 
would prefer to see additional time to debate the public health bill. I know that uh, the broader issue of COVID uh, certainly warrants a lot of debate and discussion in this chamber and out in the broader community. Uh, but we must remember what the bill is doing. Um, and the debate on the bill should be concentrated on the bill and what it seeks to achieve as much as we would like to talk about the broader consequences of COVID generally. Um, and, I, and consequently, I do believe that the time we have allotted, being the four hours for that debate, is adequate time to debate that bill, seeing it is an extension of existing public health bills. Um, I don't say that lightly. I don't uh, say that the extension is um, a trivial matter, because it's not. Uh, but I don't think any of us stand here uh, believing that COVID will be over in September. So uh, this is an important bill and it must be debated this week. Uh, and of course, we have a very important debate to be had next week as well. So it's important this legislation um, goes through and goes through with the allotted time. I know that uh, you know the House will manage that time, as we have been doing very well in recent times, uh, and that members uh, will uh, have the opportunity to speak and contribute to that debate and be mindful of the time allocated for that debate. So I do ask that members uh, support this bill. Uh, I will always be hopeful that the opposition will support that, but I don't think on this occasion I will get that support. But I look forward to listening to the debate anyway on the motion. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Kiwana. Mr Speaker, thank you. I strongly, strongly oppose this motion before the House. This motion before the House is one of the worst we have seen. We know it's a full week. We know we have to deal with the condolence motion of Mr Duncan Pegg, who recently passed away. So we'll address that as we always do. But the committee meeting yesterday, and I note the member for Noosa will be speaking as well, was an absolute disgrace. The Help, the Minister for Health, but also the Leader of the House, in allocating the timing this week, notified the committee yesterday that, that there, would tech, there would be three hours for debate on the extension of the Chief Health Officer powers and directives, but then if we get rid of the committee debate reports on Thursday, we'll be able to have four hours. Well, how generous of the government to get rid of an hour of committee debates, which is also important for this House to debate, to give us another opportunity. The Health Minister just said less than a minute ago the uh, public health and other legislation ex uh, extension of expiring provisions, which is the Chief Health Officer Power Bill, um, warrants a lot of debate. She just said it. She said warrants a lot of debate. And yet we are given four hours in a week. Mr Speaker, the reason I strongly oppose this motion, which constrains the debate time on the Chief Health Officer Extension of Powers Bill, is because of this and was raised yesterday in the, at the business committee meeting. People are committing suicide because of these powers. Businesses are going broke because of lockdowns and restrictions. Lifeline, no, not in New South Wales, in Queensland, whoever made that disgraceful interjection, Mem uh, Mem Member Powell. Queenslanders are committing suicide. Queensland businesses are shutting down, not just New South Wales, as he interjected. Mr Speaker, it is because of these powers and the extraordinary nature of these powers, this parliament should debate them. We should debate fully and whether they should go till April next year, as we'll debate in the bill debate this week. We'll stay all night. We're happy to work through the lunch break, happy to work through the dinner break, happy to work all night to allow members the opportunity to speak on this. We are getting feedback from our constituents in our communities, Mr. De Mr. Speaker. The anxiety, the stress, I take the interjection, the depression, it is sad. As we speak and had question time this morning, I'm getting emails from my constituents who are now refugees stuck over the border and they cannot come home. They cannot come to their own home. And this government says you can have, take off their two hours, you can have two hours to debate. 
whether these restrictions, which allow the Chief Health Officer and the Government to have the border restrictions, have the lockdowns and the other business restrictions, Mr. Mr. Speaker. It warrants more than two hours of opposition debate time, Mr. Speaker. For the sake of the people that have lost their lives, not because of COVID, but because of suicide, mental health, small businesses going broke, the financial suffering of our constituents. And for the government to say, four hours debate, there are serious questions about the length of time these powers should operate to. Members will not be afforded the opportunity to have that debate this week. It is probably the most serious debate this year Queensland Parliament will debate in all the issues we have to debate. Because, as I've said, those issues, people stuck over the border. The government say, Mr Speaker, that these are New South Welshmen and Victorians moving to Queensland. These are Queenslanders who live in Queensland who have been denied the opportunity to come to their own home. We know people who have been attending funerals in New South Wales who cannot get home. They are happy to do quarantine, the two-week quarantine, happy. They cannot get to their own home. What a disgrace. We are in a society now where the Queensland Government does not allow its own citizens back in their own home state, and it deserves more time to debate it than what we are giving. Mr Speaker, I move an amendment to the motion put forward. In one, replace 1pm to 6pm. In two, replace 12.10 with 5pm. And in three, replace 1pm with 6pm. If the government are not happy to stay past hours, then all I would say to the government, please give us a few more hours debate time to stand up for our communities that are suffering under these extraordinary Chief Health Officer powers at the moment. Members' time has expired. Speaker. I call the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Thank you, Speaker. Well, what an extraordinary contribution from the member for Guana, and probably not for reasons, not for reasons that he would suggest, Mr Speaker. Um, aside from the obvious point that he always opposes almost always, 99% of the time, opposes our business motions because he likes to grandstand. This is his little amateur theatre, Mr Speaker. We know his amateur thespian tendencies. But, Mr Speaker, um, what we have this week is a range of extra measures that we necessarily we need to deal with. The estimates reports, obviously, coming out of the estimates process. Uh, we do have uh, the unusual and uh, very difficult circumstance of uh, condolence motion for someone who served in this term. And uh, we, we obviously need more time than uh, what might be usual in a condolence motion because uh, we all knew him, uh, the, uh, Duncan. Uh, but aside from those points, uh, it is this bill, the Public Health and Other Legislation uh, Bill, uh, Amendment Bill, is largely the same as it's been. It's largely a turnover. There are a couple of variations and a few issues there, but largely it is a known thing, Mr Speaker. So for the, for the postulations of the member for Kiwana, uh, try and get, him, get his blood going up a little bit there, uh, to try and look a bit convincing, Mr Speaker, uh, th this is a known quantity. This is a known quantity. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, please uh, pause the clock. I, I take personal seat. offence at what the minister said, and I ask him to withdraw. Uh, the member for Kiwana has taken offence. Minister, will you withdraw? I withdraw. Thank you. New, new level of sensitivity, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, without, order, without, Mr. Speaker. without uh, please resume your seat. I, I withdraw. With, without qualification. I, I withdraw without qualification. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, but, you know, the, the, member, the member for Kiwana has just said, uh, outlined businesses, as people, there are su suicides happening because of this power. Businesses are going broke because of these powers. And he's talked about anxiety and depression. These are, relevant, these are issues that are important issues, but they are not due to these powers. They are due to the pandemic. They are due to the pandemic. And you compare this state to any other jurisdiction when it comes to dealing with this virus which kills people, where people die long, they, they die painful, lonely deaths necessarily because of the contagiousness of the, the disease. And we have lost seven people in Queensland, tragically. But you compare that to New South Wales and you compare that to just any other country, our measures have been highly responsible. That's not to say we don't help people who might be struggling in other ways. Of course we do. We do that absolutely. But, you know, the contribution from the member for Kwana betrays some of his 
and the opposition's views of undermining the health response here in Queensland. And we've seen it. They called for the borders to be opened 64 times. They all, they, they Pause the clock. Uh, member for Southern Downs, you're on a warning. You're interjecting. You will leave the chamber for one hour. I have made my directions on this matter clear over many months. Uh, Minister for Transport and Main Roads, you have the call. Thank you, Spe thank you Speaker. Uh, we have dealt with this pandemic in the best possible way we can, and that is saving lives, Speaker. Uh, these measures are largely a rollover, and we will continue our health response, as, as premiers in most other states, not all, but most other states are very clear that while we've got these, the next three or four months are uh, incredible periods of risk. You just look at the states in the US who have got higher vaccination rates than Australia because the Prime Minister was so uh, indolent and incompetent in ordering vaccines and dealing with quarantine. We are way below a whole lot of US states that are seeing a, a terrible, terrible third wave. You know, in Florida, they're seeing more than 200 deaths a day, and their vaccination rate is a lot higher than any state in Australia right now. So let's be really clear and get the politics out of the health response, because this is a matter of science and a matter of medicine. And we have always said that you've got to deal with the health first and foremost. You must protect lives. And we have got an incredible period of risk. And I have to say, I have no tolerance. I have no tolerance for any person, let alone a member of parliament, who is undermining one of the best health responses in the world here in Queensland. Now, you know, there will be ample opportunity in a four-hour debate to, to, to debate a bill that's largely a repetition. It's being rolled over with a couple of adjustments. That's pretty much what we're talking about. If you can't cover the adjustments in a couple of hours of debate, then you're not worth your salt. Go on, Frank. You're not worth your salt. So, Speaker, I endorse the business motion. It's a responsible motion. We have to order our business and make priorities. We don't need six hours, eight hours, ten hours of people giving the same old speech, the dusty old, you know, key lines and themes of the LNP. Uh, we, we want a genuine debate. It means you've got to prioritise. It's an ample opportunity to raise the issues that you're concerned about. Um, and that is, the, that is the, the way we deal with it. That is the way any responsible parliament deals with it. I endorse the Leader of the House's motion. Uh, I call the member for Noosa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, you know it's a rarity for me to get up and oppose the business motion, and I appreciate with what both ministers have said. How, however, we aren't, talking, we aren't trying to undermine anything here, nor disrespect the efforts that have been made. However, what we've sought is an extension of time, that extra time, and that is to give voice to our people. This is the people's house, and all people should be heard from across Queensland. Now, look, I realise other electorates may not have some of the impacts that we are, including in the Noosa electorate, but they're on their knees, and, and we need that time to give them a voice. So, actually, who are they? Member for Kamana has mentioned a couple, but we've got businesses that are told to close and aren't compensated adequately. We've got staff who, for every day they are closed, can't meet their rents. We've got businesses and people living off personal loans now for over a year, and they don't even know where to turn anymore. We've got spiralling mental health. That now it's, it's more than two months to even get in to see a mental health professional. Then you talk about the wait list. We've got heartbreaking stories of constituents in agony who are now on an 18-month list to get operations they desperately need to keep working. We have had in my community for two years now an increase of 30 per cent year-on-year year in domestic violence. I wonder about all those that we actually don't even know about. We have a humanitarian crisis where our workers and long-term residents are couch surfing, they're living in sheds in, or wherever they can. We have staff walking out or on stress leave from the abuse they are receiving, or they're losing their long-held jobs in aged care and disability care because of their own personal choice regarding vaccinations. We, have, we had protesters before there was even protests down here, and today, again, we had them in Noosa. And this is regardless. Look, I understand that there are 
others, and there's other states and other countries that are suffering worse, but this is Queensland and we've got to look after our people. We've got residents caught over the border, and I can tell you some horrific stories of what's happened to some of our women travelling alone. They don't even have the option to come back into quarantine. And yet, the NRL, and I understand the Premier has spoken about this, players and their families that are able to fly in from hotspots. Now, don't get me wrong, everyone loves the game. However, what we desperately need is consistency and equity. Consistency and equity. My community cannot get their heads around this, regardless of explanations. The list goes on. Yet, I may not get to tell their stories because with the motion, the business motion, not the amendment, allowing limited time, including the consideration in detail on uh, such as the Queensland app, Eckerd show holiday, personalised transport and also the extra two deputy uh, CHOs, I might not get that opportunity. You may not believe so much needs to be said, given that we have debated these same provisions before. However, for my community and maybe other communities from the MPs here, that misses the point. These provisions were debated before we are at this time point. We're nearly two years, coming up two years of this pandemic. Before we realised things like flattening of the curve was not going to be enough, before we saw the real grassroots impacts and what is needed going forward. This is so important that we have time to talk about this. This inability to secure the extra time also demonstrates how the committee system is flawed, because even when we are there, regardless of our objections, we cannot influence the determinations. Queenslanders have worked through this pandemic together. However, for those that are not in jobs, which still pay during lockdowns or are sufficiently supported, they're wearing the brunt in these efforts to keep Queenslanders safe. And they feel that we are no longer in this together. This has become an economic divide of the have and the have or the secure and the insecure. Can you imagine how isolated, devastated and how let down they feel? So I think that is just reason to have extra time in the debate. So hence, they're the reasons why I oppose the government's motion and I support the amendments put forward by the member for Kiwana. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Since when it has been proposed that the question be amended uh, to omit certain words and inserting certain words contained in the amendment. The question now is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The division has been called. Ring the bells for four minutes.
close of ours. The question is that the amendment uh, by the member for Kawana be agreed to, for which a division has been called. Members are reminded that uh, the total number of votes cast for each party include those present under sessional orders and any proxy votes, but must not include paired members or members asked to withdraw from the chamber and excluded from voting under standing orders. Will the government whip advise what the government votes are for the ayes or noes? Uh, 50 noes, Mr Speaker. Will the opposition whip advise what the opposition votes are for the ayes or noes? 30 ayes, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, delegate for Catters Australian Party advise what the KAP votes are for the ayes or noes? Three ayes, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, delegate from Queensland Greens advise what the Queensland Green votes are for the ayes or noes? Two ayes, Mr Speaker. Uh, will the member for Moroni advise what your vote is for the ayes or noes? Aye, Mr Speaker. Will the member for Noosa advise what your vote is for the ayes or noes? Aye, Mr Speaker. The result of the division is ayes 37, noes 50. The question is resolved in the negative. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the eyes have it. The division has been called. Ring the bells for one minute. Close the bars. The question is that the motion be agreed to for which a division has been called. Uh, voting instructions are per my previous advice. Will the government whip advise what the government votes are for the ayes or noes? Uh, 50 ayes, Mr Speaker. Will the opposition whip advise what the opposition votes are for the ayes or noes? 13 noes, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, KAP delegate advise what the KAP votes are for the ayes or noes? Three noes, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, delegate from the Queensland Greens advise what the Queensland Green votes are for the ayes or noes? Two noes, Mr Speaker. Will the member for Morani advise what your vote is for the ayes or noes? No, Speaker. And will the member for Noosa advise what your vote is for the ayes or noes? No, Mr Speaker. The result of the division is ayes 50, noes 37. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the sessional orders be suspended to enable the member for Stretton to make a statement not exceeding 20 minutes, noting his election at 3pm today. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Mr Speaker, I move that this House 1 notes the Transport and Resources Committee Report Number 11, Inquiry into Vehicle Safety Standards and Technology, including en Engine Immobiliser Technology Interim Report, seeking an extension of time to report fully to the terms of reference previously ag agreed to by the House on Wednesday, 24 February 2021, and two, agrees to the committee fully and finally reporting to the Legislative Assembly on the inquiry by 24 September 2021. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Mr. Speaker, I move that notwithstanding anything contained in the standing and session orders, debate of committee reports be postponed for this sitting week 
uh, for the sitting week scheduled from 14 to 16 September. Sorry, uh, debate of committee reports be postponed for this week's sitting and for the sitting week scheduled from 14 to 16 September 2021. Speaking, speaking very briefly to this, um, as uh, I've already highlighted in the business motion, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ensure that we do have additional time uh, for the public health bill debate, um, we believe it's appropriate to defer. The, uh, or postpone the committee debates, and as the next sitting has been set aside to debate the uh, voluntary assisted dying bill, we believe it's appropriate to find as much uh, time as possible to ensure members get to speak on that bill who wishes to, and that's why this postponement is proposed. Speaker, I call the uh, member for Kawana. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, ordinarily I'd oppose this because it's basically we have this motion so often now where the committee reports are just just flung on to the never never uh, because the government failed to manage this house. They're failing to manage the what what happens in the house. They're failing to manage the legislation debates. Uh, they're just continually failing in getting their agenda or what they want the agenda through the parliament without guillotining and cutting short debate time. So the only reason, Mr Speaker, that I'm agreeing to this is because we've got the important debate we've just had with the extension of the Chief Health Officer powers. So if that gives us another, an additional hour to debate that, then that's why I'm agreeing to it. But I, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, we're getting into a position now we are more frequently than, than more, uh, frequently than not, uh, always now just pushing these committee reports, uh, they're in the standing order for a reason. And the committee work and all the MPs get paid to be on the committee to do the work and then just to keep pushing into the Never Region the uh, committee report debates, Mr. Uh, I withdraw that actually, Mr. Speaker, uh, into the <laughs> thank Never you, Ever. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the Never Ever. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's a, a, again a slight on democracy and not what politicians in this parliament are being actually paid to do for that com important committee work. Um, it's uh, uh, unfortunate that we've now got into a situation that because the government can't manage the business of the House, we just keep, just, uh, keep you know, pushing these things uh, these out. So the only reason, and I'm not saying I'm going to get a, set a precedent here by supporting this, Mr Speaker, the only reason I'm supporting it is because I want more members the opportunity to talk on the extension of the Chief Health Hour Chief Health Officer bills, which is important to our constituencies, as was noted by the member for Noosa before as well. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move one that the member for Rockhampton and Harvey Bay be discharged from and the members for Cooper and Mount Omni be appointed to the Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Committee. Two, that the member for Mount Omni be discharged from and the member for Stretton be appointed to the Transport and Resources Committee. I call the member for Kawana. Uh, Mr Speaker, this uh, is with respect to uh, the member for Mundingborough now putting, on the putting him on the committee. Right, we'll get to that one and I'll talk on that one. Thank you, members. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk to read the next order of the day. Government business, order of the day number one, appropriation parliament bill, appropriation bill, consideration in detail, cognate debate. I call the uh, member for... Um, Mr. S uh, sorry, Member for Logan. Um, the House will consider the Appropriation Parliament Bill first. Uh, I call the Member... Thank you. The question is that the report of the Economics and Governance Committee be adopted. I call the Member for Logan. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I uh, report to the House that the Committee recommends that the proposed expenditure for the Legislative Assembly Parliamentary Service, as detailed in the Appropriations Bill 2021, be with agreed with the Legislative Assembly without amendment. And that's, Mr Speaker, because this committee uh, values the role we have in maintaining our House um, and maintaining the place that we have. I once heard the member for Kiwana describe it as uh, Queensland's premier heritage house, and we have to uh, continue to think of that. I wish to speak, uh, thank the Speaker and the Clerk that appeared before us, and also note that the member for Maywar and the member for Kiwana joined the committee, the erstwhile combative member for Mermaid Beach, member for Coomera, McAllister, Nindri and Harvey Bay, 
all took the responsibility seriously. Um, I also um, uh, note that the inquiry process uh, looked at the, what we were doing for the House, which was the important uh, budget uh, that is going to take extensive um, uh, repairs, especially to the uh, uh, major refurbishment of the parliamentary annex. And it's impor important that these steps are actually put in place uh, with the support of both sides of Parliament. And in that way, there was a, a productive, uh, productive uh, value of it. What I was disappointed with, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that in the report and statement of reservations, there was a comment that really I found really disappointing, that this system is process, it's, and I quote here, in this system is process, Queensland expect Labor government to be honest and accountable. And is our view instead that Labor committee chairs use the standing orders to protect Labor ministers? Now, the Speaker uh, made extensive commentary on the process of the committees. And unfortunately, he, asked, he called upon us all to actually take out the theatre and to take the scrutiny of the process. And he was right. But unfortunately, we saw throughout the estimates process by those opposite, there was multiple attempts at amateur theatre, grandstanding, and acting a manner just to get their faces on the nightly news. Look, I've been advised that during a number of the hearings, those opposite continued to interrupt witnesses and speak over them and indeed spoke over the chairperson. And I know this happened to myself a number of occasions. This is deeply disappointing and deeply disrespectful to the process of parliament. Well, I, I note that the members of the committee did have respect for that process and I admire them for that. Unfortunately, that was not for some of our invited guests. Now, I, one of the ones I'd noted is during the Health and Ambulance Services Committee, the member for Mudgerbother and, uh, Mudgerbother and her colleagues interrupted the chair 62 times. That is nearly as many times as they have called for our borders to be opened, which would have actually damaged our health of Queensland even more. The non-government members of this chamber, the neighbour, well, it's relevant to the speaker who, gave, who spoke to the estimates process, and that's what I'm addressing. It's a vital that the speaker actually gave us guidance on the entire estimates, and I'm reflecting on what was in that report. Non-government members of these chambers have claimed they needed more time to ask questions. Well, statistics, unfortunately, are against them. I'm advised that overall throughout the estimates period, 39 per cent of the time was used by government member questions, 39 per cent, which of course means 61 per cent of the time was utilised, and I use that word utilised in inverted commas, utilised by non-government members questions. I'm further advised that the total questions during the estimates hearings, 29 per cent were, used, were asked by the government members, 71 per cent of questions were asked by non-government members. That's approximately 737 questions asked by non-government members and only 294 questions by the government. Comparing this to the Newman government in 2013, I advise that 45% of, of the questions were asked by government members and 55% were asked by non-government members. These statistics show there has been a dramatic increase in time given to opposition and non-government uh, members uh, and during this estimates process during the Palaszczuk government. Now, I note that we have done this through our process. I cannot be responsible for the opposition failing to actually put uh, questions that actually matter. During this period of COVID, it is so vital that we reflect on the role of government, that we have to be nimble uh, and accurate and find new and innovative ways to help Queenslanders. And I have to say that the amateur theatrics, the shameful behaviour, the interruptions were a disservice to the estimates process by the opposition and a disservice to this House. Ma uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I call uh, the member for Mermaid Beach. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I am disappointed to hear the Chair of the Economics and Governance Committee uh, ramble on about matters that were irrelevant to the particular bill in terms of the appropriation of the parliamentary services here. And uh, he waffled on about other matters that were irrelevant to uh, the particular appropriation bill that we are uh, certainly talking about today. And I would like to congratulate uh, particularly uh, the government on their allocation uh, to the parliamentary services of in excess of $30 million to upgrade the parliamentary precinct, particularly 
for the staff that have suffered in anachronistic uh, facilities here, uh, I think 1974 for the parliamentary annex building and some of the conditions that, that they are working uh, are basically um, historically bad. So uh, I would uh, take this opportunity in terms of the allocations to the parliamentary service for that particular job, which uh, was raised by the manager of opposition business previously, in the previous year, uh, very successfully, and I'm glad uh, it has been taken on board and dealt with. Uh, a disappointment I had, uh, particularly uh, with the uh, um, monies dealt with through the year, was the failure of the IT system through the phone system and the failure to recoup monies uh, that should have been recouped. And unfortunately, uh, IT is a very difficult area that seems to be costing uh, the taxpayers of Queensland uh, every which way. And uh, I look forward to uh, the new IT regime that the uh, Clerk of the Parliament has um, uh, advised us that will be taking place further. And again, a little disappointment was a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars was cut from the bill. Uh, for the appropriation for the parliamentary services and in an era when we are needing more in terms of support staff, uh, there's more in, uh, required in terms of office movements, etc., uh, to cut the parliamentary services budget by, I think, 216,000, somewhere around that figure, uh, was probably a disappointment I had out of that appropriation bill. But the commitments that we have to uh, this, uh, this area, this building, this precinct, uh, in my view, we are the caretakers, uh, if you like, for a brief period here in the Parliament for the preeminent building, historical building in Queensland and its surrounds. I often refer uh, the parliamentary um, precinct as a bit like Vatican City. Uh, I suppose in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the fact is that the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the House is a bit like the Pope and uh, the person running the finances, the clerk of the parliament, a bit like George Pell, I suppose, over in the uh, Vatican City, running the finances of the parliamentary services. <coughs> so, but what we expend in terms of maintaining this building through the, the, the stoneworks, through the beautiful areas that we all enjoy, uh, is a very humbling experience. I feel very privileged, as I know all members do, that uh, uh, get the privilege of sitting in this House. And to that end, the appropriation bill for 21-22 uh, was very, very appropriate in terms of maintaining the uh, living standards of this particular building and the precinct. And I certainly commend uh, this uh, appropriation bill. Uh, thank you, Member for Mermaid Beach. The question is that the report of the Economics and Governance Committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Anybody? Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. There are four clauses and one schedule. I propose to call the clauses. If any member wishes to speak to a particular clause, will they please indicate? The question is that clauses one to four, as read, stand part of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the schedule, as read, stand part of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The House will now consider the appropriation bill. The question is that the report of the Economics and Governments Committee be adopted, and I call the member for Labor. I'll just give you a chance, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, um, I'm proud to say that the committee recommends that the proposed expenditure of the, uh, of the appropriations bill as uh, Parliament 2021 be agreed to by the Legislative Assembly without amendment. Um, uh, um, Acting Deputy Speaker, we saw at the committee an enthusiastic participation, not only from the fantastic committee, which I've already uh, thanked in the previous uh, uh, speech, but, and I'd also like to extend the thank yous to the Secretariat. 
I know that they do – here, here, we hear from uh, the uh, member for Murray Bay Beach because they know that they do a great job, a very professional job, uh, a very bipartisan job, including, any, uh, including all of us. I also noticed that um, there was a, a enthusiastic participation from uh, the member from Rani, Maywa, Kawana, Broadworth South, Toowoomba South, Traegar, South Brisbane, Everton, Body and our Maroochydore. And we welcome uh, all of the participation from members. But I have to, firstly, um, give an apology. Um, and it's reflecting on my chairing of the committee. I have to apologise to the House, and especially to the members of the committee from the government side. Because we had a long committee, 10.33 hours of, of questioning of the ministers, hard interrogative questioning. And um, unfortunately, we aim to give a 50-50 distribution. It's vital of the estimates process that we see the good work that government is doing within the process, as well as getting hard interrogative questions. And we put questions that we're trying to, to ask questions about our local area, about services that were going on, facilities that were there. And, uh, and unfortunately, due to my enthusiasm for being fair to the opposition, of that 10.33 10 hours, uh, only four hours were allocated to government questioning. And I apologise to the House for not giving the adequate time for, for those members to put the questions about their local area, about the issues that are important to them in this important COVID time. And I gave 5.29 hours uh, to the non-government questioning. Now, that is a record amount of government questioning of which they had the time to utilise as they saw fit. Um, I don't know if it was fair that I gave so much time to the opposition and the non-government members, but they had that opportunity to do that. And that's why I was frankly a little bit hurt and disappointed when there was a, in the reservations, there was a statement that That's I enough had not, sympathy, members. Thank you. <laughs> Member for Logan, that I stop. had not given uh, adequate question time when I have given record question time. And I challenge the opposition. If you can find a single chair that gave anywhere near uh, 5.29 hours of questioning to an opposition and non-government members, Find it for me, because I have given, uh, and I value them so much, uh, and, uh, I try and give them a fair go, and frankly, I probably gave them too much of a fair go. Now, as it happens, and I apologise to the members of the committee from the government side, because they had valuable questions they wanted to put. So, we need to reflect, we were talking about the appropriations for the Treasurer and for the Premier, we need to reflect on the key issues that are part of our government. On the first one is that, um, uh, we need to see how jobs are being created in this, post, in this COVID uh, atmosphere. Now, w we know that uh, the nation uh, has made a real vote of support for Queensland, the Queensland economy, and the handling of COVID within Queensland, as there were over 58,000 new Queenslanders last year. That's well above the population share that we face. And look, coming from an outer suburban area such as Logan, I know that there are benefits and challenges of new housing. But there again, there's a vote of confidence in the Queensland economy, which has seen 71 per cent growth in the past 12 months in building approvals. They're up 30, and building approvals are up by 39 per cent. So residential housing is a start. There's so much more that we need to do uh, to continue that, but the biggest one is to keep our community safe. That's why I'm glad to see in the appropriations that we do, the extra appropriations will be due, we will be in our committee seeing the funding of a quarantine station dedicated uh, to keeping Queenslanders safe and keeping our economy safe and keeping people in work. That's what this government's focused on. I also want to recognise that because of that growth, we need to keep funding vaccines and quarantines. We need to keep funding the Mount Lindsay Highway construction to continue. I know this, the, member, the uh, Transport Minister's there. He knows how valuable the Stony Camp Road through the Chambers Flat uh, section is. We need to get the fire station in Yarra Bilb, which has just recently been opened, the ambulance station in Munroobin. We need that funding to continue, and we don't want to see the cuts and, and uh, sackings and sell-offs of the LNP. Member for Seth. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, I rise to make a contribution to the report. And it is worth uh, repeating, Mr Deputy Speaker, our categorisation of this uh, budget as a budget of accounting without principles and funds without funding. And sadly, nothing during the estimates process proved that uh, to be an incorrect characterisation of the budget. And Mr Deputy Speaker, there was clearly, there is clearly no plan from this government to adjust to a post 
COVID world, a new normal, a post-COVID economic environment. The glossy brochure over there may have disappeared that they carried around attached to their chests during the election campaign and into this year. That's now disappeared. But what budgets, what budgets highlight our priorities and vision? And again, through the budget process in June, all the way through estimates, no matter, no matter the portfolio, it was clear that this government does have no plan, no plan for the future of the economic uh, position of our state. And now we have a federal government starting to lead the way in respect of the new normal, the new financial environment that we'll be addressing. That we'll be addressing. There is a plan, and now it's up to this. It's up to this state Labor government to start to address uh, our economic, our economic future as well, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Because we know, we know, if we look back at the economic conditions that we were faced with prior to COVID and into COVID. The economic conditions in Queensland, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the, the, the advocacy from the Treasurer, the truth Order is members. very, very different, Mr Deputy Speaker. There was always ballooning debt. The debt had blown out from $72 billion to $102 billion long before COVID. Queensland remains the bankruptcy capital of Australia. Four and a half thousand people uh, lived through bankruptcy in 2020, Mr Deputy Speaker. And my fear is that that will continue to be a problem right throughout our economy as we see small and, and family businesses struggling under the, under the weight of COVID and the failure of this government to properly support them through that process, Mr Deputy Speaker. In this year's budget, we saw infrastructure cuts, infrastructure cuts to the tune of $4 billion. We have the, the member for Miller talking about infrastructure. The truth is very, very different across the Fords of this budget very, very different, Mr Deputy Speaker, to what this government tries to portray. At ComSec level, we continue to be, become at, coming at the bottom of the table, last, last for economic growth in the country. Expenses continue to outstrip revenue growth. Expenses continue to outstrip revenue across the, the longer term of the budget, Mr Deputy Speaker. This was all occurring pre-COVID and living through COVID now as well, and feeds into the challenge of this government that does not have a plan for the future. In the budget, we saw imaginary funding for a series of funds, not a single dollar in the forwards for all the new funding that's been announced, Mr Deputy Speaker. We see continuing, a continuing decline in the confidence in our mining sector. Just 10 years ago, one in four of every um, mineral exploration dollar spent in Australia was spent in Queensland. That's now drifted out to one in eight dollars, as revealed by the ABS recently. One in eight in minerals ex exploration dollars spent in this country is now spent here in Queensland. So what we see, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a growing concern that there is no plan post-COVID for the new normal in this country. And this budget has again proven, has again proven that the Treasurer is simply not up to the task of delivering that future plan. And we see that writ large. The Treasurer came to Toowoomba on one of his road, budget road shows, and they've been they've been going, they've order, been going members, throughout order. The, the, the Treasurer parks the personal abuse that we cop here in this House, turns on the charm for the people out in the regions. But Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, order, what, members, what the Treasurer cannot walk the clock, away from. Pause the clock. Members on my right will cease interjecting or I'll start warning people. For Toowoomba South has Mr Deputy Speaker, what the Treasurer cannot walk away from after presenting to the Toowoomba business community, he did not take a single question. Did not take a single question from the business community of Toowoomba. And they are a very civilised group, Mr Deputy Speaker. But my guess is that the Treasurer did not want to answer a single question about the lack of resources and infrastructure in Toowoomba. He didn't want to answer a question about the failure to build a new Toowoomba hospital the failure to build a new Toowoomba hospital. And in Cairns, it gets even worse. We heard the Treasurer this morning talking about what his solution was in Cairns. It wasn't to put out a small business package, to stand with the small businesses of Cairns. It was simply to hold the federal parliament to ransom. That was his solution. This is a government bereft of ideas and a Treasurer out of his Members depth. time has expired. I call Thank the Treasurer. You. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to contribute to the debate on this report. And if I want to compare uh, economic recovery plans, I'll do, I'll do one thing, Speaker. I'll compare our economic recovery plan with the Bruce Highway hoax and the fake Bradfield scheme. And then the people of Queensland make a decision 
on those two plans at the last election. And if you want to talk about questions, Member for Toowoomba South, my simple challenge to you is ask me a question in the House in question time this morning because, because you didn't have the fortitude to ask me one today. Speaker, I want to thank the committee for their work uh, through the estimates process, particularly the mighty member for Logan, the very, very important work he does chairing the uh, committee, all committee members and the committee secretariat. I'm pleased the committee has, of course, recommended that the proposed expenditure, as detailed in the Appropriation Bill 2021, be agreed to without an amendment. As the committee noted, our budget supports Queensland's economic recovery from COVID-19. It backs jobs, it boosts growth and it keeps vital funds flowing to our essential health and community services. In the months since the budget was delivered, Queensland has continued to lead the nation's economic recovery from COVID-19. Not the alternative LNP planet that those members opposite live in, but the real world inhabited by five million Queenslanders. Relative to March 2020, not only has Queensland added more jobs than any other state or territory, Queensland has added more jobs than every other state and territory combined. There are now 95,000 more Queenslanders in work now than there were before COVID-19. Queensland's unemployment rate, Deputy Speaker, is near its lowest level for 12 years. And accounting for employees who worked zero hours last month, and there's a fair few of those in New South Wales, almost 117,000, Queensland's adjusted unemployment rate is lower than that of New South Wales, Victoria and the Australian average. We know that the lockdowns imposed across the country will affect economic growth, whether directly as in New South Wales and Victoria or indirectly as in Queensland. But our government has responded to these lockdowns with vigour announcing a $600 million jointly funded business support package. And I talked about that earlier this morning, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to turn briefly to the non-government statement of reservations. The statement is also a brief affair. Deputy Speaker, just passed the half, part, half page mark this year, almost, almost got to 300 words. Not only was it lazy where it wasn't incoherent, it was flat out incorrect. LNP members wrongly accused the government of supporting just one in nine Queensland businesses. To spell it out in words that even the LNP will understand, our government's initial package had capacity and was designed to support up to 52,000 employing businesses, which represents one in three employing businesses in Queensland. And because our government stood up to the Morrison LNP government, something their colleagues in Queensland consistently refuse to do, the funding for this program has more than doubled and it has been extended to not employing businesses. Opposition committee members wrongly claimed that tourism funding was cut in our budget, even though the CEO of Tourism and Events Queensland patiently explained to the member for Broadwater that TEQ still received $16 million more than its base budget this year. It didn't stop the LNP from misrepresenting this increase, of course, as a cut. Even before the budget, Treasury had also offered $174 million in funding to tourism-related businesses through our industry support package. Opposition members also lazily declared that no detail was provided of our government's savings achievements. That is despite the fact there was a full account of savings in budget paper number two. For the benefit of the lazy members of the LNP, I even quoted specific examples of the savings that each agency is making. I re-emphasise for members of the LNP that the way each agency is making savings is ultimately up to each agency. But unbelievably, Deputy Speaker, these are the same people, the same cigar chompers who align themselves with Joe Hockey and Matthias Cormann, people who said during the course of the debate on the debt reduction and savings bill that saving $3 million in public money in that bill meant nothing to them. That is typical of the arrogance of the LNP. What our government is not doing, much to the disappointment and distress of those opposite, is that we are not making these savings by cutting, sacking or selling. Our government is also not balancing the budget by introducing increased taxes or increasing the rate of taxes. I'll take the interjection. Member for Coomery, your interjections will cease or you'll be warned. Treasurer has to call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'll take the interjection. This is the same member, the member for Coomera, who, of course, promised no new increased taxes when they came to government in 2012 and promptly jacked it up by $3 billion, including taxes on the family home, including stamp duty on the member, family home. Speaker, pause the clock. This is pause the uh, clock. typical member, of the LNP. Pause the clock. Member for Coomera, I just um, said I would warn you. You're warned under standing orders. Treasurer, have a call.
The laziest, well-funded opposition in history. No vision, no idea, nothing for the future of Queensland. We will continue delivering our economic recovery plan for our state, creating jobs and opportunity for Queenslanders, even in the midst Treasurer's of the I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The uh, Treasurer who just spoke on arrogance. Can I say pot, kettle, black on that one? Indeed. This is the guy... This is the guy that just refuses to take questions, doesn't, you know, he's been, yeah, here he is, Mr. Glassjaw already, he's already started. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Pause the clock, pause the Treasurer. You must interject from your seat, Treasurer. You're sta I'm standing on your feet. I'd ask you to apologise to the House. I apologise. Thank speaker. you, Treasurer. Member for Kwani, have the call. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. The the member for uh, Toowoomba, the member for Toowoomba South said he, he the treasurer, uh, you know, went up to Toowoomba and did a business <laughs> break. He also did one in Caloundra, and uh, my understanding is they were <laughs> hard selling tickets to that event. I tell you, <laughs> they 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 put out, they discounted, they put out the freebies. <laughs> I heard, I heard even sponsor, table sponsors couldn't get enough people to fill their tables to the Caloundra budget, uh, budget from the Treasurer. That's how, that's how excited the people at Caloundra were to hear the Treasurer. They couldn't even fill the tables and their expectations of what they were going to raise at that event uh, were, did not live up to expectations. I think that had something to do with the talent on display that day, either the Treasurer, the member for Caloundra, or it could have been the member for Nicklin. That, would have paid for that show, I tell you. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, pro the, the budget estimates process under Labor is gone. It's dead. You might as well bury it. Uh, the, uh, the chair of this committee apologised for his chairing. He should, Mr Speaker, because it was a protection racket. There, there were members of Parliament on the Labor side that simply just took tedious points of order just designed to interrupt, to stop the flow of questioning. A proper budget estimates... And the Labor members should learn from Canberra in this. A proper budget estimate should be free-flowing. Questions to and fro to the bureaucrats, to the senior public servants, to the minister. It should be to and froing. No, no chair repeating the question. No chair saying, what I think you meant to ask was this. No, no. The person, the MP asking the question, didn't mean to ask that, but it was all designed to filibuster the time, fill in the time. So the member for Logan says that the opposition received all this additional time. Well, that was because they kept interrupting our time and it just kept filling up based on those interruptions. And then to see ministers act surprised when they got their Dorothy Dixes drafted by their office. I, I watched some ministers like, oh, that's a, well, what a marvellous question. Like as if they didn't know what, what was in front of them, what was about to be asked of, considering the their members. office drafted the questions because their Labor members can't think for themselves and can't draft their own questions. So we had that. We had the Treasurer not be able to say how much their Unite and Recovery was actually costing the Queensland tax base. Their whole marketing campaign, of which he said they were going to stop all the glossy advertising, all the glossy brochures, he couldn't, Treasury couldn't say how much it was costing because he said, oh, that's a different department. So Treasury didn't even know how much the glossy brochures were. They were going to save $3 billion. Where did that go? They were going to save $3 billion. The Commonwealth Games have a Twitter account. They're still tweeting about a games that was years ago. It's still obviously people are tweeting that sort of stuff from the Commonwealth Games. They said they were going to cancel all this glossy advertising, and yet we see billboards with the Cross River Rail. We see the social media. They haven't achieved any of their savings, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that is the fundamental mistake that Labor governments make. They waste money in the midst of a health crisis, in the midst of, and I'm not talking about the pandemic, I'm talking about Labor's health crisis with our hospitals at the moment. Ambulance ramping. I talk about the youth crime crisis right across the state. No plans for that. The Premier in this particular estimates refused to advise Queenslanders how much quarantine was going to cost. I bet, I wonder, here's the question to Labor members, I wonder if the, uh, the Premier would introduce such a policy to stop uh, quarantine for two weeks had she been on the plane back from Tokyo. I wonder if we'd see that sort of policy. It'd be OK for the Queensland Premier to come home and quarantine in a hotel, but Queenslanders, Queenslanders, Mr Deputy Speaker, are stuck interstate uh, without uh, being uh, uh, able to come back to their own homes of which they may rent or pay for their mortgage. 
It is shameful that we've got to this process in Queensland where citizens of Queensland cannot even enter their own state. And that is to the Labor Party and the Premier should take the blame for that. Mr Deputy Speaker, but what would you expect? The Leader of the House, the Health Minister, has written to Twitter asking me to be banned on social media because I dare attack the government and I dare raise these issues on Twitter and social media platforms. So the Leader of the House, the Health Minister, has written off to Twitter trying to have me banned. She's just jealous that I have more content and more, more interaction on my Twitter feed than her Twitter feed, Mr Deputy Speaker, because if you look at hers, it's pretty boring, I've got to say. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, we will always raise these issues. People of Queensland expired. demand better for our estimate system. For tourism. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It is, uh, I say this apprehensively, with pleasure that I rise to contribute to the debate of the Economics and Governance Committee uh, Estimates Report. And I'll take this opportunity to thank the Chair, the Committee, the members and the parliamentary staff for their work during the estimates hearing process and thank indeed the officers of the Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport for their work in preparation for the hearings. Uh, the hearing of the Economics and Governance Committee was held five days before the Premier attended the International Olympic Committee session in Tokyo, where Brisbane, Queensland was awarded the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And this historic event sees Brisbane and Queensland firmly planted on the global stage, as the House has heard earlier today. We are in this position to host the 2032 Games because of our world-leading approach uh, to handling the pandemic. That was certainly one of the things that uh, was acknowledged by uh, the future host commission. Uh, and their reports to the uh, IOC. And this shows that our health response to the pandemic and our economic re uh, recovery plan are working. And the 2021-22 budget shows that because the Palaszczuk government protected the health of Queenslanders and we can recover and grow with confidence. A central part of that economic recovery is the now more than $1 billion that the Palaszczuk government has committed to delivering uh, committed in, delivered and planned support for the tourism and events sector since the onset of the pandemic. And this is quite contrary to the opposition's claims and their comments in the non-government statement of reservations in Budget Estimates Report number 12. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I want to uh, use this opportunity to correct some of the, the inaccuracies in the non-government statement of reservations. And I've got to admit, I don't have time in this uh, contribution to correct all of the inaccuracies made by those opposite in a short amount of uh, contribution, as the, the Treasurer must said, but I will try to re rectify some of their statements. Uh, those opposite claim, uh, and I quote, in this estimates process, Queenslanders expected the Labor government to be honest and accountable, and it is our view that instead Labor committee chairs used the standing orders to protect Labor ministers, end quote. Mr Deputy Speaker, the facts are that in the 2021 estimates hearing, 61 per cent of the time allocated and 71 per cent of the questions asked were non-government questions. Uh, those opposite uh, also claim that the tour claimed in their statement of reservations that the Tourism and Events Queensland budget was cut by $37 million. The facts are the budget for Tourism and Events Queensland in the 2021 uh, period was a record high of $153 million. The Palaszczuk government has consistently delivered above the base funding of $100 million for TEQ every year since 2015. Also, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, those opposite claimed, and I quote, Outback Queensland has again been forgotten by the Labor government, with only $1,000 of a $1 million budget being spent from the Outback Tourism Infrastructure Fund in the 2021 uh, in the 2020-21 financial year. End quote. Absolute poppycock. The facts are that the $10 million Outback Tourism Infrastructure Fund established in 2018 to grow tourism and create jobs in Outback Queensland uh, has delivered. The fund is fully committed with 16 infrastructure projects funded and 13 completed to date. The non-government statement of reservations, Mr Deputy Speaker, contains no mention of the innovation portfolio. So I assume those opposite don't care about innovation or have no reservations. Oh, oh well, you didn't have a chance to uh, contribute to the statement of reservations, unfortunately, uh, Member for Bonnie. Uh, in the uh, in the sport in the sport portfolio, those opposite claim, and I quote, the department's capital expenditure has been cut by some 73 million dollars when compared to the last financial year. End quote. The facts are 
the variances in the capital budget are actually due to activities that were transferred to the Department of State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning during the machinery government, cha machinery government changes. They were in fact offset by the following net increases in sport infrastructure investment, such as our $15 million in commitment to the Sunshine Coast Stadium, $10.3 million increase for active community environment and $10 million increase for Bally the Ballymore Precinct redevelopment. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, those opposite could have been aware of this if they had asked a question about the variance. They didn't ask a question about the fundamentals that were in the budget. They criticised it in the statement of reservations without seeking any form of clarification during the estimates hearing process because they were off on other wild goose chases. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll I would continue correcting this long list of inaccuracies uh, that those opposite have had included in their statement of reservation, but sadly it appears that I'm out of time. I uh, welcome the committee's report and commit, commit its recommendations. Mr. Times expired. I call the member Bonnie. Thank you, Acting Speaker. As Shadow Innovation Minister, I'll make a contribution to the appropriation debate in relation to the Economics and Governance Committee's estimates hearings. Advanced Queensland is the main program through which innovation is supported in our state. It's worth around $755 million, and we've been told that it has backed over 7,500 projects and supported 27,000 jobs. But there is a complete uh, lack of detail about how that is calculated, which is concerning, particularly for something so reliant on science, data and performance metrics. In 2019, the former minister announced a review into Advanced Queensland. 18 months later, at our last estimates, we found out that still hadn't been completed. And at this estimates, we found out that the review had finally taken place and led to the creation of the Innovation Council. There were no specific outcomes from the review apart from setting up this new body. No data was considered, no public consultation undertaken, no findings to report and no KPIs to guide future investment. That is extraordinary when we're talking about over $755 million worth of Queensland's money. There is nothing more we know about it other than a table with just four rows in the SDS of the budget. If the government thinks innovation is going so well in this state, why not release more information about how these outcomes are calculated? What concerns me is that there wasn't a real review undertaken, uh, but rather what seems to be a general conversation around a table with nothing formally recorded of that process. Reviews give an opportunity to learn what needs to be improved and to ensure best outcomes are being achieved. When we're talking about such a significant amount of money and important outcomes we need for Queensland, we have to get it right. This is particularly important given this, the decision by the Queensland Audit Office to cancel their review of Advanced Queensland's activities, as was well articulated in a recent In Queensland article, maybe the, the $800 million Advanced Queensland plan was money well spent, but we'll never know. And uh, I'll table that for the benefit of the House. It rightly highlights the lack of transparency around how those numbers around tens of thousands of jobs attracted to Queensland and investment are calculated, and the lack of any formal cost-benefit analysis. We need a thorough review to assess the performance of Advanced Queensland, and without it, I am concerned we aren't getting the best results. In my part of the Gold Coast, I've seen the difficulty this government is having of getting this off the ground with the Health and Knowledge Precinct. Within it, there is Cohort, the co-working and innovation space within some of the communal spaces of the old Commonwealth Games Village, and it is practically the only bright light we've seen there since the Games. We've only just had the sod turning of Proxima, and it will be the first development since the Games over three years ago. The Health and Knowledge Precinct and the unnecessarily and confusingly rebranded Lumina within it are sold as an innovation community, in fact, the hub of innovation in our city. There are incredible opportunities because it has the largest campus of Griffith University, the Gold Coast University Hospital, Gold Coast Private Hospital, and our first build to rent community, Smith Collective. The light rail runs right through it. It's got access to Smith Street and the M1, and especially at the moment, there is an abundance of empty space to develop. But for the most part, the only thing Gold Coasters see as they drive past Smith Street is the growing number of car parks being put on that empty space. Under questioning at the hearings about the precinct, it became apparent that Advanced Queensland has no real engagement in spaces like this. I find that staggering when this is clearly a precinct that needs support, and it's something the Gold Coast deserves. If you look at Lot 14 in Adelaide, they have Google, Amazon, the Australian Space Discovery Centre, MIT, even Airspeeder, a company whose mission is to build the ultimate performance flying car. This is what can happen when a government knows how to attract and curate innovation. 
Yet our innovation department is barely engaged in one of, if not the most significant regional innovation hub in our state. Clearly, the Department of State Development isn't capable of getting this off the ground, so I urge the Innovation Department to get on board and turn their focus to the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct. I'll be hopeful that we can see some movement on this before the next state budget, and as the local MP and Shadow Minister, I'll keep advocating to make this precinct a reality. One of the many things we have learned from this pandemic is that we need a diversification of our industries to ensure our economy is strong. Queensland more broadly has the second largest tourism industry in Australia and it will always be one of the foundations of our economy with the natural beauty we have in our state. But given the migration we're seeing, we need more diverse opportunities across all our regions for all Queenslanders and innovation can deliver that. That is especially important on the Gold Coast. Griffith is an exceptional university and its graduates should be able to get jobs in our city. We need to innovate, we need to promote new startups and do more to attract interstate and international businesses to call Queensland home. That is how we will advance Queensland. Members, time's expired. I call the member Speaker. from McAllister. Speaker, I rise uh, to make my contribution following the 2021-2022 budget estimates process as part of the Economics and Governance Committee. Um, on the 16th of July, the committee sat and took evidence uh, from the Premier and Minister for Trade, the Treasurer, and Minister for Investment and Minister for Tourism, Industry, uh, Development, Innovation and Minister for Sport. From the outset, I'd like to thank the relevant ministers for attending their staff and the legion of public service officials who work tirelessly, tirelessly to support the estimates process. I know firsthand how all-consuming preparations for these public hearings can be. <laughs> During estimates, the committee heard from the Premier who addressed the overarching principle of getting the health priorities right in order to deliver the economic outcomes. If that could not be made any more evident, um, it is what is happening right now. Queensland is the only eastern seaboard state not in lockdown. In Queensland, our businesses are open, construction continues apace and services continue to be delivered. This is because Queenslanders are largely on board with the directives and compliance needed to suppress the virus and keep our economy flowing. This health success has allowed Queensland to continue to chart a path out of COVID. The Premier outlined a $52 billion infrastructure program supporting 46,500 jobs across Queensland in this financial year alone. Our population growth is outpacing all other states and territories. People want to move here. People want to invest here because they are less likely to have their workforce shut down due to our effective health response during this pandemic. This has provided an opportunity for Trade and Investment Queensland, which tracks uh, Queensland exports that were valued at over $57.5 billion last financial year during the height of the global pandemic. That amount is more than New South Wales and Tasmania combined during the same period. The Treasurer in addressing the committee highlighted the positive jobs outlook for Queensland. He reported that the June employment data had Queensland jobs up by 16,700, the highest increase in the nation. And this translated to a decrease uh, in the unemployment rate down to 5.1 per cent in Queensland. The committee had the opportunity to hear from the acting under-treasurer who was asked about the impacts of lockdown. And uh, in his evidence to the committee, uh, he stated, what we have experienced in South East uh, and Townsville were short-term lockdowns. When we look to national accounts data and ABS retail data, we have seen some very positive recovery from those events being short-term lockdowns. The economic impacts of short-term lockdowns has been very small. Retail spending bounced back strongly after the restrictions were, were lifted. Uh, and in terms of aggregate household consumption in Queensland, it has the strongest annual growth of all states. We have these short, sharp lockdowns because we know they work from a health perspective and we see that they work from an economic perspective. The committee heard from the Minister for Tourism, Innovation and Sport. The committee was advised of the benefits 
of the $860 million that the government had delivered and planned for support to the tourism and events sector since the onset of the pandemic. The March 2021 data shows that Queensland outperformed all other states and territories in growth of overnight visitor expenditure. And in sport, uh, $212.5 million had been spent in infrastructure across the state. Uh, the Minister advised of the new release of the active game day um, projects, um, uh, up to $9 million in total, and I know that many clubs in my electorate are preparing um, to submit their applications for these grants. Now, this uh, estimates hearing uh, did take place before the Tokyo Olympics started, uh, and what was in anticipation of a positive Olympic announcement. Obviously, all members in the House are aware of the outcome, uh, and I congratulate uh, the Premier and everyone who was on board with securing that Olympics announcement for Queensland, because we know what that will do is, over the next 11 years, provide a positive pathway for our investment, not only in infrastructure, but for the future sporting outcomes of our kids right now. So things like uh, the, the grants that are out, I urge all of our community clubs to get on board. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Mermaid Beach. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm going to talk about something really boring out of the appropriation bill called debt. And it seems nobody else wants to talk about it uh, in terms of no one cares much anymore in relation to where we're heading for our children's debt and our children's children's debt in the state of Queensland. Now, I spent three years uh, studying at university, studying economics and finance, followed by my working career at Price Waterhouse, and I have never, ever seen a business like the titles office in Queensland uh, make so much money. Obviously, it must make a lot of money because we had the debt reduction bill a little while ago, and we valued it around the three billion dollar mark for the debt reduction and you can take that as read that there were conversations between the ratings agencies and the Treasurer and basically saying what do I need to wipe off my debt level so I can avoid a ratings downgrade, which the last one was Andrew Fraser, again a brilliant world famous Treasurer, Labor Treasurer of years gone by that uh, was part of the Bly demise uh, uh, happy pathway to uh, uh, oblivion. So uh, obviously this particular government don't want to see a, a downgrade by our ratings agencies and therefore the debt reduction bill was dealt with in this parliament. We wiped, valued it at about three billion dollars off memory. <clears throat> and then we come to the, appro the, uh, appropriate, the, to the budget and uh, we find in a matter of weeks, several weeks, that this uh, titles office has now bounced up to $7 billion in valuation. Now, obviously, uh, the $3 billion that they required to wipe off the debt wasn't enough to avoid a downgrade, so we said, let's make it $7 billion or whatever, 15 20 whatever you want to write the titles office uh, at. But the bottom line is, for Queenslanders, this is a, just a masked joke in terms of what we are leaving behind for our children and our children's children by the uh, ho hopeless uh, accounting and hopeless financial planning by this Treasurer and this Government for the future of Queensland. Now, we see a lot of matters uh, coming forward and people talk about different issues, but the reality is we need to face up to the financial problems that are coming forward because of this horrible pandemic that is killing Queensland. And shutting borders and asking for handouts from the federal government is one way of addressing it for a very short-term fix. But I can assure you, and it will probably be before 2024, the, the chickens will come home to roost. And this government will have to deal with the uh, falsehoods that they've peddled through this budgetary process over the last number of years. And while I'm on a local subject, not one penny. They talk about tourism being in a problem, and we all know that it is as a result of this pandemic, both international and interstate. Not one penny or cent these days, I'm sorry, uh, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, for the extension of the Gold Coast Convention Centre, which has been crying out 
for an extension for real business when it reopens. Now's the time to do it. So when we all get vaccinated and the passports are out, we can actually put some money back in the coffers of the tourism industry. <clears throat> Pardon me. But not one cent, not one penny in this budget for that extension, and yet they sneezed at a hundred million dollar uh, investment by the private sector that they walked away from uh, over some ridiculous 20-year uh, 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 process. They want exclusivity on the Gold Coast for 20 years for their new casino and uh, for, the, uh, for the star, as it's called these days. And they walked away from $100 million, and now they're not putting a cent into the Gold Coast uh, ex Convention Centre extension. So you tell me Mr Deputy Speaker, what this government really cares about in tourism, what this government cares about for small business who are absolutely shutting down at the rate of knots and starving because the borders are closed. And I hear the argument that they keep running about the health and it's made it very popular over there, and I understand those matters. It will come, and even uh, the uh, Premier today, we will get some uh, COVID coming to Queensland at some stage. It's guaranteed with all these lunatics hiding in the boots of cars, etc., to bring something up to this state, and then we'll have to deal with it then. And Ms Times expired, I'll call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Speaker. Can I uh, first of all thank the, um, the Chair and members of the Economics and Governments Committee for providing the opportunity to answer questions and talk about the 2021 budget and further support under my government's economic recovery plan. Since the estimates hearing, our economic recovery plan has increased to $14.5 billion. And I also thank the Treasurer for working with the federal government to get that matching $300 million in additional grants and support for businesses that have been impacted. And uh, we do know that uh, businesses are feeling the, um, the impacts of COVID, and we also recognise that the tourism industry is being impacted as well, which is one of the reasons that we went down to the Gold Coast and met with, um, uh, with the um, uh, destination Gold Coast. While we are now ensuring that this support reaches businesses in need, we also need to see ongoing income support such as JobKeeper for our impacted tourism and small businesses in far north Queensland and on the Gold Coast. And we would. We would urge those opposite to also support us in this. Uh, we know that's the, the best way to keep uh, these companies afloat. As I reflected about estimates at the end of last year, we are lucky to be in Queensland where hearings were actually able to be undertaken in person. I'm advised that more time was allotted for non-government questions throughout the hearing of the Economics and Governance Committee and that over two-thirds of questions were from non-government members. And I, uh, I have to comment that the member for Kwana was talking about the estimates processes. Well, we all know what happened uh, under them when uh, they didn't want government scrutiny, so they pushed all of the estimates yeah, committees yeah, into two days. We couldn't get to them. We had seven members, for goodness sake. And uh, I think uh, uh, the member for Mermaid Beach may have been leader of the House at the time, may have had something instrumental in doing with actually putting those all those estimates on uh, two days. Well, guess what? It didn't work because the people of Queensland, the people of Queensland, the people of Queensland um, uh, uh, saw the um, saw the error of um, of the Newman government. Uh, but also, too, I'll say this: when we're in opposition, we ask better questions. We did our homework. We stayed up late at night. We we're in the office working hard with our staff. You know not out having lunches and dinners like those opposite. We actually sat down and did the work. And I said, member for, um, member for St uh, Stafford over there, he was uh, part of that team up all night writing those questions, making sure they, can, they fitted with the standing orders of the House as well, so they would not be ruled out. So there's a lot of things that those opposite could learn from those days when there was uh, only seven, then eight, then nine of us. Member for Clayfield's nodding. He knows that as well. I, I'm just remembering the damage you did to Queensland. That's what I'm remembering. Order, order, members. Order. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. Premier, 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 and they Premier, sacked the doctors. The clock, Premier, the clock is paused. Member for Clayfield, you're stopped for interjections. Um, Premier, can you direct your comments through the chair, sure. please? Thank you. Premier has a call. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. And um, 
I don't mind taking interjections from Member for Clayfield. We're uh, good sparring partners from way back. Um, Mr Speaker, and as I was saying too, they come in here and ask questions about health when they cut the, they cut the nurses, they decimated the health system, they had impacts on regional communities and those impacts are still being built. But this, off, this government, we rebuilt those services. We value our regions, Mr Speaker, and uh, we value the estimates that we, and we value the estimates process, Mr Speaker. Sorry, what was that? Oh my goodness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Pause, pause the clock, Pre lapsing. Premier. Let's not have the conversations across the chamber. <laughs> member for Pine Rivers, uh, <laughs> Member for Mermaid Beach, your, um, Seashore, cross chamber interjections. Premier, have the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's why you know we're building. We're going to be building new satellite hospitals to make sure that people can get services closer to home. We're expanding hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We're rolling out the vaccination program. Uh, we're making sure that people get tested, Mr Speaker. We're uh, making sure that we um, are building the roads uh, that are needed across the state. And of course, we can't forget the, uh, the LNP's $3.2 billion in cuts that they would have meant to the frontline services that they promised during the last election, Mr Speaker. It would have been worse than the Newman cuts. That's what we would have had in this state, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, look, I back um, uh, the budget that we have delivered. It's, um, it's uh, measured, it's responsible, it builds on our fundamental pr um, priority of uh, keeping Queenslanders safe, but also to keeping people in the dignity of having a job, Mr Speaker. And, and even when I was out recently at that retail outlet, that distribution centre brought back home to me how important those workers are keeping our freight and our movement happening. So, Mr Speaker, I commend the report to the House. Premier's time has expired. I call the member for Coomera. Oh, Mr Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to the Economics and Governance Committee um, estimates hearings. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Secretariat for the amazing work that they do. Uh, they were actually brought on much, much more quickly um, in this particular uh, term uh, due to uh, the travel uh, plans of the Premier over to, uh, to Tokyo for the Olympic Games. Congratulate her and all of those involved in successfully bringing the Olympic Games to Queensland. A um, couple of things that are very, very concerning for the people on the uh, northern Gold Coast. First of all, uh, the second M1, uh, which is um, uh, already behind uh, schedule. There's three stages, Mr. Speaker, not one stage. Minister uh, for so Transport. Three stages, not one Seizure stage. Seizure interjections. Three stages, not one stage uh, in the project. Uh, little happening so far. But <coughs> the more concerning thing is that there's more, almost half of the money is out past the forward estimates, out past the first four years. So clearly, we're going to look at something like eight or nine years to actually finish just stages one, two, and three, uh, which the government refers to as stage 1A, 1B, and 1C, uh, north, uh, north, central, and south, whatever you want to call it. Reality is three stages, and there is not one dollar, not one dollar, uh, being committed to anything north of Shipper Drive. There's $11 million in the budget papers for north of Shipper Drive. That's <coughs> nothing to do with construction. It's nothing to do with planning. It's everything to do with the purchase of land for the project. Minister for Transport, Social <coughs> Interjections. Uh, the other concern uh, that I raised indeed with the, uh, with the Treasurer uh, is the Northern Gold Coast Hospital and Health Precinct that was a, budget, uh, uh, sorry, a, um, a commitment prior to the last election. In fact, on the 19th of, uh, uh, of October, the day the, the booths opened, um, and uh, the, 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 the headline was $160 million for uh, um, a new look or first look at Northern Gold Coast Hospital. No, $160 million. No, that was the headline. There was $3 million committed. The rest, the other $157 million, was for already committed projects in further south uh, Gold Coast University Hospital, uh, Rabina Hospital, and uh, the Satellite Hospital, $40 million further south. So it was a, an untruth by the, uh, the Premier who arrived, put big placards <coughs> up, etc. But I asked the Premier in the first budget hearings of the new parliament in December 
where's the $3 million? She didn't answer me. She couldn't answer me because it wasn't there. I asked the Treasurer this time, where's the $3 million that was committed? Couldn't answer me, wouldn't answer me, went off on a little fairy tale of his own, but didn't come to the question of where is that $3 million? $3 million is nowhere near enough anyway. We need uh, $10 million just for the business plan, and we need to get on and build the hospital. But more importantly, we need to understand that the growth in the Northern Corridor is so vast, so great. I have 47,811 voters in the Northern Corridor, almost 30 per cent above the average of all of the electorates around the state. When you compare that with uh, Erdguru and Gavin, they are 10 per cent, almost 10 per cent under. I'm 40 per cent above them in the Northern Corridor. It's a massive growth. And we need to understand that we need to have a short-term, medium-term, long-term plan in relation to that hospital, and it's not being delivered by this government. Uh, the third concern that I've got, exit 38. It's been, there was a business case done in 2018 for exit 38. Not one dollar in the budget for exit 38. Not one cracker, not a penny, not a bean. Nothing there since 2018. Why was the business case done if there was no intention to do something with that particular exit? And I'll finish on uh, exit 41. It's in the budget, but why aren't we having a slip lane northbound off exit 41 to go back into the Norfolk Village residential community? We desperately need that to stop so that those, those folk that are coming off the M1 are not forced through all of the commercial and industrial traffic uh, that, is, that is always there at Exit 41 because of, because of the uh, Yatla Enterprise area. Uh, I commend uh, our Secretariat, our, uh, my colleagues on both sides of the House in the, in, in the process, and I look forward to uh, seeing some work done by the Minister. Acting Speaker, the Budget Estimates hearings into the Appropriation Bill 2021 this year highlighted the continuation of the great work done by the Palaszczuk Government in bringing Queensland through one of the most difficult periods in our collective memories. The Economics and Governments Committee report highlights the ongoing commitment of the Palaszczuk Labor Government in working to ensure that the State of Queensland continues with its COVID-19 economic recovery plan coming off its continuing health response. And that sees our State regularly recording no new community transmission, which is in direct con comparison to the disaster that continues to unfold in the LNP-governed State of New South Wales. Acting Speaker, it gives me no pleasure to say that. It's not gleefully said, but what it does emphasise is the strong leadership shown in our state. This came through in the estimates hearings and in the details and the estimates reports we are now considering. Estimates showed how, how the Premier's leadership is steering our state away from the e economic ruin being inflicted by New South Wales by a government that acted too late by, applying, by, by us applying a considered methodical approach in Queensland to hopefully to hopefully, with time, contain for good the insidious virus. Acting Speaker, what has been achieved by Queensland this time hasn't happened by chance. The Premier, with solid advice from the Chief Health Officer, backed up by her Treasurer and Ministers, has delivered a budget to lead us through this pandemic, which is turbocharging Queensland, and in particular regional Queensland, including the electorate of Harvey Bay. Through expenditure on things that matter, they are the jobs, infrastructure, health service programs that are needed this time. It is the right response at the right time, measured, thoughtful and on the mark. Acting Speaker, obviously with any budget process there is disappointment, but it, but it is no different this year. To see the opposition statement of reservation contained in these reports is again just what we normally expect from the other side of the House. Yes, they agree to pass the excellent 2021 budget without amendment, but as always they make no, no real contribution to the budget process in, in their statement other than statements laced with fiction, obviously written by the party spin doctors, full of myth truths and no factual basis, highlighting the policy void and laziness on the other side and their inability to grasp the current situation striking out across our country and the world, tin eared to the community and not listening to what the community is asking. My community was clear at the last election, Acting Speaker, and, and they are clear now. They want a strong government that has a strong economic recovery based on a continuing strong health response to the pandemic around us, and they have that in spades with this government. Acting Speaker, at the last time the other side were in power, the LNP did what, did what with their budget? They did what they did. What did they decide to do? Apparently, a bit of tough love, they called it, 
So they, they, they cut vital services, sold everything they could get their hands on and sacked thousands of frontline nurses, doctors and public servants. They marched decent men and women out the door. They threw their lives in a box and shut them in the door. No ifs, no buts or maybes. Ruined li they ruined lives for doing nothing more than the best for all of us. That's what you get under an LNP budget. That's the way that side of the House does budgets in this state. They cut, sell and sack. It will never be different under them. Speaker, when it comes to the other side's line of questioning... Order, estimates, members. We waited for the deep probe, the forensic scrutiny expected of the opposition, but what can I say? It was appalling, to say the least. They didn't care about the content of the budget. They only wanted to mud rake. Nothing to, they gave nothing to the debate. They abused the Estimates Committee's process. Then, for then stepped see up and said reaction. the process was broken. They were absolutely shameless. Then they had a further chance in, the report, in their report statement of reservation to give a constructive contribution. But what did they do? They just continued to roll out the same old tired emotive language, trying to strike fear into the hard, hard, into hard-working men and women across the length and breadth of Queensland. I mean, Member for Harvey I think Bay. it's appalling Mem and shameful. Member for Harvey Bay. Their inability Member to for Harvey Bay. The budget estimate Member process. for Harvey Bay. Much as I'm enjoying your speech, could I ask that you adjourn debate now, please? I'll adjourn the debate. The question is that debate be now adjourned. Those of those opinions say aye. Those against no. The House will now rise for lunch and resume at two o'clock.
Call the member for Broadwater. Mr Deputy Speaker, in times of crisis, people deserve and expect leadership. They need clarity and decency in the way that leadership is conducted. And there are consequences for a lack of leadership. And in the past week, we have seen that in Queensland. And it culminated in the last 24 hours with the shambolic decisions when it comes to sporting families and how that contrasts with Queenslanders. And people love their footy. They love the NRL. They want to see life get back to normal. But if there's room for sporting families, there's room for Queensland families. Yeah. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. And this lack of leadership started on Wednesday, when with two hours notice, honest Queenslanders had their life turned upside down. And I want to know, when was that decision taken? How long before the 10 a.m. circus that we see, where it all had to be stage managed, when was that decision taken? Because you know what? Minutes mattered. And it's mattered in that regard. And I want to tell you about Joan and her partner, Alan. They've got properties in the Glasshouse Mountains and over the New South Wales border, and they reached out to the member for Glasshouse. They were working on their New South Wales property and they were travelling back home. They stopped at Wellington and Orange. They've been caught up in the border closure. She phoned just over a week ago and said they needed to come home because they had to deal with carving on their property, something that farmers have to do. She's lived in Queensland all her life. She's just heard about the sporting families coming into Queensland she's living. She says that her son committed suicide in Queensland and she wanted to be home for the anniversary of his death. She's undergoing mental health counselling because of this situation. Honest Queenslanders who just want to get home. And then 24 hours later, we saw a decision that the day before all made sense. It was almost like honest Queenslanders were political pawns, that somehow there needed to be a setup to justify a, a fake fight with Canberra, to justify a decision about quarantining in a city where the Prime Minister wasn't afforded the courtesy, the local mayor wasn't afforded the courtesy, members who represent that city in this house weren't afforded the courtesy, but above all, people in Toowoomba weren't. And an announcement was made and the short drive back into town didn't occur. Instead, the Premier hopped on a plane and came back to Brisbane. Shame. Yep. Lack of leadership has consequences when it comes to confidence. And we're seeing it in the vaccine rollout. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not going to stand here and defend the Commonwealth Government. I haven't all the way through. And the vaccine rollout should have been done in a more timely fashion. And I've said it here and I've said it outside. But every state has had the same opportunity. Yeah. And this morning, this morning, I have a look in Tasmania, and I see that 41.5 per cent of people have been vaccinated. And in Queensland, it's 31.28. We're at the back of the pack. And we're slipping. And let's wonder why. We've had mixed messages all through this. We had a Premier who found every reason not to get one of those vaccines. So let's call it for what it's is. A little bit of truth here. Let's call it. There was the excuse that, firstly, that didn't want to uh, get it when every other leader did. Then we had the flu injection. That was very important. That vicious dog, it struck. It struck. So we needed a tetanus shot. And then... Well, the time was too tight, so therefore we needed a different vaccine. And that undermined confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every GP you'll talk to in this state tells you. Yep. And it undermined confidence from the border communities where I sat this week with the members for Southern Downs and the member for Currumbin, where those communities, be it farming or be it tourism, are on their knees and they need a vaccine rollout to get the show back on the road. And it has impacted in the Indigenous communities in this state. And when I see the figures for Indigenous communities, our most vulnerable, I shudder. They deserve leadership. And, you know, we're at Sherberg at 4.6% and Yarrabah at 83 but that's right. only two of the 16. Right. I don't know what the figures are for the other 14. I don't know, but I want to see them. 
and Queenslanders want to see them, and they deserve to see them. And every level of government needs to be held accountable. And if the state government is serious about protecting our first Australians, our most vulnerable, they will find a way. They will find a way to end the Canberra blame game, the constant bashing. This, this absolute nonsense has got to stop. Vulnerable Queenslanders exposed, despite being in the category 1A and 1B, exposed and left vulnerable. And the lack of leadership has consequences when it comes to the way that we manage the disease and contain it in places like hospitals. And we saw the Griffin report this week, where it was up to the health minister to come out and talk about the Griffin report. And it was lauded because the Griffin report showed that there was no public health directive that was breached. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that a 19-year-old admin worker who was chastised wasn't to blame. There was no process in place that did the following. No process to ensure that a young woman who was working 15 metres from a COVID testing clinic should have been vaccinated. That wasn't there. There was no process that said on two occasions when she came to work and she was feeling crook and had the sniffles, why don't you go and get tested? It, it, it's there. Just walk behind you and get tested. No process there. A lack of leadership. And somehow, despite the fact that the Premier was angry, furious, furious despite the fact that there was a quote that a public health directive had been breached, despite all of that, no one is to be held accountable. And it was up to the, the poor minister to trot out and somehow try to defend the indefensible. Lack of leadership has consequences for small and family business owners and their staff. And we've seen the uncertainty from every part of Queensland. And it started when, in the lead up to the budget, we constantly asked the Treasurer why there was not a financial support package for small and family business. And we asked what would happen if they had to go into lockdown. And he said, heaven help us if they did. Well, heaven did need to help them. And finally, finally, after weeks of prosecution from business groups and business owners, their staff, the opposition, finally the Treasurer came forward with a package. But I wouldn't say it's raced out of the gates. I wouldn't say the money's flowing to people in their hour of need. It's been clumsy. It's been poorly thought out. So today I ask the question, what is the plan if we go into lockdown again? How long will businesses have to wait this time? Will it be ready? It, or are we going to have another Canberra bashing exercise? Because this morning we saw it. We saw it. And right now, in cities from the Gold Coast to Cairns, in the Whitsundays, many of these operators, they don't know if they're going to make Christmas. Now, now I have a view that Queensland's tourism offering in a post-COVID era is going to be as good as anywhere. And my view is we need a 20-year plan for before, during and after the Games. We are a magnificent, proud tourism state. But we're not going to have a tourism industry unless they get some support in their hour of need. And, and I'm sorry, but if I was the member for Cairns, I wouldn't be interjecting about now because what we saw today was a sham, was a disgrace. The, the federal member for Cairns put the most heartfelt plea to the Treasurer. And in that letter, he said to the Treasurer, give, it, give me an offer and I'll go to Canberra and I'll make sure they match it. Now, you can't get any more, you can't get any more than I'm going to have a crack from a community than that. And do you know what he got? Some political tripe. He, he, got a, he got a lecture from the, the Treasurer in this House about why he should cross the floor and do all sorts all of things. To ransom. Your operators in Cairns are on their knees, Mr Deputy Speaker. They need some certainty. They need to know that the government's got their back. And Mr Deputy Speaker, lack of leadership has consequences when it comes to taking decisive decisions. And when a government believes that sentiment polling should be at the core of what it does, then eventually honest Queenslanders get caught up in political games. Honest Queenslanders who just want to work in that coffee shop and have a shift to know that they can pay their rent. Honest Queenslanders who just want to know that the small business they put everything into will be there when they go back to it tomorrow and honest Queenslanders who just want to go home to farewell a loved one who took their life. 
That's the consequences for a lack of leadership. Yeah. Call the uh, member for Redcliffe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition likes to talk tough, but talk about leadership or the lack of. Those on the other side have no idea what Order. leadership actually is. I would dread to think what would have happened over the last 19 months if the LNP had been in government. Because their idea of leadership was calling on the borders to be open 64 times. Their idea of leadership is to sit silent. They say, oh, they're happy to criticise the Commonwealth. Really, let's look at the history here. Because they have been silent on regional quarantine. In fact, no, they haven't been silent on regional quarantine. Every time regional quarantine facility has been mentioned, they play local politics and start putting fear in the community of we don't want it that in our backyard. You know, what about Order members? How do we make sure the people Order member for Tormba North? What about the millions of people who live in South East Queensland and in Brisbane who have lived around hotel quarantine since day one? Order member for Tormba North. Well, we don't care about those people either. The, the Leader of the Opposition talks about the 10 a.m. circus. If it's such a circus, why is it the Leader of the Opposition has been standing in the wings on the green waiting for his turn to be part of it every day. Every day he waits and he waits and then he runs out and does his little press conference while the media is still waiting or some of them wait, some just pack up and leave before he starts talking. Uh, but what a joke, what a joke because that leader of the opposition is more than happy to do his little stand up every day off the back of ours, like, oh, I can't draw the media in myself, so I'll use the government because the media is already there and I'll race in and, and do it. This serious decision that was made, which was not an easy decision last week, was because we have a responsibility to keep over mo five million Queenslanders safe. Five million Queenslanders safe. Now, those on the Lord other side Kwana. can talk about, and again, playing politics, saying, oh, well, NOL's taking away rooms from people who are wanting to visit loved ones for end of life and those sorts of things. That is not true. That is absolutely not true, uh, because those hotels are not part of the hotel quarantine system. They are not being managed uh, by the government. Order, that, members. That exemptions, and we've made this very clear, well, if the member li from Kuwana listens, he'll learn something. Um, the fact is, that people, Order, member for Kuwana. that people can still apply for exemptions, that the suspension relates to an automatic right of entry. But if you have exceptional needs and reasons, that you can still go down the pathway of an exemption to come in while we have this suspension. And this suspension allows us to free up some rooms. We're also having to take well over our cap of international rivals, in which the Commonwealth do not share with us how many others, diplomats and everyone else who fly in above the cap and come in every day and we have to find immediate hotel rooms for. Vaccine rollout. Those on the other side, what does the public health staff think every day when they listen to the Commonwealth and they listen to the LNP saying they're not doing their job properly, they're lagging behind? This idea everyone's getting the same number of vaccines shows how ignorant those on the other side are. To compare Tasmania to Queensland, oh my God, how how stupid is that comment? Tasmania Order, to members. Queensland, do you understand the size difference of the two, the population base, to say that it is the same to roll out in Tasmania a vaccination program as it is such a decentralised state, including the islands in the Torres Strait, shows that those on the other hot side have no leadership whatsoever. We are very proud of our rollout. We have administered the third largest number of vaccines in Queensland in the country. We are third as far as our vaccination numbers and we are the third largest state. Makes sense. Um, but it is absolutely false for those on the other side to say we're all getting equal numbers. In fact, 500,000 vaccines have gone to New South Wales from that Poland delivery where we got 136. Now, we don't begrudge New South Wales for getting extra, but you can't say that why aren't we vaccinating at the same rate as New South Wales when they've had to fast track because people are so terrified down there because they have 20,000 positive cases 
out of one cluster. Order, member for Broadwater. They've had 93 deaths from one cluster. We've had seven deaths from the start of this pandemic. Mr. Deputy Speaker. There's the evidence of leadership. Time's expired. I call the member for Toowoomba South. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And we've just had another example from the Health Minister of this government playing the politics hard. They play the politics very, very hard on this rela in relation to this issue, and they played it no harder than at Well Camp last Thursday, where over a number of days, as the Leader of the Opposition has outlined, they started to kind of build the case. There were large numbers coming up into hotels. They needed to pause a number of interstate arrivals into our ho hotels. And then it was a miracle, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was a miracle. They turn up at Wellcamp and here they are with dump trucks and graders getting ready to build a quarantine facility. They were playing the politics as hard as what they ever have before, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it is time that we have leadership we have leadership in relation to this issue in Queensland. Leadership for the health crisis and leadership for the economic crisis, Mr Deputy Speaker. The contempt with which the government um, displayed towards the Toowoomba people last week cannot go unremarked upon. We had the Deputy Premier stand up and say at World Camp last week, you know, we've got to stop playing politics. I reckon there was a there was mass outbreak of laughter across the Toowoomba region when we heard that, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the Deputy Premier has played politics harder than anybody else on these issues. They arrived in Toowoomba. The Mayor didn't know. The State MPs didn't know. But we don't expect to be told anything, Mr Deputy Speaker. But worse, worse than anything, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if we asked the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service if they knew, no, they did not. If we asked the local police service, did you know that the quarantine facility was going to be announced that day? No, they did not. If you asked the local ambulance service, did you know whether the quarantine facility would be introduced? No, they did not, Mr Deputy Speaker. The arrogance of this government that they simply can come in to our community and announce the facility without any engagement whatsoever, without any acknowledgement of what it might mean. I've spoken with the local police, of, police officer. We might need another 50 or six police to deal with the quarantine facility. What's the modelling? How many ambulances will we need to transport COVID patients or those suffering serious illness down here to Brisbane? What do we need in terms of the health service? What protections will be on offer for the local Toowoomba community? Not a single answer. Not a single answer, and the arrogance of the Palaszczuk Labor government was on display. And if there was anything that really, really irked me, Mr Deputy Speaker, about this announcement, was the launch of PNN, the Palaszczuk News Network, as it's been referred to in the Australian, Mr Deputy Speaker. They go live without any uh, conversations with Toowoomba people, but they take it live on the PNN, on the Palaszczuk News Network, to announce to the world what is happening in the Toowoomba region, Mr Deputy Speaker. Little breaking graphics, like, you know, top of, the, top of the line graphics to announce to the world that the quarantine facility is coming to Toowoomba. And if there is anything that displays the arrogance of the Palaszczuk Labor government, it is their use of the media. It is their use of social media and their control over so many staffers. In the last couple of weeks since we last sat, We've learned about how many spin doctors the Palaszczuk Labor government have. We know they've got 18 in the, in the Premier's office, in the Premier's office, but what was revealed during estimates, they've at least got another nearly dozen that are, that are seconded out of ministerial offices into the Premier's office, not to deal in important information. They're not disseminating important information about COVID, um, important public information. They're putting up questions about, do you prefer hot cross buns or Easter eggs? You know, TikTok videos. Um, what's the favourite? What's your favourite children's storybook, Mr. Deputy Speaker? The people of Toowoomba have been treated with contempt, but the people of Queensland are treated with contempt by the way the Palaszczuk Labor government used the media for their craven political advantage. And it happens day after day after day. Not just in the numbers that we see furnished in the Premier's uh, media department, but throughout the ministerial offices, 30 overall staff disseminating information and manipulating uh, the media to their craven political advantage. And there's probably nothing more, and the Leader of the Opposition mentioned it, but the, the sentiment polling, 
the sediment polling, 500 grand, paid for by the taxpayer. But interestingly, we know now that it was targeted at Livingston Shire Council, which happens to sit in the middle of Keppel, a marginal seat. Mr Deputy Speaker, the people Mr. are Deputy sick Speaker. of the manipulation Time's of the media. I call the member for Gladstone. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I don't really get uh, too fired up in here about politics. Uh, I would much rather prefer to work with everyone to deliver possible outcome and positive outcomes for all of Queenslanders. After all, that's why Queensland voters fall into this place. I've proudly done that for the people of the Gladstone region since 2015 and as a proud minister in this government for over a year now. But I won't stand by and be baselessly accused of rorts in the name of scoring cheap political points. So today I'm calling out the member for Nanango for her blatant misleading of the House in estimates when she accused me of approving the funding for projects delivered by the Gladstone Area Water Board for some imagined personal or political benefit. Mr Deputy Speaker, firstly, I do not approve the funding of projects that are delivered by Gladstone Area Water Board. All government-owned water utilities, budgets and project expenditures are determined by independent boards. Secondly, Mr Deputy Speaker, Gladstone Area Water Board's expenditure is also externally reviewed by the Queensland Competition Authority. If the member for Nanango has spent even a few minutes doing research instead of slinging mud, she would actually know that. But why let the truth get in the way of a bad story? And sadly, Mr Deputy Speaker, we know that the, detail, the details aren't her strongest point. Deputy Speaker, I'm not just personally angry. I'm also angry on behalf of all of the hardworking people that work at the Gladstone Area Water Board who are planning, who are delivering infrastructure and water security projects that benefit the local communities in Gladstone and certainly in Calide. The big question is why the member for Nanango believes that the people of central Queensland don't deserve investment in key water infrastructure in central Queensland. There are thousands of current job, job, industri industrial jobs, sorry, thousands of future jobs and tens of thousands of families that rely on projects like the new off-site storage facility in Gladstone, just to name one. And frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've never heard anyone complain so much about regional communities getting, a vital, getting vital infrastructure and the water that they need. But what makes me even angrier is that the member for Calide sits here and agrees with her. We already know that he doesn't support building flood shelters for his local constituents because he even wrote to me to tell me that. However, it's his silence on issues that speaks louder than words that he, than he ever could. By remaining silent and falling in line with the member for Nanango, he is telling the very people that he's elected to represent that they do not deserve any investment in the region. The voiceless member for Calide had every opportunity to ask me or any other ministers questions about his electorate during the two weeks of estimates hearings, but we did not hear one word from him, not one. No questions about water infrastructure, no questions about the local manufacturers, no questions about local roads or schools or local medical services. Mr Deputy Speaker, all because he thinks staying quiet is the best way to get a free ride out of Calide and down into Canberra. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can tell the member for Calide right now the people of central Queensland won't stand up for someone who doesn't stand up for them. But, Deputy Speaker, this is what we've come to expect from the members of what remains of the Queensland National Party. I can assure the people in the communities around Awonga Dam, around Calliope and around Biloela being sold out by the lazy LNP representatives that my office in Gladstone is open and I will support them at any time they need my support. If the acquisitions weren't so serious, I could almost laugh about it and how much of an own goal this is for the LNP. All of their complaining just highlights the fact that by keeping our water utilities in public hands, the Palaszczuk Labor government is delivering for central Queensland. It's because the Gladstone Area Water Board remains government owned that it invests money back into the local community to benefit locals uh, rather than sending it off to shareholders of a private owner. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, 80 per cent of allocations from, uh, from industrial users in Gladstone giving back to the Gladstone region. So while the LNP will complain and make stories up, I will be keeping working hard for the people of Gladstone, the people of central Queensland and all regional Queenslanders. That is what they expect their elected officials to do, not sit on their hands in their elected office. Mr Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, you know what they say. Location, location, location. And I'm telling the House today, Caloundra is no location for a youth jail. The Caloundra residents, the Sunshine Coast community, will not stand for it. And I have been vocal on this subject with the member for Nindri, Mr Dan Purdy, because the member for Caloundra has been silent on it. In fact, the member for Caloundra recently sent out a budget brochure to his community, telling his community all the things that were in the state budget. Was the prisoner? He forgot to mention the youth prison in the newsletter. No glossy picture of the youth jail going into Caloundra. Caloundra was promised at the election by the Palaszczuk Labor government a new police station, more police, more resources. And all they're getting is a youth jail. And on the same day of budget estimates, they put out this sneaky little press release announcing a few extra cops and a police station that has no money attached to it in the budget. But it was all designed to try and fool the people of the Sunshine Coast that this is going to be great. The member for Caloundra has been positively speaking about this youth jail. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, he's on the wrong side of this one. 5,000 people have signed the petition against the youth detention centre in Caloundra. Over 5,000. Then the Labor Party said we're waiting for genuine feedback. Well, if 5,000 Sunshine Coast residents who signed a petition against a youth jail is not genuine, then I don't know what is. The Sunshine Coast community are not going to be fooled. Crime, we have a crime, youth crime crisis around Queensland. And unfortunately, it's headed to the coast. People say to me, when did this start? And I'll tell them, 2015, Mr Speaker. This is when it started. This was the Youth Justice Amendment Bill. This was the first bill introduced by the Palaszczuk government. It got rid of boot camps, which sent young repeat offenders out bush to, treat them, to, to, to teach them decency, respect for their communities. It got them out of the communities. They got rid of it. The objectives of the bill, get rid of the boot camps. The objectives of the bill, remove breach of bail as an offence for children. Objective, make childhood findings of guilt which no conviction was recorded inadmissible in court when sentencing a person for an adult offence. Hiding all their car thefts, hiding the break and enters that they do until they get to the age of 18. The Palaszczuk government also reinstated the principle that the detention order should be imposed only as a last resort and for the shortest period of time. And finally, the Palaszczuk Youth Justice Bill in 2015 reinstated into the Penalties and Sentences Act the principle that imprisonment is a sentence of a last resort and ready for this one, wait for it, and a sentence that allows the offender to stay in the community is preferable. Well, I don't think... Tim McCosker, who recently had three cars stolen from her garage and her house, would be saying that it's preferable for these three offenders to be out in the community. Every victim on the Sunshine Coast that has had cars stolen, their homes broken into, people assaulted, people bashed up, they're not saying that these children should be out in our communities. They're saying they should be in jail, particularly the repeat offenders. And the Labor Party's answer to this? Let's put a jail in the heart of Caloundra. I've lived in Caloundra most of my life on the Sunshine Coast. My electorate is on the border of where this youth justice detention goes. It will impact everybody living on the Sunshine Coast, not just the residents of Caloundra. Crime will increase. People, young people who will be on remand, their undesirable friends will visit. Their undesirable families will visit Caloundra and they'll stay there and they will commit more crimes. If people think we have a youth justice issue on the Sunshine Coast at the moment, wait till this youth detention centre gets built. The Director General of Youth Justice confirmed in estimates it is a youth detention centre. It's going to have Order, members. beds. Order. And Order. the Labor Party, Mr Deputy Speaker, are spreading this lie, this uh, misinformation now that the LNP were going to do this in 2013. We just 
There was no youth detention centre. It never happened. What the department recommends to minister, it takes a strong minister to say no to a department, a strong local member to say no to a department. Unfortunately, we haven't got that in Queensland now, so the department recommended a youth detention centre in Caloundra, and this Labor government, soft on crime, just say, OK, let's do it. We'll not have, we'll not have it in Caloundra on the Sunshine Coast. Over 5,000 people must Mr. be listened Mr. to Speaker. by the Minister for Youth Times, Justice. Times I call the member for Cairns. Mr Deputy Speaker, oh. I rise uh, today to inform the House of the recently opened Talaroo Hot Springs, which is run by the Yurimun people of the Gulf Savannah country in far north Queensland. The Yurimun people are uh, proud traditional owners who have maintained obviously strong physical and spiritual connection to their land for literally thousands of generations. However, their story like so many other traditional owners, is one of struggle and tenacity, having been dispossessed from their lands in the late 19th century and forced to live under a Protection Act that fundamentally gave them limited rights and virtually no opportunities. Despite this adversity, the Yurimun people knew that the 60,000-year bond with their land could not be broken, and I am pleased to say that Talaroo Hot Springs is the beneficiary of their continued relationship with and respect for that country. I am also proud to say that the Talaroo Hot Springs is the beneficiary of rightful support from the Queensland Government, as this unique natural wonder is one of a suite of outback tourism attractions in the far northern drive tourism market. The Queensland Palisade Government have responsibly invested in this enterprise, as we understand and recognise the importance of tourism infrastructure to not just the economy but to the empowerment and advancement of our First Nations peoples. Talaroo Hot Springs is one of a kind. It is the only mound springs in Australia that is not fed through the Artesian Basin. It derives its water source from via ground, sorry, via underwater hot granite pathways from the nearby Newcastle Range. Formed over millions of years, this geological marvel is of scientific importance where aquatic life and high temperatures can be observed and studied in the interests of furthering climate and environmental knowledge. And undoubtedly, Talaroo Hot Springs is an opportunity to bring visitors and tourists on country for a spectacular cultural tourism experience under the guidance and wisdom of the traditional owners. And Mr Deputy Speaker, this as a government is something that we have been working with the Indigenous population. We want to see these products take place and I had the privilege of visiting Talaroo Springs recently, and I can advise the infrastructure and facilities that have been built on site are absolutely outstanding, and it is a fantastic experience. Aesthetically blended boardwalks, bathing pools and camping facilities are now available, along with authentic cultural tours explaining both the geological and the traditional owner aspects. I was impressed by the natural and genuine experience on offer, and it is not only surprising that we are seeing fantastic responses from a variety of sightseers and guests who are enjoying the bush hospitality and beautiful landscape. And I can confirm that we welcome to uh, that welcome, which is extended to all the guests, is absolutely unprecedented. And I have experienced a range of products in my time. The Uriman people have done themselves extremely well in their articulate manner of presentation. As such, I would like to personally thank uh, Uriman elder Jimmy Richards for his vision and leadership at Talaroo. Jim's connection with the lands goes back to many levels. He was working there as a young man, as a, uh, as a jackaroo, years back, uh, worked maintaining fences and a range of other jobs. While Jim's spiritual link with Talaroo is strong, he also acknowledges that when you work hard and you care for country, an economic future can be found. With Cobalt Gorge and Undara lava tubes nearby and readily accessible by the Gulf Developmental Road, these complementary experiences will further promote the Savannah Way as a sought-after leisure and adventure destination. Indeed, the Palaszczuk government has seen fit to also support these two other products, ensuring that we have fantastic world-class products in our regional areas and particularly in the bush. And these have all been the beneficiaries of the Growing Tourism Infrastructure Fund and the Outback Tourism Infrastructure Fund. These iconic tourism assets have been recipients of state government backing. These growing tourism funds equates to tens of millions of dollars in financial assistance, and I'm pleased to say that this return on investment is already reaping rewards with bookings and accommodation and occupancy skyrocketing whilst we are in the middle of this COVID. And of course the challenges 
The tourism presented by COVID remained, but importantly, the state government continues to invest and support the industry in a range of ways, and it is a world-class uh, product like Talaroo Hot Springs, run by Uriman peoples that will continue to grow the amazing and unique products that we have all across our wonderful state. I'd like to congratulate and I want to thank all for their hard work and input and ongoing commitment to this amazing and unique tourism product. We know tourism provides an excellent opportunity for many of our First Nations peoples. I call the member for Noosa. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The housing affordability and rental crisis in my electorate and other regions across Queensland can be fixed. Concerningly, though, even though we say it is a priority, we are following a similar path that led us to this point. Under state government rules, all local government areas should have four years' worth of approved lots, land that is ready to go to market. The Deputy Premier in the 2021 estimates process said that the department was working to identify future land outside the urban footprint and include it into future SEQ regional plans. Will this resolve the crisis in my community or other communities? The answer is the, in the key words, land and market. Within Noosa, the market pushes anything released beyond the financial capability of our workers and governments, as well the rents associated when developed. Is more land the answer? Well, for decades, land has been released across the Sunshine Coast, and yet here we are. The Queensland Housing Strategy Action Plan 2017-2020 notes as its very first action that it needs to identify and develop vacant and underutilised government land. The state government, by its own admission, doesn't have a cross-departmental register of all available lands, which I raised with both the Premier and the Minister for State Development, Infrastructure and Planning in 2019. Government sites we have identified over the last four years have led nowhere, even those zoned for housing, due to those tick boxes that could not be ticked off, including land price, carbon offsets, biodiversity overlays, flood hazards and even a native title claim. One site that was suitable for a mixed model uh, of community housing for our people with disabilities, workers and retirees is being considered for an Indigenous cultural centre or glamping. This is really admirable. However, when you have a humanitarian crisis, where are our priorities? The outdated rationale of location has become a constant barrier, as apparently affordable housing needs to tick the box of being central, because apparently my workers don't have cars. These tick boxes and a number of others for the last 20 years have contributed to this crisis. It pushed our essential workers into sheds, 20 minutes from town. It led us to this space where a site on a major state road, three minutes drive from town, has been negated. Other barriers include share, house, share houses that are impact accessible when they have less impacts than many households. DV families forced to move instead of relocating perpetrators. Social housing sitting empty or underutilised through Centrelink rules and a lack of options for empty nesters. We reject opportunity in light industrial areas that already have lofts incorporated and retain obsolete zonings in planning schemes, including commercial when there is no demand for, aged care where not required, and environmental constraints covered by eras that did not have the technology to offset impacts. There are no incentive incentives for transportable parks and tiny homes, rooming accommodation or living small. Australia lags comparable countries by some 15 per cent in community managed housing, funded by superannuation funds, social impact investment funds and the private sector. Why? In Noosa, our challenges are an example of conflict surrounding how to provide for our community without sacrificing what we have worked so hard for. Should the tick boxes currently in place remain, what do we do? Utilise sites deemed previously unsuitable or to be conserved? The culture of cannot instead of how leads to decisions or a lack of that can create even greater issues when you push residents and communities past their breaking point. How do Queenslanders protect their environment and much loved wildlife and continue their commitment to conserve land when they cannot put a roof over their family's head? We must now look to reconfigure and utilise space through a different lens. By calling for more land to be released without a mechanism to retain affordability, we will be having these same conversations in a decade. 
I could stand here and ask for more funding, more land, more compassion or more social housing. With nearly 50,000 Queenslanders sitting on the housing register, which does not include our workers who are not eligible, I will be standing in a very long queue. Instead, I ask that those tick boxes, the systems that made them valid, be reviewed so that the building of long-term affordable housing for those in our community who need it most can start in partnership with our not-for-profits and the private sector. Because if we can't provide accommodations for our low-income workers and retirees or put their wages up to a level that they can then afford, we have failed our people in the most basic of ways. Thank you. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Jordan. Deputy Speaker, last month I had the privilege of joining the Treasurer at Gilmore Space Technologies in Helensvale on the Gold Coast. We were proud to announce Gilmore Space as the first recipient of an investment from the Queensland Government's Business Investment Fund, which formed part of Gilmore's $61 million round of private investment. The QIC Managed Business Investment Fund is supporting established small and medium businesses with significant growth potential to create new jobs in Queensland. And that is exactly what is happening at Gilmore Space. Founded by two Brisbane-born brothers, Adam and James, Gilmore Space is growing from around 70 staff to more than 100 by the end of this year and 120 employees by the end of 2022, including at least 10 graduates. They are now one of Australia's leading space companies seeking to launch small satellites into low Earth orbits with their unique Aeris rockets featuring new and innovative hybrid propulsion technologies. The growth of Gilmore Space is demonstrating the opportunities on offer here in Queensland within the evolving global space industry, supported by the Queensland Government's Space Industry Strategy 2020 to 2025. Deputy Speaker, we're positioning Queensland as the country's space coast and the leading centre in Australasia for activities, including launches, ground systems, earth observation, niche manufacturing, robotics and space automation. This Gilmore in, in investment builds on a number of previous exciting agreements that the state has entered into to support and encourage innovation and new Queensland jobs. As part of the state budget, I was pleased to be with the Treasurer when he announced a new Palaszczuk government program that will entice interstate and international companies and leading businesses to set up or expand operations in Queensland. We call this $520 million program Invested in Queensland and is part of the flagship $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund. This is about attracting large-scale investment projects, supporting thousands of new jobs and generating billions of dollars in capital. And we know, Deputy Speaker, that Queensland is well-placed because we have followed the health advice so diligently. We've been able to reopen and keep open our economy in ways other states have not. So nationally and internationally, we are regarded as a safe haven for investment. And coupled with our attractive lifestyle and, of course, our once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to now host the 2032 Olympics, Queensland is truly ready to take full advantage of these opportunities. Invested in Queensland will offer incentives to attract these companies. Over the life of the Invested in Queensland program, we expect to see an additional 5,000 ongoing jobs created in Queensland. The Palaszczuk government has always been pro-investment and pro-growth. This new investment will be in addition to our existing arsenal of investment, facilitation, support mechanisms and stakeholder engagement activities. Now more than ever, we're focused on attracting and supporting significant new investment in Queensland. As the Assistant Minister for Treasury, the Treasurer has ta tasked me to assist him with the investment side of his portfolio, which is proving to be a very busy and exciting opportunity. Since the beginning of this year, the Treasurer has hosted a number of investor roundtables, and these have garnered significant insights and information to help guide our investment support programs. Roundtables in Townsville, Logan and Toowoomba, as well as Brisbane, have been well attended, and I would like to thank all of the individuals and businesses who have taken the time to be part of these high-level and invaluable discussions. The Invested in Queensland program will prioritise major investment support through two new investment schemes. Our Strategic Investment Scheme will provide tailored funding support to local, interstate and international businesses looking to establish significant job-creating projects in Queensland. And our Investment Support Scheme will provide contestable projects with rebates on payroll tax and other state-based taxes. Invested in Queensland will build on our strong history of supporting, leveraging and facilitating private sector investment in our state and builds on a range of policies and programs focused on industry attraction and development. 
Previous investments have included a partnership with Boeing, which could see uncrewed defence aircraft produced in Queensland, attracting the relocation of the Australian New Zealand headquarters of leading food manufacturer Kerry Industry to Brisbane, and support to accelerate delivery of a 20.8 million expansion by Australian-owned horticultural and garden products business Orico Group at Childers near Bundaberg. Deputy Speaker, this is just a snippet of the many investment successes that we have forged with the, that have been forged with the support of the Palaszczuk government over recent years. And I look forward to sharing even more of these successful investment stories as our Invested in Queensland program and the Business Investment Fund ramp up even further, ensuring Queensland is and will continue to be at the forefront of national and global investment. Call the member for Burdekin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It won't happen again. But as we now know, Mr Deputy Speaker, it has happened again. And of course, I'm referring to the member for Mundingborough, or as he's locally known, lights out less. Mr Deputy Speaker, how are the residents of Townsville, the constituents of Mundingborough, expected to have any confidence in that member when within the space of six months he's been involved in his second altercation? an altercation that has led to criminal charges, and I won't go into that today because it is still subject of a matter before the court. Uh, just pause the clock, uh, pause the clock and resume your seat while I take some advice. Uh, member, anything that's currently before the uh, courts is uh, subject to subjudice and should not be referred to either directly or indirectly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I withdraw. So instead of addressing the crime problem in towns, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Mundingborough is contributing to it. All right, I put the clock. Resume your seat. Uh, member, that's grossly disorderly. It's breaching Standing Order 233. I'd ask you to withdraw and continue your contribution. But I caution you that continued disorderliness will be result in you uh, being sat down. So I call the member. Point of order, Mr Speaker. What's your, uh, resume your seat, uh, Member for Burdekin. What's your point of order, Thank Member Mr. for Kiwana? Uh, Mr Speaker, under the subjudice rule, I seek your clarification. Um, the member for... Uh, Munding Borough has previously had a banning notice issued, which is not a criminal matter. Um, we are, there's a common assault, common assault charge, which is before the courts. Uh, is the member free to talk about the banning notice, of which is so also a subject to the member for Munding Borough, which is not a criminal matter? And I don't think, my understanding of the standing orders is the subjudice does not apply to the banning order of the uh, Townsville uh, precinct. I have a view on that. I'll confer with the clerk. Uh, the the uh, member in his contributions is making uh, a, a clear linkage between the two, so it would be, uh, as, in, as advised, best if the member stayed away from the topic altogether uh, and continued his contribution without uh, breaching the uh, rules around subjudice. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Premier has a right... Deputy Speaker. Point point of order, order, Deputy Speaker. Uh, resume your seat, Member. In, in your ruling, you made it quite clear that the member had withdraw his comments. He has failed to take your your uh, warning, and uh, I, I think uh, that he needs to follow what your uh, order was in terms of the point of order you made previously. That, thank you. I'll seek some advice. Member, did you withdraw? For the purpose of the record, I'll withdraw again. Thank you. You have the call, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Premier has a right to be disappointed, but more importantly, the Townsville community and Munding Borough. All right, pause the clock, resume your seat. Uh, uh, member, once again, you're straying into a matter that is uh, subjudice. I'm going to uh, ask you to resume your seat. I call the member for Palmerstone. Deputy Speaker. There's been a lot of talk about leadership in the chamber this afternoon. Here's a chance for the LNP and their federal government to show some desperately needed leadership on health. 
Back in March, I told this House about the dire shortage of GPs gripping our community in Palmerstone. And over the last six months, the situation has only gotten worse. Since I first spoke out, local medical practices have contacted me about their struggles to recruit GPs. The popular medical centre at Palmerstone Village recently shut its doors. After two long years of trying, they couldn't recruit permanent doctors to replace locums who had moved on. That added 1,000 patients to the list of local people who don't have a trusted GP to turn to. Local people who are still waiting for up to four weeks for a GP appointment or who can't get on the books of a GP at all. Palmerstone people who are trying to get vaccinated can't get a GP appointment. People due for routine, routine screening can't get a GP appointment. People who need help to manage their chronic health conditions can't get a GP appointment. No wonder our hospital emergency departments are under pressure. No wonder patients are presenting later and sicker when they get ill. No wonder people's mental health is impacted when they don't have a trusted GP to turn to. Our GP crisis is a problem the federal government should have fixed by now. And it's a problem that Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt could fix with the stroke of a pen if he made our community a priority. Because as I said back in March, it hasn't always been this way. Until 2019, Palmerstone had district of workforce shortage status that made it much easier for local GP clinics to find and retain local doctors. Then, with no notice to doctors or the community, the federal government changed the system and took Palmerstone off the GP priority list. Waiting times blew out. When doctors moved on, clinics couldn't replace them. This was the very first issue that was raised with me after I was first elected. And while it's not a state government problem to fix, I couldn't turn my back on people in our community who deserve to be able to see a GP when they desperately need one. So back in June, I wrote to the Federal Health Minister and asked him to take urgent action on behalf of people in Palmerstone to fix our GP crisis by putting our community back on the GP priority list. And for the last 86 days, I have heard nothing. It's a slap in the face to the more than 1,100 people who have signed my petition asking Greg Hunt to act. This week, I've written to our federal member for Longman to ask him to give Greg Hunt the hurry up to fix our GP crisis. He's hung back for the last three years and watched the problem get worse. But with a federal election due soon, I'm hoping that the federal member for Longman might finally get a move on. Or like the vaccine stroll out, has Scott Morrison's government deciding that fix, decided that fixing our GP crisis just isn't a race? State and federal, Labor takes our GP crisis seriously. When federal Labor leader Anthony Albanese came to Bribie Island recently, he met with Dr Steve Carney from, from Ningi Doctors, and Dr Carney told him that we need urgent action to restore Palmerstone's GP priority status. And our Labor candidate for Longman, Rebecca Fanning, promised that she would fight for Medicare and for better GP services every step of the way. The contrast with the Morrison government's inaction couldn't be starker. Our Palaszczuk government is working hard every single day so people in Palmerstone can have the very best health care. We're investing in more doctors and nurses to replace those cut under the Newman government. We're doubling the size of Caboolture Hospital. We're building not one, but two satellite hospitals so that Palmerstone residents can have more health care closer to home. Now we need Scott Morrison's government to finally step up and protect people's health in Palmerstone by fixing our GP crisis. And I ask those op opposite to pick up the phone and talk to their federal colleagues and get this done for the people of Palmerstone. Uh, Honourable Members, uh, just uh, advice for the House in Divisions 1 and 2 earlier today relating to the Business Program Motion Amendment and the Business Program Motion, the member for Callide was included. There was no difficulty in including members' votes uh, because the member was present on the uh, parliamentary precinct. However, as the member is now in isolation and will not be attending the chamber today, his vote cannot be now included in accordance with Session Order 1053B. Therefore, the member's vote will need to be removed from the vote. The matter does not affect the outcome of the vote. However, the record does need to be corrected. 
The result of the Division 1 was in fact eyes 36, nose 50, and the result of Division 2 was in fact eyes 50 and nose 36. In accordance with Sessional Order 1051I, I have instructed the Clerk to amend the record of proceedings. Honourable Members, before calling the Honourable Member for Stretton, I remind Members that this is the Member's first speech in this place and should be listened to with the courtesies reserved for such occasions. I call the Honourable Member for Stretton. Mr Speaker, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I want to place on record my thanks to the people of Stretton for their support. My commitment to you is to always be your faithful servant. I rise today as a proud member of the Palaszczuk Labor Government and the new member for Stretton. But the feeling is bittersweet. The reason for this by-election was a sad one. We lost our good friend Duncan Pegg, the former member for Stretton. For over 20 years I was proud uh, to count Duncan as one of my closest friends. We first met at Griffith University and we came up through the party together, started our careers together at the same time, me at the AWU and Duncan across the road at Shackers Lawyers. We were side by side, we shared ups and downs and everything else that life throws at you. It does feel strange not having Duncan around. Duncan loved being the member for Stretton and loved the people there. Over the last few months on, during the campaign, I've spoken to many local residents who have shared their stories about Duncan and what's clear to me uh, is that the community loved Duncan back. Yeah. Working with Duncan taught me the importance of putting the community first, caring about the lives of the people we represent and being there for people when they need it most. That the MP is there to serve the community, not the other way around. That being an MP is not about seeking accolades or awards for yourself, but about what you can do for your community. Before he passed, I promised Duncan that I would work every day for the people of Stretton to continue his legacy as part of the Palaszczuk government. This is a standard that I aspire to live up to. Duncan first announced his diagnosis in this house in November 2019. This revelation changed the personal worlds of so many of us sitting here and so many people beyond this chamber. About a month after his announcement, reports started emerging about a new contagious viral infection. It is hard to believe, but it has now been over 18 months since COVID-19 first emerged. This period has driven home the profound influence that global events can have on our state and community. In my own electorate, the global impacts of the pandemic are felt on a very personal level. As the most multicultural electorate in Queensland, many in the community have friends and family overseas. So many people in our local area have told me about how COVID has ravaged the communities of their loved ones overseas. But during the campaign, one message from my community was loud and clear. Over the phones, through the fly screen doors, I heard the same thing over and over again. Anastasia has kept us safe. We trust Anastasia. We've done great in Queensland. Mr Speaker, I agree with the people of Stretton. Queenslanders rightly expect their leaders to put human safety first, act consistently and not shirk from the tough calls. I'm proud to stand in this chamber as a member of the Palaszczuk Labor government and I'm proud to serve under a Premier who continues to rise to the challenge and stand firm in her determination to keep Queenslanders safe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Stretton electorate is a multicultural success story. It has the highest proportion of people born overseas in the state and the highest proportion of people who speak a language other than English at home. People have come from all over Queensland, from all over Australia and all over the world to settle in our vibrant, diverse and multicultural community deep on the south side of Brisbane. While we are a diverse community, there are so many points of similarity. In our diversity, we have a lot in common. People in Stretton value hard work, family and education. For a new community on the outskirts of Brisbane, we punch above our weight with above average outcomes in education and job prospects. Indeed, the reason that so many people have settled in Stretton is to secure a better life for their children. What I consistently hear from parents of all backgrounds is their pride in their children studying medicine, law, dentistry, engineering, pharmacy, IT or accounting, or pride that their children were at TAFE pursuing a trade or setting up a small business in our local area. This is the key common unifying factor across the community. All parents want the best for their children and want to see them succeed in securing a decent job, pursuing their chosen career and carving out a future for themselves and their uh, future family too. Many locals come from countries where a decent education is not a guarantee, where getting sick can cost you your life savings, where the air and rivers are polluted, where the economy only works for a privileged few, or where politics might not be stable, or if it is stable, not particularly free. 
Over the years, so many new Australians in the Stretton community have commented to me and Duncan how strange it was that they could get so close to a politician. How strange it is that a politician could be walking the streets not surrounded by rings of security and police. How strange it is for people to be able to access their local politician through meetings at the office, in the community or on the phone. This democratic access is something that we should protect. The experience of so many in my community illustrates that we can never take this or the sanctity of free and fair elections for granted. And as the local member for Stretton, I will always have my door open to the community. As a Labor MP, I will always work to build in Queensland an economy and society that provides opportunity to all, whatever your background. A place where Queenslanders have the opportunity to succeed on their merits, a path from home to school to higher education, to a decent job, a means to provide for your family, and if you can, give back to the community where you live. And the people of Stretton certainly give back. One distinguishing feature of the Stretton electorate is the level of community engagement as evidenced by the diversity and number of community groups. I'm sure Stretton must be the electorate with the most community groups, and we benefit so much for it. In addition to local PNCs, uh, the Callumbale Runners, Meals on Wheels, Pinelands Lions, Callumbale Lions, Sunnybank Hills Rotary and Neighbourhood Watch groups, our area benefits for the many, many multicultural groups that are based there. Groups like the Taiwan Women's League, the Indian Senior Citizens Association, the Islamic Women's Association, the Queensland Chinese Forum, the Pakistani Australia Community Association and WAMSI, just to name a few. All of these groups run off volunteer power and there is no shortage of it in Stretton. The cumulative effect of this is a vibrant, engaged local community where groups working in one area lift the rest and benefit us all. Mr Speaker, when I speak about families coming from all over the world to live in Stretton, I'm also talking about my family. And when I talk about the values of study and work in our local community, I'm also talking about the values that were imparted to me by my own family. My parents, Bob and Leslie, who are here today, migrated from England in 1989 and settled in Acacia Ridge. We went to the local school and mum and dad, who are retired now, they're proud, they still live in Acacia Ridge, they're proud that they've paid off their house and they get by on their pension with a little bit of savings from their super. Mum worked in the uh, Queensland Health Warehouse in Richlands and dad was a mechanic who worked at Hastings Deering in Archerfield. He's a proud trade unionist and served as a union delegate in Hangar 3 for, for the AMW for many years. I have to say, dad never passed on any mechanical skills to me. <laughs> I have no idea how to f uh, fix an engine, but I do think I picked up a few of the union skills along the way. <laughs> From an early age, Dad taught me the meaning of solidarity. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mum and Dad were proudly working class. They taught me that we have a duty to stick together, to improve conditions uh, for working people and for those less fortunate. Most importantly, this means joining your union and voting Labor. For our family and many others, from similar circumstances, election nights felt like a grand final. For working families across Queensland, elections were not an academic matter. A Labor win meant that your local school got more teachers, more funding. It meant that more nurses at the hospital and more cops on the beat. A Labor government meant, most importantly, that working people could be sure they would be treated fairly at the bargaining table with their boss. Yeah. Mr Speaker, these are the values that I've held for my entire life. I still feel that way and I still, uh, will still work to continue to work passionately for these values. I'm also joined here today in the gallery by my beautiful wife Stella and our son Oliver. Yeah. I'm lucky to have them as my biggest supporters. Stella was born, uh, Stella was born in Australia, she's a first generation Aussie and her father is the local, well-known local GP, Dr Rod Chu. He's of Chinese heritage. He ran the Cooper's Plains surgery for 45 years. He actually arrived in Australia at 13 years old in 1958, knowing no English. Through hard work and determination, Dr Chu went on to complete a Bachelor of Medicine at UQ, where he met his wife, Lima, whose own parents had migrated from Eastern Europe after World War II. Mr Speaker, the story of our multicultural community is very personal to me, and is also my own story and the story of my family. Stella and I had parents who came from the four corners of the globe and settled locally. They started families and had children. Stella and I grew up met, started our own, a family of our own. Our wedding was held in Stella's childhood Catholic church alongside a traditional Chinese tea ceremony at the reception. And our son, Ollie, is now growing up in the same community that his grandparents settled in all those years ago. There are not many other countries in the world where you could tell the same story. That is the great success of multiculturalism in Queensland, and that is why I'm proud to represent the seat of Stretton. 
Mr Speaker, I see my role in this place as making sure that the opportunities I had growing up are continued and expanded. One area in which I take particularly keen interest is secure work. For me, this is the core of what a Labor government stands for. Growing up, our family could rely on Dad having a secure job. We weren't rich, but we could plan for the future. And I want others to have uh, this security and this opportunity. A good job means that Mum and Dad can plan uh, Mum and Dad can plan for uh, their family's future. It means they can pay for their kids to go on school camp, afford an instrument, or take a holiday every couple of years. It means they can save a little bit extra for retirement. The emergence of the gig economy over the last few years has brought to public attention the fact that secure full-time employment is unfortunately for many a fading dream. Casualisation has uh, been growing in Australia for some years now, but there is nothing particularly new about it. During the Great Depression, many workers would head out that day to line up at the factory gate, hoping to get a shift. These days, that task is performed by a smartphone notification. Of course, tech disruption brings with it immense opportunities to improve our lives. Uh, it brings immense economic opportunities as well. Neither should we take a simplistic nor nostalgic view of the past, but we must be clear-sighted about the broad and long-term impacts on jobs and employment. If we want to sustain an egalitarian and moderate political system that we have built in Australia, then we cannot afford to leave large parts of the community behind. How can we manage this change? First, we must be clear that industrial relations laws and workplace laws in this country are set by elected governments of Australia, not foreign tech companies. Likewise, workplace conditions and pay are collectively bargained between employees and their employer. They are not imposed from Silicon Valley. Secondly, we need to continue to deliver world-class education. Over the last six years, the Palaszczuk Labor government has delivered record education funding in Stretton, including new classrooms, performing arts centres, science labs, air conditioning, solar panels and more. A good education will give our kids the confidence to navigate the new economy. It is no surprise that the Education Minister, Grace Grace, is very popular in Stretton, and it's been great to have her visit both Stretton State College and Autism Queensland recently, just two of the many projects the Palaszczuk government is funding for our local students to give them the best start in life. Finally, we need to recognise that different solutions may be required at different points in somebody's life or career. Younger people entering the workforce will have careers that are more fluid than in the past. They may need flexible skill sets. And as policymakers, we need to think about innovative ways to preserve, these, to preserve the type of benefits and security that their parents took for granted. For older people affected by disruption, we will need to invest in lifelong training opportunities or they may need other support in re-entering the workforce. My view on this is simple. If someone is willing to work, able to work, and wants a job, we should help them find one. Yeah. This core belief can be seen in the government's response to the pandemic. On the one hand, responding to the health crisis by putting the safety of Queenslanders first, and on the other hand, bringing forward funding and investment for schools, roads, hospitals, public transport, uh, to improve services, but most importantly, to, well, just as importantly, to create jobs and ensure our economic recovery. Mr Speaker, when it comes to secure work, we must also remember that opportunity alone is not enough for everyone to compete on an even level. People who live with an intellectual or developmental disability face barriers that limit their ability to socialise, work and play. Our fellow Queenslanders often face barriers that others can take for granted. I'm passionate about assisting uh, people with an intellectual or developmental disability enter the workforce. This is fundamentally about inclusion. Meaningful employment gives people self-worth and dignity. It improves mental health, confidence and, importantly, helps build lasting friendships and networks. In Stretton, we have many fantastic organisations that work to make this happen, including Currabee Special School, Multicap, Help Enterprises and the Kayabra Community Organisation. I look forward to working with these organisations to improve employment outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities. We have a long way to go, and I hope that I can use my parliamentary position to champion this cause. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I now turn to some final words of thanks. Uh, firstly, I owe a debt of gratitude to my wife, Stella, and the rest of my family for their support during the campaign and over the years. Patrick dropping off leafless on his trusty electric bicycle, mum and dad driving around the campaign truck, and Stella, who was by my side the whole way, uh, whilst also keeping Ollie and I in line. With the campaign rolling on as Duncan's health deteriorated, I couldn't have dealt with the situation if it wasn't for the, uh, Stella's love and support. You really are one in a million. <laughs> 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 Mr Speaker, I am indebted to the union movement, 
The advocacy of my dad's union meant that my parents could guarantee a good upbringing for their kids. When I left university, I went to work for the Australian Workers Union, and I hope that my efforts had a similar impact on the lives of those members. I also want to thank the mighty United Workers Union for their help on the campaign. Gary Bullock, the State Secretary, Greg Moran, Jake Connor, and the whole UWU team. It's great to be part of a union that has such an impressive capacity to campaign for their members. Mr Speaker, my journey to this place is a continuation of Duncan's journey, and looking back, it's amazing how many of my closest, closest friendships were formed during our years in student politics. Merrick Foley, Clinton De Bruyne, Monique Bilianowski, David Shaw, Annette Curry, and my brother Patrick teamed up all those years ago with Duncan. In fact, I think it was one of Duncan's standout abilities to be able to assemble a team of people passionate about the Labor cause and to work together to win and to remain loyal to each other. I also want to thank all of the Labor members in this place who helped on the campaign. There was a lot of you. Uh, the Labor family really rallied around the Stretton campaign, helping me but also doing it for Duncan. Uh, they rallied their own volunteers to the cause and on election day you couldn't walk five metres without bumping into a Labor MP or a minister. Um, in particular, I wanted to thank the members for Mount Omni and the member for Logan for your moral support and help on the campaign. Yeah. Also, I've been fortunate to have, to have two local federal members who have been great supporters and important sources, sources of advice. The federal member for Rankin, Jim Chalmers, and Graham Perrett, the member for Morton, are well loved in our local area, and I look forward to working with them for the benefit of our community. Yeah. To all the elected members who helped on the campaign, your help and support during the past few months has meant a lot to me. To my campaign manager, Kerry Carlin, there is no one more well-organised or motivated person I know, and I'm lucky that party office sent you. Duncan would be very proud of your efforts on this campaign. I would also like to acknowledge the party president, John Baddams, and state secretary, Jules Campbell, and the whole team at party office. It's great to be part of a party that is so united. To the Pegg family, Graham Lindsay, Grant, Cameron, Lachlan and Grant Jr. <clears throat> Your support during this difficult time has meant so much to me and Stella. I know you are still grieving and I hope you uh, know that we are all here for you. You will always be part of the Stratton Labor family. Yeah. <clears throat> Campaigns don't happen without the hard work of local supporters and volunteers and I was so, so fortunate to have so many working on this campaign, helping with letterboxing, door knocking, phone calling and handing out how to vote cards on election day. The support I received from party members across the state and even the nation was overwhelming. I particularly want to thank Emily Kim, Adam and Ryan Chappell, Gail McPherson, Jude Hardy, David Pass, Don and Vicky Mitchell, Michael Glaros and the whole Glaros family, the McDonough family, Celine Z, Connor Rutherford, Emmy Muggleton, Fahima Amadi and the Amadi sisters, Tarat Achal, Mohammed Sultani, Naya Pauli, Frank Plunkett, Ella Craig, Jack Hughes, Adrian and Neil Kremen, Tony Castoros, Logan Meat, Tess O'Reilly, Lee Ash, Noel Higginbotham, Maddie Sellers, Ali Kadri, Sandy Thomas, Shaji Takanath, Nick Thaki, Martin Young, Sharif Kariakis, Sukjinder Singh, Hardik Walga, Prakruthi and Lucky, Teng and Michael, John Prescott, Richard and Annie, the Lamakia family, Daniel Main, the OB family, Lisa Banyard and her Logan Westies, Aleko, Daniel Gann, Sam Zhu, Sam Zhu, Alan Ding, Tari Dambo, Kylie Slater, Rachel Stanley, Alex Asher, Jasmine Bullman, Lisa Wilder, Michael Eborn, John Churgan, Hamish Bright, Samantha Fuller, Terry Govert, Byron, the Wood family, William Wu, Nada Hernandez, Pema Baston, Sam Jones, Lucy Collier, Hannah Herriman, Brendan Williams, Jason McKenzie and Renee Coffey. There was a lot of you. I also want to thank the community leaders, Ben Chen, Galila Abdul Salam, Esther Stewart, Lewis Lee, OAM, Alan Chen, Ricky Chen, Pearl Chen, Gurlal Singh, Rena Augustine, Michael Choi, the former member for Kapalabar, Janeth Dean and Jitendra Dio uh, for all of your help and advice on the campaign. Finally, I want to once again thank the people of Stretton for their support. As I said before, I will always be your humble servant. Thank you. I call the clerk to read the next order of the day. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Appropriation Parliament Bill, Appropriation Bill, Consideration in Detail, Cognate Debate, Resumption of Debate. Speaker, I'll wait for this. Good luck. <laughs>
Mr Speaker. I call the member for Harvey Bay. Just to continue the debate, uh, Mr Speaker, where I left off earlier, it really reflects the LNP's inability to understand budget estimates process whatsoever. In stark contrast, con contrast sorry, at estimates, the Premier, Treasurer and Minister outline the government's record spend on jobs, health in services, infrastructure and tourism support. They outline a clearly defined economic recovery plan that will take us through the forward estimates period and well into the future. That's billions, in billions of dollars in jobs and services and building back better. Speaker, I'm proud to be a part of the Palaszczuk government that has responded to the pandemic by putting in place a great budget as outlined throughout the estimates process that will deliver the jobs, health services, education, infrastructure and housing to keep Queensland safe, to keep the electorate of Harvey Bay safe and continue to make our future strong. Keeping Queensland safe and delivering the COVID-19 economic recovery plan is what, the is what this Labor Palaszczuk government is about. And we will continue to look after the people of Queensland despite the bitterness of those opposite. Speaker, I support the recommendation before the House. I call the member for Nindri. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, as a member of the Economics and Governance Committee, I rise to speak on the committee's examination of the Appropriation Bill 2021. Unfortunately, it didn't take the estimates process to learn about the perilous state of the Queensland economy. It's been tracking in the wrong direction long before we saw the game of charades the Palaszczuk Labor government played at estimates earlier this month. What the estimates process did achieve, however, was once again highlight the, to Queensland taxpayers, hard-working mums and dads, small business owners and everyone in between that this government has no idea. No idea how to plan, no idea how to budget, no idea how to rebuild our economy, no idea how to curb ambulance ramping and reduce waiting times, no idea, no idea how to deal with the juvenile crime crisis and no idea how to protect our most vulnerable. Queenslanders deserve so much more than what they are receiving from this third term Labor government. And this is more, co more concerning, they are more concerned about spending taxpayer dollars on polling. Surely the, the statistics paint a clear enough picture. Currently in Queensland, there are more than 200,000 people out of work. Our unemployment rate is 13 per cent higher than Victoria and nearly 25 per cent higher than New South Wales. Ambulance ramping sits at more than 50 per cent across the state and 55,000 Queenslanders sit on elective surgery wait lists and a further 220,000 on the waiting list to get on the waiting list. Madam Acting Speaker. Our state health budget only increased by the exact amount that Canberra gave them in this year's federal budget, $400 million. Labor's record health budget does nothing to improve a public health system that is lo they are losing control of. Never has there been a more critical time to be investing in rebuilding the economy as we map a path to recovery. So what does this state Labor government do? It slashes infrastructure spending, which has been cut by $4 billion over the forward estimates. While motorists across the state are stuck in traffic jams or dealing with dangerous and unsafe roads, the state Labor government is more concerned with playing the blame game. COVID, Canberra, commercial inconfidence, it's like watching a game of Wheel of Fortune. However, unfortunately, for residents in my electorate, like the 92 other electorates in this state, it doesn't matter where it lands because there is no winner. The prize bank in Queensland is empty, unless, of course, you are a movie star or a football player. 
Madam Acting Speaker, there's no doubt these are unprecedented times. The health pandemic has challenged each and every one of us and our communities in ways we could never have expected. As a result, Queenslanders are desperate for courage and leadership from this government. A sense of hope that things will get better and that we will emerge from this health crisis stronger and more resilient. But that is not what they are seeing from this state Labor government. Small and family business is the backbone of our state's economy, but to many small businesses in my electorate, they are struggling to keep the doors open and to pay their staff. Labor's catch cry of keeping Queenslanders safe has a very bitter aftertaste. The LNP, along with the state's business community, have been calling out for a tailored lockdown business support package since early 2021, more than 100 times, in fact. Despite this, we learn at estimates Treasury wasn't even asked to perform any modelling on any assistance package or set aside any money. Madam Acting Speaker, Queenslanders care about the things that affect them directly, like receiving medical treatment when they need it, having access to housing and living in a safe community, like providing their children with a quality education and the prospect of a job in the future, and getting home safely in time for dinner, not spending hours stuck in traffic. These are the things that affect Queenslanders directly, and they are the very same things the Palaszczuk Labor government is failing to de deliver yet again. Thank you. The question is that the report of the Economic and Governance Committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the report of the State Development and Regional Industries Committee be adopted. I call the member for Bancroft. Uh, speaker, I move that the uh, uh, move the report from the estimates report from the State Development and Regional Industries uh, Committee. Uh, I want to first want to start off by thanking uh, all members who participated uh, in our estimates. Thanks to the Secretariat. Uh, I always like estimates; that uh, we always learn something. Um, but the question is, of course, what did we learn from the LNP in 2021? And may I say, nothing positive, of course. Okay. Nothing has changed. In fact. Uh, speaker, what we did learn, though, is that the LNP cannot res recognise the passage of time. Now, in their statement of reservation, they claim there was limited time available for non-government members to ask questions. Uh, but the truth is this, and by my calculations, they've got 65 per cent of question time with the Deputy Premier, and that's including 75 per cent of time on local government, uh, 66 per cent of the Minister for Agriculture's time. 61% uh, of the Minister for Manufacturing's time. Now, from what I understand, that's uh, five and a quarter hours worth of questions versus two and a half hours for government members. Now, very clearly, they had ample opportunity to ask decent questions, but nobody stopped them. They only stopped themselves, you could say. Um, Speaker, what we also understand is that the LNP don't quite understand standing orders. Now, they complained in the statement of reservation about uh, constant interruptions and points of order. But if we look at Standing Order 115, it says questions shall not contain lengthy or subjective preambles, arguments, inferences, imputations or hypotheticals. It's very clear uh, it is in black and white about how you ask a question. But, for example, uh, the member for Warrigo clearly doesn't understand this. Now, she, I don't think she really quite gets estimates. She asks the same questions virtually as last year. Instead of asking questions about dog parks this year, it was about lemons, cattle yards and flowers. Um, now, as the Deputy Premier said in response to the... I, I, it, it is. Flowers is a nice one. I like that one. Uh, the Deputy Premier said in response to the members questioning, there are clear processes for councils to receive advice. That process is not to forward them, is not to forward to the member for Warrego to ask questions at estimates. Now, how ironic it is that the opposition is saying that the process is broken when they're the ones turning up with the same questions, looking for political gotchas, breaching standing orders, and as we have said constantly over here, if you want better answers, ask better questions. And, and uh, um, Speaker, what I do want to um, point out is what we learnt from the member for Burley was very interesting this year, and what we learnt is he's probably not very interested in the actual process of estimates. Uh, speaker, he had a shocker this year. Um, I would say more so than usual. In fact, here's the Latrell Mitchell. Here's the Latrell Mitchell of Queensland Parliament, <laughs> barging in recklessly into the fray, 
There he is. Should have, he was sent off once. He was sent off. And ideally, he should have been sent off for longer than that. I'd take the blame for that one. Um, but, Speaker, there was one issue that should be addressed in his behaviour. Now, he did get ejected for being disruptive and for, being, for constantly interjecting. And it was not because he asked a question, but this is what he claimed, and he tweeted on the day. Gee, one question to the Minister for Agriculture. Apparently Labor didn't like that, so I've been thrown out for an hour. Uh, that's how bad estimates have gotten. Well, uh, Speaker, that isn't true, and I will table a uh, copy of that uh, tweet. Uh, now, I did think for a while whether we should pursue this for a breach of standing orders. Um, standing Order 20, uh, 26613 says you can't publish a false or misleading report of the proceedings of the Parliament of a committee. But, honestly, can I call a tweet of two and a half lines a report? That would be very generous there, and I perhaps, would, perhaps I wouldn't want to glorify that with calling it a report. Let's say it's more of, more of a thought bubble. Still, it would be useful to point out the member did more tweets than questions on the day. Yep. Speaker, I do, I, what was new from the opposition this year, and this was a, the conflict of interest, interest stunt, and I would like to say good try, but it wasn't. Um, I don't think they may, you've made a good case of it being a perceived conflict of interest by any measure. Now, no one in our hearing raised the issue that the member for Gympie is a member for Agforce, the member for Burley is a part owner of Rury, even though we discussed craft brewing policy, and the member for Maroochydaw has, through, uh, some, for, has some form of ownership of industrial sheds through a family trust which could argue potentially benefit even more, but I did not think that was, so I let it go. The member's time has expired. Thank you. I call the member from the Mirichel. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to follow the former member, not because it was really illuminating, but because it's an opportunity to address the conflict of interest that this member had as a CFMEU member who did not declare the fact he was a CFMEU member when he was chairing and trying to uh, obstruct questions, particularly in regard to that hack that... Uh, that practice that has occurred and is increasingly occurring under state labour here in Queensland and the union favourment clause that will see up to a 30 per cent increase in the cost of infrastructure, major infrastructure projects in Queensland. They call it the best uh, practice industry conditions, but uh, when you actually dig into it, uh, it's actually there's some very valid concerns about whether it's contrary to federal workplace laws, but what it is is a favourment clause that's going to gouge vital infrastructure dollars from the major projects we need in Queensland and pay way over and above what the uh, award wages, what the uh, agreed wages are and conditions are in the construction industry. And the CFMEU chair, uh, the member for Bancroft, did not declare it up front that he had that, uh, I believe, a conflict of interest. Uh, now, he said, oh, people could ask the questions, I had ample time, except they then hauled off into a private committee member uh, uh, committee where they resolved supposedly this accusation of conflict by coming back and saying he didn't have a conflict. Well, we don't know what happened in those secret cloistered committee because it's, they do not publish their minutes. And this is one of the rorts that's happening increasingly under this Labor government, where committee processes, and rather than being a process of scrutiny, there's more and more of their minutes are locked up locked up, not released. You don't find out that there may have been a dissenting, uh, a dissenting process where other members have voted against matters, but that's locked up, locked up, kept secret. Now, we are a unicameral parliament, and increasingly we're seeing committees not used as a, a process of scrutiny, but used as a process to shut down members. I call on this Labor government, stop being uh, so scared of scrutiny. Start releasing those uh, minutes from those committee processes rather than abusing your positions by the tyranny of your majority. Now, this is a unicameral parliament. We don't have an upper house. The committee process is important. It's been rorted by this government. Rorted by this government. We saw this absolutely ridiculous situation where the member for Bancroft said, no, he didn't have a conflict of interest, but that process of determining that was behind closed doors and we're not allowed to know the process because it's a secret. That is just ridiculous. That process of abuse of the committee system has to stop. 
more and more of the committee processes have to be open to scrutiny. It's important for the uh, practice of this place. It's important for the people of Queensland. Never have we seen Queenslanders asked to bear so much government intrusion into their lives in the name of the public good, in the name of public health, but not in the name of transparency. And when you're asking people to trust you, you should trust them with the information. We need this for good civil society. We need it for good governance and accountable decision-making in government. In regard to the issue of infrastructure, we have seen uh, about a $4 billion cutback in the forward estimates in respect to projected infrastructure projects that should have been there, a $6 billion backlog in regard to maintenance in the uh, transport, transport and roads area. But I want to talk about homelessness and what has been a dire issue for those who are the most marginal is now becoming a dire issue even for people who have good jobs, who probably would have never thought they would be looking at a caravan or a tent in order to get housing. There has been a fall off in the amount of land that's been released under this government in the last 10 years compared to the previous 10 years, the number of lots that were being released at a time when the population was increasing. Now, COVID has caused, no doubt, a spike in demand for housing, but the train smash of the decrease in the release of land, and it's not a laughing matter, the decrease in the amount of available housing for people has been happening over the last 10 years while the population has been going up. Now, these barriers to release and timely housing have to be addressed. The growth areas team within the uh, Department of State Development uh, has some merit, but it doesn't address all the barriers with multiple ministers with their sticky fingers of obstruction stopping timely construction happening. Good planning shouldn't take an extra 10 years when people are desperate for housing now. There has to be reform in this area Madam to Deputy police Speaker. the housing. I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As much as I'd love to allow the member from Rootsville to keep shouting at the clouds, uh, I will instead uh, do my speech on the estimates report. I welcome the tabling of the State Development and Regional Industries Committee report into the proposed budget appropriations for 2021-22. I acknowledge the committee's recommendation that the proposed expenditure as detailed in the Appropriation Bill 2021 for the committee's area of areas of responsibility be agreed to by the Legislative Assembly without amendment. This budget is delivering on Queensland's COVID-19 economic recovery plan. Our world-class health response to the pandemic has provided us with an opportunity to attract and create jobs, grow our traditional industries and attract new industries to Queensland. This budget is a great example of how we will capitalise on those opportunities. We are continuing to work to deliver more jobs as one of the few states in Australia not in lockdown, and our unemployment has fallen to its lowest levels since before the Newman LNP government. Our flagship $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund is a game changer for enabling job creation in Queensland, and this financial year alone, more than $14.7 billion, one of the largest capital programs in recent years, has been allocated with more than 60 per cent being spent outside of Greater Brisbane. This is expected to directly support around 46,500 jobs, nearly 30,000 in the regions. Queensland's councils have played a major part in keeping Queenslanders safe and helping deliver Queensland's economic recovery plan. Our government's signature $1 billion Works for Queensland is helping councils deliver community infrastructure and improve livability right across regional Queensland. By the end of 2024, it's expected that Works for Queensland will have supported, sustained or created more than 25,000 jobs in regional Queensland. The Palaszczuk government also committed $200 million over six years to the South East Queensland Community Stimulus Program. So far, a total of 113 projects have been approved, and councils estimate that around 1,455 jobs will be created or supported across South East Queensland, Queensland through these projects. And we're investing an additional $70 million towards the Building Our Regions program. This program has provided funding towards 271 projects across regional Queensland, supporting an estimated 2,770 jobs. These projects have attracted additional investment of over $539 million from local government and other organisations. Madam Deputy Speaker, our government is supporting projects that deliver good, skilled jobs for Queenslanders. I think more secure jobs for Queenslanders is always a good thing. But at the committee hearings, those opposite didn't agree. 
They made it clear in the hearing, and the member for Maroochydore has just now, that they do not support best practice industry conditions. It doesn't matter if you're from the far north or the south east, all tradies have a right to a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. But those opposite don't think companies should prioritise local contractors or that tradies deserve a good wage or to come home safely at the end of their shift. In fact, they feel so strongly about it, the LNP demanded we ditch that policy for the 2032 Olympics, effectively demanding less secure, less safe jobs for Queenslanders. The member for Maroochydore should be ashamed. Oh, Delivering God good, order, secure jobs for I'm Queenslanders. I'm bothered by the Deputy Premier. I find it offensive and untrue, and I ask that it be withdrawn. Deputy, the withdraw, member finds Deputy it offensive Speaker, to withdraw. I withdraw. Delivering good, secure jobs for Queenslanders is at the heart of our infrastructure budget. I thank the committee for its consideration, parliamentary staff for all their work delivering the estimates, and my departmental and ministerial staff for preparing materials to inform the hearings. Madam Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Warrigo. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise to contribute on the debate on the 2021-22 Budget Estimates Report from the State Development and Regional Industries Committee. It was very disappointing that there was a limited time available for non-government MPs to ask questions. And I can remember when entire portfolios had a whole day of questions uh, to ministers. And once again, time was wasted as budget estimate hearings were characterised by constant interruptions and points of order from government MPs. Former Labor Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, John McKell, once I'll take that interjection once called on the estimates process as a protection racket. And there's no doubt that urgent reform is needed to ensure ministers can be held to account through a free-flowing questions and answer and budget estimates as budget estimates was intended. There are 77 Queensland councils that employ almost 40,000 people in Queensland, manage $108 billion in assets and over 153,000 kilometres of local roads and $25 billion of water and sewerage assets. However, in this estimate, Estimates Committee hearing, there was only 60 minutes of question time for government members and opposition members to ask questions on matters of importance in the local government portfolio area. And this just shows the lack of importance that this Labor government places on the local government sector. At a time of the Estimates Committee hearing, the Labor government was not able to provide an assurance to local governments with respect to the appropriate compensation for assisting with their border closures. Cost to councils for assisting the state government is in order of 631,000 for the previous closure. And the Paru Shire, described by the Auditor General as financially unsustainable, have had to expend 16 per cent of their general rate income to meet the cost of this previous border closure. And there are approximately 1,000 roads that councils assist with in the management of border closures. And finally, we're hearing after sustained pressure from the opposition, two years of questions in estimates. The government has mooted that there might be a border fund to assist council with the state government costs that have been cost shifted onto councils. And given this Labor government's track record on taxes, for instance the waste tax, the wagering tax, the land tax, the property investor tax and the car stamp duty, the LNP remains concerned that Queenslanders will be slapped with a wheelie bin tax at the beginning of next financial year. It of concern to councils in the budget strategy and outlook document only lists the advance waste payments for the 21-22 year. This means there is no further commitment to councils beyond this financial year. And councils rightly fear that they will have to pass on the cost of the levy, the waste levy, to households after June 2022 in the form of a rubbish tax. And with respect to the conflicts of interest issues, several examples were outlined by the LNP in relation to concerns raised by mayors and councillors. Improvements to the conflict of interest laws are desperately needed so that mayors and councillors can once again be empowered to act in the best interest of their communities. Again, under pressure from the opposition, the government had advised that they're looking at some changes. However, these will be up to six months away. The transcript also shows from the committee did not hear any declaration about the chair's union membership of the CFMEU at the start of questions relating to union influence. The chair declared his membership when prompted by opposition members. Just as well, he was not back in his former role as a councillor, as the outcome of his day could have been very different. 
And I note the omission of the Office of the Independent Assessor in Schedule 7. Schedule 7 lists the entities to which direct questioning of chief executives and estimates is to apply. The Office of the Independent Assessor was omitted this year. Does this omission by the government have anything to do with the use of the Division 5 notices issued to newspapers and journalists? Is the reducing of the parliamentary oversight of the Office of the Independent Assessor only seeks to re the view that this government is indeed conducting government in the dark? And Queenslanders have to pay their taxes and have every right to expect more from this Labor government's budget and greater oversight through the Estimates Committee process. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Fernie Grove. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I rise to uh, respond to the Estimate com Committee report from the State Development Regional Industries uh, Committee. Uh, I'd like to once again express my appreciation to the committee, and in particular the Chair, the member for Bancroft. Uh, the estimates process is one of uh, uh, trying at times, but it is important to lead, and also I congratulate him on his sterling efforts in that regard. The story of agriculture in Queensland is one that often defies simple charts and tables of numbers in black and white. The report outlining how we have maintained staffing levels in the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries doesn't tell the story of how DAF offices became a lifeline for our farmers uh, navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. The total annual budget uh, investment figures more than $100 million over what the LNP delivered. Uh, do not tell the story of the investment in new crop varieties or the developments in animal welfare or the extraordinary efforts uh, made to help our farmers across uh, the, the labour they need. The $71.4 million invested in drought support programs doesn't tell you how uh, that has proved the difference for Queensland farmers. The $42.5 million invested in fisheries reforms uh, years doesn't outline the measures necessary to see the jobs in our commercial and recreational fishing industries survive and to thrive. The $32.8 million towards improvements in land practices to protect the Great Barrier Reef doesn't tell the full story of this incredible natural and economic assets for Queenslanders. And none of these figures, none of these figures tell the stories of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our farmers, fishers and supply chains. It is an absolute tribute to everyone in my department. They maintain an excellent focus on both the current and future needs of agriculture and fisheries industries while navigating a path through the new realities uh, brought about by the pandemic. I should also point out that I was at the Marucci Research uh, Station last week. They were very pleased to hear the committee confiscated a large tray of new strawberry varieties at the hearing. The Palaszczuk government remains heavily focused on Queensland's COVID economic recovery plan and our commitment to creating jobs and driving down unemployment has seen Queensland lead this nation. We only need to look at our southern border to know that the threat of the pandemic to our agriculture uh, sector remains real and immediate. That is why so many Queenslanders continue to congratulate and thank our Premier and her team for keeping Queenslanders safe, even on this morning's ABC radio for our David Foote from Australian Country Choice commending the Palaszczuk government on its achievements. And my thanks go out to the wonderful people in my department who are helping the industry to navigate these choppy waters. These are the facts pointed to, to the committee's report, but it would, be, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention the opposition's statement of reservations where we drift more into realms of fiction than fact. In fact, this section weaves such an uh, elaborate fantasy, one wonders whether it's a, a based on estimates uh, committee hearings at all or if the LNP wrote it beforehand. The opposition's uh, complaint of not getting enough time for non-government questions once again entertains. I'm advised that the non-government MPs asked 71% of questions across all estimates hearings this year. Seems they have more than enough chances to ask whatever they wanted to. Of course, the LNP's miserable failure to read the SDS means they were always going to start behind the eight ball. They looked at the last year's one-off investments because of the COVID-19 pandemic compared them to this year's budget and claimed there were massive cuts to services and staff. You would think the LNP would know all about cuts to staff and funding after their record in government. I hate to tell the opposition uh, this, but, but the reason they can't find those cuts is because there aren't any. 
The opposition uh, complaints, AgTech wasn't mentioned as a budget highlight. Well, guess what? There weren't any questions from the opposition in regards to AgTech at the estimates hearing. The opposition continues with its fantasies of this dystopian uh, future without them being in government while the farming sector is looking to the future and getting on with the jobs of growing the best produce in the world. As the farmer's friend, I should acknowledge that the opposition statement of reservation did include one, one sentence that can sit in the non-fiction uh, section, and that is the statement that the LNP agrees with the passing of the 2021-22 uh, budget. Call the member for Nanango. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And he's got to call himself that because no one else in Queensland calls well, him the farmer's friend. The farmers, but, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker, I rise to add my contribution to this debate. Now, of course, everyone on this side of the House is most disappointed uh, with the outcome of the estimates in so many of the different hearings. But I'm really disappointed because it's obvious that this government does not seem to understand the consequences of the lack of planning for water security in this great state of ours. Now, we know the hearing was simply a protection racket for the minister and the government. We had time-wasting antics by the chair, and we do know that those Dorothy Dixes from those opposite couldn't even be answered properly by the minister uh, when he bothered to attempt to respond uh, to them. But what I would say, Madam Deputy Speaker, the rhetoric shown in the water estimates hearing was the exact same smug attitude that continues to starve Queensland of any major infrastructure projects. And also, the hearing clearly exposed the minister's role as the regional development minister is one purely of PR, and it's a role that is all show and zero substance. Now, that came out in this quite clearly. I raised the concerns about the cost-benefit analysis conducted by the state when determining a viability of a water storage infrastructure in Queensland. It was put to the minister that, given the current 30-year lifespan factored in by Labor into the full cost recovery of dam construction management, business cases are essentially set up to fail. The current method does not consider dams can do and do uh, last well over 50 years. And with new technology, new dams inevitably will last longer than that. So therefore, the cost benefit of a dam is clearly significantly higher than what is actually being forecast. But we know we've touched a nerve when the minister spent two minutes of his five just carrying on about the pork barrelling that I uncovered in the minister's electorate. So what did we hear? The budget papers show $26 million in funding for the Gladstone, um, the Gladstone electorate. Now, I, of all people in this House, do not begrudge regional funding for water projects. However, it does appear a little bit smelly when one electorate gets $26 million, but then the, between the Mount Isa Water Board, Sec Water and Sun Water, so, so what did they get? Absolutely no provision for capital grants, but yet in the member for Gladstone's electorate, he got $8.2 million in unidentified capital grants. Unidentified capital grants. Talk about barrelling by the Water Minister. But let's get to regional development. Like I say, I welcome any funding into water projects, but we do know when it comes to Paradise Dam, we also saw the debacle of the member for Bundaberg trying to justify his idiotic statement. I withdraw. Sorry, the statement, the statement on local TV where he said he said, in order to restore confidence to growers, they said, I, I quote, he will have another form of infrastructure if the capacity of Paradise Dam is to be reduced. So when questioned, the minister was unable to answer what the heavens the member for Bundaberg was going on about because the minister knows the Palaszczuk government have no plan to build another part, of, another water infrastructure to restore the water security for the people of the Bundaberg Wide Bay region. The member for Bundaberg has been caught out. The member for Gladstone has been caught out because they know 
They have let the people of Wide Bay and Queensland down. But when it comes to regional development, Order it's members. also concerning to learn that out of the entire FTEs of the department, only 7% of those employees are to do with regional development. And I might also add, shockingly, that we were able to reveal to this minister the fact that the Office of Rural and Regional Queensland is not even a function of the Minister for Regional Development. It's actually a function under the Premier because the Premier doesn't trust this minister. This is a minister that has a complete PR role. That is what this estimate's uncovered. It uncovered there is no water security, no plan for future water infrastructure and no plan for regional development in Queensland. Call the member for Gladstone. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, what an honour it was to participate in the estimates process year, having missed last year due to back surgery. The questions certainly that were asked by the LNP showed that they do no research at all. What a wasted opportunity. Their statement of reservation is as pathetic as it is predictable. Is it any wonder the people of Queensland overwhelming, re, re, overwhelmingly rejected the member for Nanango when choosing a Queensland Premier? Mr Speaker, when it comes to investing in water infrastructure, our government has an outstanding record. With $1.9 billion of investment in water infrastructure and 2,300 jobs it has supported since 2015, it's obvious that the Palaszczuk government is pro-infrastructure and pro-regions. I mean, accusations to the... Well, you haven't been to, to, uh, to Rookwood Weir, have you? Pause I the mean, clock. Comments through the chair, please. Are a bit... Pause the clock. Put your comments through the chair, please. Thank Member you, for Gladstone Deputy has the floor. Has the call. I mean, accusations to the contrary are a bit rich coming from those opposite. They didn't build anything. Despite having an opportunity to ask legitimate questions, the, minister, the, member, sorry, the minister, member for Nanango used estimates to have a crack at me personally, and she's backed it up again today. She wasted everyone's time in that committee by baselessly accusing me of rorts because the Gladstone Area Water Board spent money in the Calide electorate. Firstly, it should come as a shock to no one that the Gladstone Area Water Board spends money in the Gladstone region and, as we've heard today, in the Calide region as well. That is what Order members. established to do. I don't approve funding for the projects delivered by Glasgow Area Water Board. That is the responsibility of their board, and their expenditure is also externally reviewed by the QCA. If the member knew her shadow portfolio era, she would have known that, but obviously she didn't. Miss, Miss Deputy Speaker, there is one issue I'll never shy away from, and that's the safety and well-being of Queenslanders, unlike those opposite. What the estimates confirmed is the LNP and the member for Nanango don't care about personal safety of Queenslanders living downstream of Paradise Dam. We put safety Madam first Deputy Speaker, and listen to expert Pause advice. the clock. What Madam is Deputy Speaker. What is the, your point of order? The point of order is that the minister is misleading the House and I ask him to withdraw. Are you taking personal offence? I do take personal offence. The member for Nanango has taken personal offence. Do you withdraw? I withdraw. We put, we put safety first and we listen to expert advice. But who needs experts when you've got the LNP? Time and time again they've confirmed they would have left the dam as it was, putting thousands of lives at risk. To help the member understand, I bought part of the concrete wall in to demonstrate exactly what that danger was. But she wouldn't even look at it. It was like kryptonite to her. She didn't want to look at it. She didn't want to go near it. And, Deputy Speaker, I've been out to that dam multiple times. I've spoken with the irrigators, locals, the mayor, the local member, businesses and advocacy groups. I didn't go to a hairdresser. I didn't go and get a picture by a bottle of rum. I know how the fe people feel in that region. And that's why we, as a government, are focused on the solution. Unlike those opposite, I'm not interested in stirring up trouble and trying to divide a community. People want politicians who give them hope, especially after what we've been through with COVID-19. They don't want any more anger in that community and they don't want any more division. It, it gets Queensland nowhere and it certainly gets the LNP nowhere. Deputy Speaker, it's a privilege to get out and meet Queenslanders every week in all corners of the state as Minister for Regional Development. 
The most important part of this job is taking this information and working with responsible ministers to continue to deliver for regional Queenslanders. It's not surprising, Deputy Speaker, that the LNP don't understand this concept given their total fear of consultation with anyone. With people moving to the regions in droves, it's the Palaszczuk government that you can certainly trust on to deliver for regional Queensland. It's our government, Deputy Speaker, that makes sure that Queensland COVID's economic recovery plan is providing jobs, is providing opportunities and benefits for regional Queenslanders. What a contrast the member for Nanango's reckless antics constantly when she and her colleagues called for the borders to be opened 64 times. It would have been hard to have an economic recovery with mine sites closed, with tourist parks, sh tourist parks shut, manufacturing facilities and logistics networks grinding to a halt. I also won't be lectured by those opposite on our government's outstanding support to the Queensland manufacturers. When the LNP were briefed briefly in government, 14,700 jobs were lost in the industry. That's not a plan, that's a disaster. I thank the members of the committee for their proper questions during estimates. The LNP members, especially members Madam of the Speaker, Speaker. can learn something from them. Call the member for Gympie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the State Development Regional Industries Committee Estimates Report. During estimates, Labor committee members wasted time and ran protection to obstruct scrutiny of the minister, department and the issues. It demonstrated contempt for Queenslanders and taxpayers. People want answers about staff levels, reduced R&D funding, reduced funding to tackle red imported fire ants, labour shortages, why ag tech is being outsourced to industry, timber supply shortages caused by successive policy failures, the impacts of fishing reforms, the future of agricultural careers after the government closed the agricultural colleges and the fire sale of their assets. Queensland's budget has record, record spending, record debt and eye-watering borrowings, yet DAF is still going backwards in funding, staff and services. DAF's budget is cut by more than $64 million from what they spent last year. It, it's cut by $34 million from what they planned to spend last year. Whichever way you spin, spin it, DAF's budget is cut. There are almost 40,000 extra public servants, but DAF is going backwards in staff. DAF plans for seven less staff than they planned for last year. Despite the extra bureaucrats, they plan to have ten less than they actually had. The Minister was prepared with, ridic with a ridiculous analogy which only highlighted his ignorance. The Minister ignorantly tried to explain the cuts by quoting the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator, or the EYCI, which is the carcass or dress weight of cattle. He unwisely used an example of someone attending a cattle sale with a budget based on quotes of the carcass weight. Madam Deputy Speaker, farmers don't buy on carcass weight at a cattle sale. Meat workers buyers do. Carcass weight is after the beast has been killed. It is an indicator of the abattoir price or over the hook when it's ready to go to the butcher shop. At a store cattle sale, you buy a breeder or steer to take home, grow and fatten. Those prices have nothing to do with the EYCI. The Minister may have been better looking at the feeder steer price. No wonder agriculture is in trouble under this Minister. He doesn't understand. It's also concerning no one told him. The same Minister supported his Labor Senate colleague, Minister Ludwig's decimation of the live cattle trade in 2011. The Minister said nothing then and has learned nothing since about cattle. It cost the beef industry billions of dollars just before the onset of a significant drought and has resulted in a class action worth a billion dollars to Australian taxpayers. Ignorance is dangerous and expensive. The Minister thinks budgets are only estimates. You don't need to keep them. If a farmer borrows $50,000 from the bank, the bank lends against your budget. It won't pay if you go over. If you write a cheque for $55,000, it will be dishonoured. They won't cover it. Madam Deputy Speaker, budget and staff cuts aren't just numbers on a spreadsheet. spreadsheet. They impact service delivery. The fire and eradication program faces fears of infestation rather than eradication. Excuses of accounting adjustments are used to justify a $25.1 million in, in cuts. Cutting staff from the team that is supposed to resolve the labour shortage crisis implies that the government believes Member for Pine everything Rivers, is fine. Your interjection. This failure means Queenslanders will pay more for their fruit and vegetables until real action is taken. 
The sustainable fishing strategy, which will put many operators out of business, had no regulatory impact statement. The government couldn't answer whether any analysis has been completed on the mental health effects this will have. Construction is being impacted from a serious shortage of timber. The long-term supply chain implications were started by Labor's own failed forestry policy. Successive Labor governments have significantly reduced native timber plantings. Madam Deputy Speaker, the former Premier, Beatty, promised in the 1999 SEQ Regional Forest Agreement our long-term transition, transition to timber industry is based on plantation timber, which will set up a viable long-term hardwood timber industry for the next 50 to 100 years. I ask, was the replacement stock supposed to come from the 5,000 hectares or 10 million trees promised by former Premier Peter Beatty and former Minister Henry Palaszczuk. The commitment was never kept. The failed forestry policy is now impacting supply. Instead of addressing the policy failure, Labor committee members ran protection, claiming it is 20 years old. Trees take more than 20 years to grow. Decisions then cause problems now. To know that to not know that shows complete ignorance about the long-term implications of government policy. Estimates show that ignorance is dangerous and expensive. Call the member for Ipswich West. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in response to the estimate here in report by the State Development and Regional Industries Committee being report number 11 of the 57th uh, Queensland Parliament and tabled earlier this month. Uh, Madam Ac Acting Deputy Speaker, I would like to begin by acknowledging my fellow members of the State Development and Regional Industries Committee, the Chair, Mr Chris Whiting, Member for Bancroft, the Deputy Chair, Mr Jim MacDonald, uh, Member for Lockyer, who are all in the chamber, Committee members, uh, Mr Tom Smith, the Member for Bundaberg, Mr Michael Hart, <laughs> Member for Burley and uh, Mr Robbie Catter, the Member for Traeger. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, Committee Secretariat, Stephanie Gilbraith, and I notice she is uh, in the chamber at the moment. Um, as well as Hansard, as well as the Honourable Stephen Miles, Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure and Local Government and Planning, the Honourable Mark Ferner, Minister for Agricultural Industry Development, Fisheries and Minister for Rural Communities, and the Honourable Glenn Butcher, Minister for Regional Development and Manufacturing, Minister for Water. Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, I don't just mention their names uh, for the sake of it. I know how much effort ministers and the Secretariat and Hansard put into preparing for the, hands, uh, for the estimates hearings, and I think it's worthwhile mentioning their names. The safety problems with Paradise Dam were discussed at the hearing, and to demonstrate the lack of integrity in the dam wall at Paradise, Minister Butcher produced a concrete core sample cut from the dam wall that clearly showed a fracture in the concrete. As the minister said, the core, core sample clearly demonstrated why works were required to make the dam safe uh, not just for the dam itself, but for the residents of Bundaberg who would suffer should the dam collapse. I was also pleased to hear the Minister's response to questions from the member for Nanango uh, concerning manufacturing in Queensland, where the Minister advised the, the, the committee that the government had committed $1 billion to rail manufacturing pipeline, which included $600 million to build 20 new passenger trains here in Queensland supporting service delivery following the opening of Cross River Rail. Uh, while these new Queensland trails are being built in uh, Meribah, a member for Nenango, uh, it opens up the possibility of regional manufacturing opportunities to supply com components for the manufacture of not only these trains but for the maintenance of existing rolling stock. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, recently a heads of agreement was signed by Bradkin Industries to transfer title of their Caribbean foundry in Ipswich to White, White Industries, which is a foundry based in Dolby. Uh, I recently met with Craig White, the chief executive of White Industries, who informed me of the White Industries' purchase of the Bradkin site at Caribbean. White Industries is a family-run business which has operated in Dolby since the 1960s, so it's great to see a Queensland company taking over the massive Bradkin site. Fabricating metal products is White Industries' core activity, so I'm sure they'll make full use of the foundry located at the Bad Bradkin site. Ipswich has a proud history of foundry work and metal fabrication for railways, as well as the mining and agricultural sectors. So I'm looking forward to working with uh, White Industries to help them secure work for both, from both the state government and private industry. Uh, subsequent to the uh, conclusion of the estimates hearing, I wrote 
to um, Minister Butcher and advised him I was pleased to hear of his comments at the estimates hearing on July 28 with regard to the $1 billion rail manufacturing pipeline and the $600 million allocated for 20 trains to be built in Maribara. I advised that I noted the uh, Palaszczuk government's commitment to ensure components to manufacture these trains would be sourced in Queensland from Queensland manufacturers and suppliers. I advised him that Bradkin Industries is a large Ipswich-based foundry in, located in the western suburbs of Ipswich, which is currently recently acquired by White Industries. I also informed the minister that in the past the Bradkin foundry was a major supplier of heavy metal cast components and until recently had a spur line connecting it with the uh, western line. It was my hope that White Industries could reinvigorate the foundry, which previously employed over 500 workers, to supply products for those trains in, to be built in Maribar. And I also invited the minister, when White Industries took possession of the uh, Bradkin site in October, to come and visit uh, the Bradkin site and speak with its new owners. In closing, again, I'd like to thank the Deputy Premier, Minister Ferner, Minister Butcher, and once again thank the Committee Secretary at Hansard and my fellow committee members. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Lockyer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege I have to raise and speak on our committee process through estimates, and I'd like to place on record my thanks to our Secretariat and committee for the work and preparation, and also our team of advisers uh, for their preparations of the questions in notice, as well as the uh, many of the questions for our shadow uh, ministers. <laughs> Um, I would like to place on record for the Parliament that the member for Burley, who is in the House, with he, uh, has raised an issue with me months ago and that he intends for all future meetings of our committee to be able to move that the minutes of our committee be made public at all future meetings. Um, this budget uh, was one which honest Queenslanders expected more from the Labor government. With small and family businesses going to the wall, it was the Labor government was expected to step up and they just simply didn't. With the health system in crisis, Queenslanders deserve solutions to fix ambulance rampering and the un ever-growing surgery, surgery wait lists. With young criminals running rampant through Queensland, they expected action to keep their family and possessions safe. With double-income families struggling to buy or rent a home, Queenslanders expected action to take to release more land. What they received was a budget without announced funds and with four billion cuts to vital infrastructure spending which could have stimulated additional jobs. They fell well short. Once again, the estimates hearing had a lot of time wasted, and I recognise there was some reasonable time allocated in non-government questions, but we, what we saw was constant interruptions and irrelevant points of order from government MPs that actually derailed that time that we had. And what it didn't allow is a free-flowing set of questions and answers from ministers, which is what budget estimates is about. And I support the opposition leader and our leadership team for their call for urgent reform to the process. During the questioning, the LNP uncovered that the best practice industry conditions, which the government promotes as a labour safety and skills development program is actually, and we support that, but it's actually a deal to see unions benefit. And what is concerning to industry is that the additional costs, up to 30 per cent, on projects that we've seen. Now, we did see in the Townsville Stadium blow out by $40 million through this best practice industry conditions. The original cost was $250 million, which blew out to $293 million. Now, it wasn't up to the 30 per cent, as some industry experts said, but it was certainly very high, near 20 per cent. Now, with the future in infrastructure required to the lead-up to the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, this union deal raises concern, and we are certainly concerned at the extraordinary cost blowouts that these projects may occur. Now, my local uh, governments, the Lockyer Valley and Somerset Regional Councils, fear that in regards to the waste payments that are not included past the 21-22 financial year, that this will be an additional tax on local government that they will be required to pass on to our residents, and that's just not acceptable. In my time remaining, Madam Deputy Chair, I just want to place um, on record and highlight a huge concern for our region, and that is the National Red Imported Firearm 
fire ant eradication program. I note there was a significant reduction of $25.1 million allocated to the program this year. Now, this is about eradicating red fire ants. Now, the table that was provided at question five in the question on notice outlined that the number of detections have increased during 19 through to 2001 from 6,100 to 8,600 with the projected increase of up to 12,000 sites. Now, at the moment, that's 6,500 at the 16th of July. This is a huge concern for our community, and it does not give a lot of confidence to the community. Now, I recognise in the locket the number of detections has dropped. From 17, there were 58, and we saw six so far this year. But no more important program could we see for agriculture and the industry and our whole social well-being in South East Queensland than that national red uh, fire ant program. It's about eradicating fire ants. At the present point in time, my community has not got the confidence that that will occur, and I want to work with the government to see programs delivered to see that eradication take place. Speaker. Call the member for Bundaberg. Oh, Speaker, how good is it to once again stand in the House and talk about the strong health response to COVID-19 that is delivering a strong economic recovery plan by the Palaszczuk Labor government once again. Because when it comes to keeping Queenslanders safe, when it comes to creating more jobs in Queensland, when it comes to creating more regional jobs for regional Queenslanders, it's the Palaszczuk Labor government that is delivering day in and day out. And didn't we see it during the, the estimates process? Didn't we just see how much our government is investing back into Queensland and investing back into regional Queensland. And let me tell you, the electorate of Bundaberg, the whole Bundaberg region, is absolutely leading the way when it comes to that investment back into our regional jobs. Of all of the investments that this budget has delivered for Queenslanders, we are seeing that in Bundaberg. We're seeing that through more housing being constructed. That's through the Housing Construction Jobs Program, the Works for Tradies Program. More people getting back into work through our Palaszczuk Labor government projects. More young people being skilled both on the job and at TAFE as well. Investment into our roads. The work done on the ISIS highway is outstanding so far. In fact, I've got constituents coming up, up to me, up to me at the market saying, Tom, when we drive along that stretch of road, we feel like going in and out of the lanes. That's how smooth it feels right now. It's fantastic. Our Works for Queensland projects, Works for Queensland projects, we have created over 3,000 jobs in the Bundaberg region by working with the Bundaberg Regional Council on those projects. And some of those great projects are key social infrastructure projects, looking after our young people, looking after our young families, the new skate park that's being constructed as we speak, and Boreham Park as well, which I was lucky enough to open up with the member for Pine Rivers and the Mayor Jack Dempsey as well. Fantastic social infrastructure. And I was there on Saturday, I held my mobile office. Held my mobile office there, and the parents were coming up saying, Tom, what a great investment. Member for Nanango, Sea Street Injection. Even had a couple of the kids coming up grabbing the Tom Smith Bundaberg hats as well. They loved it. It was outstanding. Good local kids enjoying a local project. And of course, we had the Deputy Premier speak at the estimates, and I was lucky enough to have him come up last week on the Wednesday, and we went out to Farm Fresh Fine Foods, which is a fantastic organisation, great local business run by an iconic local family. So to Janelle, Andrew and Luke Jerry, who, for, who took us around, showed us what the new project's going to do. It's going to ex expand their, uh, their product, but what it's also going to do is create 24 extra local jobs in our community. And they're also the same family that run Macadamia's Australia, which is investing into that agritourism space, again, with great support from the Palaszczuk Labor government, to create more jobs, and that's what this government's all about. And when we talk about jobs, let's talk about the Bundaberg East flood levy, something that will create just under 700 jobs. But there's one man stopping it, the LNP federal member for Hinkler, who refuses to throw any support, any support to the project, to the point where he's starting to mislead the community. So let's go through what the federal LNP have. They have a $4 billion fund for emergency response funds around disasters such as flooding. Where does it flood? It floods in Bundaberg. We know that. So why will the federal government not help out the people of Bundaberg with some of that $4 billion? Now, all we're asking is $42 million from the federal government over three years. 
the federal member for Hinkler is saying, oh, you're asking for 85 per cent of the 50 million allocation each financial year. No, we're not. We're asking for seven million dollars in the first year. Seven million dollars in the first year. Now, seeing how he likes to throw out percentages, I went, I grabbed the abacus, I went through a calculator, maybe did some Google as well, and I found what the percentages were. So the total cost of the project that we're asking for contribution from the Feds, 42.5 million of four billion dollars equals 1.0625 per cent. He cannot even get us one per cent of a four billion dollar fund. Now what about the first year cost? Seven point five million dollars. Seven point five million dollars out of a four billion dollar fund. Zero point one eight seven five. The federal member for Hinkler cannot even get out of a four billion dollar fund one per cent. Can't even get one per cent for the people that he and I both represent. Why will he not come to the party, help protect 600 job, uh, properties, help protect our local schools, help protect our sporting communities and our organisations, and stand up for the people that we both represent? Federal Member for Hinkler, let's work together, let's get this done. I support the bill wholeheartedly, and well done to the Chair for a fair and balanced running of the estimates procedure. Uh, Madam Speaker. Call the Member for Madam Traeger. Madam Speaker, thank you. I uh, rise to speak to your appropriation bill. Like, first at the outset, I'd say um, from my time here in, in Parliament there has been a decline in the quality of the estimates hearings and I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that, that works out but um, the main factor for me was that when I first got here um, and despite any other problems I'd have with the way things were done, I always felt ministers were sweaty under the collar and, and left the estimates um, as fairly stressful. And I just don't get that same sense now. And, and the government could turn that around and say that's the competency of the non-government, but I think that's been a bit unfair. Um, I, well, um, I'll take that direct criticism, of, and, um, but I, I try pretty hard to put some questions forward that are really important questions to be an answered by the government. And I really think the government would benefit from giving good answers, whether people agree with them or not, um, so that people can make a, a, a good decision from observers as to what the government's position is or, uh, and where they stand. I think, I think in the long term uh, the government would benefit from that, whether I like the answer or not. But I think avoiding these questions doesn't do anyone any good. And I'm finding it very difficult, uh, no matter how clever I think I am, to try and make it concise. And um, it, it, it is just getting harder and harder to get a straight answer from the government. And, um, perhaps it's operate error from my end, but I, 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 but I don't think it is. So I'll just make that observation from where I sit, and, and I think the public loses out of that. I, I don't think in the long term the government will win. My first question in there was about the Olympic Games, and uh, as obs you know, I, I, when I go around, I make a joke um, in, in when I visit small western towns and say, "Do you think, you know, don't worry, you're going to get a huge benefit of the Olympic Games when they come?" And they laugh because they know. Um, they don't see how they get any benefit out of that. And so therefore we called upon the government to say, well, can, we're happy if you want to have the Olympic Games and you see the benefit of, of it, but it's very hard for us to see how that's not going to dig into otherwise opportunities for us to get hold of resources to develop our areas. And um, we didn't uh, get any response from that and the government. The next question I asked was about the um, increasing, increasing demand uh, royalties in the North West. A very fundamental question, which uh, it's the second or third time I've asked the question in the House and never got a direct answer. Now, um, for us to reflect on that, North West Minerals Province is three to four billion dollars value to the economy. Uh, the, st the State Treasury should have a view on whether royalties are going to increase or decrease from that area. You'd hope they would. Um, I, I certainly would expect that they would, and I know that there is a view of some in Treasury that there is no future in the North West. Now, I know there's um, ministers and politicians that do disagree with that, but that uh, still it doesn't, uh, that still means that the Treasury uh, doesn't mean that they don't think like that. And that's going to impact on decisions that are made of things like copper string. So it's an important question to answer. But again, we get no answer on that. Um, we wanted to see something on the gas reserve policy. I want a response to that to say, well, in, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, without casting judgment on anyone at the time who made decisions around this, do we think that was a successful policy? No, in my view, clearly it wasn't. But we can't get an answer on that. Again, 
that would be useful to the public to watch this and say, make an informed judgment and say, OK, well, perhaps that policy, we should change direction. But you can't get a, a straight answer on these things. Uh, the other thing uh, I, ans I asked was around Rex Airlines, who um, there's a lot of dispute. They're going for retender again. And, and it was brought to my attention that there was a person out of Rex Airlines was pulled out of called Danny, Danny Foster, who got employed to monitor the performance of Rex in, those, in that route that they're now tendering for. And that was shut down. We couldn't get a straight answer after asking twice. So I used all my questions up just on that single, very specific question. And um, we were told, well, Danny Foster doesn't work in that department anymore. I said, yeah, but did he ever work in monitoring that performance? And we never got an answer on that. It's a pretty simple question uh, to ask. Therefore, I see a failure there in this process. Um, police and firearms, whether you, it doesn't matter what side of the fence you fall on this issue, it's a big issue. And I can guarantee there's a lot of angry people out there that just want some fairness in the process and some, and some rigour around the test for a fit and proper person and get rid of all the subjectivity that's coming through um, basically ill-qualified people making judgment calls on per whether a person fit and proper person to maintain a firearm. We just want some straight answers. Instead, it ends up saying, well, there's, no, there's been no problem there at all and there's no increase. That doesn't help anyone. Uh, you're not fixing problems if you're not going to answer questions. We might like the answers, but um, you've, you've got to maintain the integrity of the process. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member Speaker. for Burley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, this government tells us that they're open, accountable and transparent. They're hardly that. And as the member for Maroochydore said earlier today, uh, you can see that by the minutes of the committee meetings that aren't published on the committee's website. Now, I made a conscious decision as a member for member, that Member, the debate time for... Move a motion to move a motion at every committee meeting. Member, I'll ask you to resume your seat. Unfortunately, the debate time has expired. Um, <laughs> the question is that the report of the State Development and Regional Industries Committee be adopted. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the report of the Education, Employment and Training Committee be... Oh, no. Yeah, be adopted. I call the member for... Redlands, where is she? No. <laughs> Call the member for Mogul. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. As the uh, Liberal National Party Shadow Minister for Education, I rise to address the Appropriation Bill 2021-2022 uh, budget estimates hearings uh, that were held uh, on the proposed expenditure by the Palaszczuk State Labor Government um, as examined by the Education, Employment and Training Committee. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this year's uh, Queensland State Budget has an allocation of $15.3 billion for the provision of education, including uh, childhood education in Queensland. Uh, Deputy Speaker, what was clearly evident uh, during the Education, Employment and Training Committee hearings is that the Palaszczuk State Labor Government uh, is losing control. Disturbingly and cri critically, uh, Madam Speaker, Labor is losing control of teacher uh, and student safety in our schools. Uh, Deputy Speaker, Queensland students, parents, teachers and school staff have every right to expect that when they enter a Queensland State School or Department of Education facility uh, that they are entering a safe learning and work environment. Deputy Speaker, the manner in which the Palaszczuk State Labor Government has treated the significant exposure asbestos incidents at Sunnybank uh, State High School should concern every uh, parent and teacher in Queensland. Uh, in March uh, of this uh, year, Deputy Speaker, when I questioned uh, the Labor Minister for Education about the handling of this a uh, serious in incident, the Minister said, and I quote, everything has been done according to the manner in which you deal with the serious issue of asbestos because that is the way that we deal uh, with these issues on this, this side of the House, uh, end quote. However, as per the RTI documents obtained uh, by the Liberal National Party, it took a full 17 days from when staff at Sunnybank State High School raised concerns about an asbestos exposure incident to when finally a professional clean-up crew and hygienist uh, were dispatched to clean and test more than 30 rooms. Uh, and that was uh, 17 days, Deputy Speaker, in which students and teachers uh, were in a learning and workplace environment where asbestos exposure had occurred uh, because of the Palaszczuk State Labor Government and the way uh, that it fails to ensure that our schools adhere to Department of Education uh, asbestos management policies uh, and protocols. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, as the uh, Labor Minister for Education knows only too well, there is simply no level of asbestos exposure that is safe and to know that there have been 19 school asbestos exposure incidents related to Labor's uh, Cooler Cleaner Schools program, 12 of which were serious enough to be notifiable events, uh, this again raises uh, genuine concerns about student, teacher and staff uh, safety in our schools. 
Uh, further, our Deputy Speaker has revealed through the Liberal National Party's questioning that the Department of Education uh, is unable to provide specific and comprehensive data when it comes to violence and workplace uh, safety incidents in Queensland schools. Deputy Speaker, if the Palaszczuk State Labor Government is truly committed to uh, student and teacher safety and wellbeing, then surely capturing complete data of such incidents can assist in developing better strategies to deliver uh, a safer working and learning environment. Uh, and Deputy Speaker, uh, you simply can't fix uh, what you don't measure comprehensively. Deputy Speaker, uh, just as the 2020-2021 estimates hearings for the education uh, portfolio demonstrated, there is an absolute lack of government leadership, accountability and transparency, uh, coupled, with, coupled with departmental cultural issues that remains uh, unaddressed by the State Labor Government uh, and continues to cost uh, Queensland taxpayers each and every day. And nowhere is this more clearly evident than the ongoing saga of the selection process of a school a principal at the Brisbane South State Secondary College and the ongoing delay of a satisfactory resolution for senior depart, uh, departmental uh, education executive staff and the taxpayers of Queensland. Uh, Deputy Speaker, during estimates I also took the opportunity to ask uh, where in the 2021-2022 state budget there is a specific allocation of funding for a new uh, school hall at Kenmore State High School. Uh, and not uh, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, uh, Deputy Speaker, as with previous Labor state budgets, there is again no funding for a new school hall facility at Kenmore State High School, meaning uh, students, families and staff are not receiving the vital infrastructure needed to support uh, the entire school community. Deputy Speaker, this is despite the fact that uh, over many years the School Council, PNC uh, and School Executive have worked uh, diligently on these matters to ensure that such infrastructure is included uh, in their school strategic infrastructure plan, uh, which is formally submitted to the Department of Education. Uh, finally, Deputy Speaker, the health, safety and wellbeing of our students and staff must be a priority of the Palaszczuk State Labor Government. Uh, the growing impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on the mental health of all Queenslanders, particularly students and young Queenslanders, presents a significant public health challenge that requires urgent intervention and additional financial uh, support from the Queensland State uh, Labor Government. And as recently highlighted in the 2021-2022 Advocacy and Policy Priorities submission to the Queensland State Government uh, by the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, uh, our State of Queensland requires an additional significant investment of $700 million uh, per year into the system. And I take this opportunity to implore the Palaszczuk State Labor Government to provide additional support for the mental health of all Queenslanders. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Redlands. Deputy Speaker, I rise to move the Education, Employment and Training Committee's report 2020-2021 budget estimates. The committee made one recommendation that the proposed expenditure be agreed to. Um, it was again a, very, a day full of colour and movement and um, done in a very COVID safe environment. So can I take this opportunity to thank the attendants on the day that worked very hard to make sure that we're all kept safe. And can I also thank our Secretariat staff that did a lot of hard work um, in the background to make sure that the day was a success. Um, the areas, um, th these areas continue to be the, the focus of our Palaszczuk government. It's focusing on jobs now and jobs into the future. Um, the vital, vital funding that ensures all Queenslanders have a bright future ahead. In the small business and skills and training, can I thank Mr. Minister Farmer and her staff for their comprehensive um, overview of all of the work that's being done, particularly as we um, economically recover from the impacts of COVID. Um, it continues to disrupt our small business, and it was noted during the estimates process discussion around um, preparedness for future lockdowns, and we have since then experienced that lockdown and see how quickly and agile we've been in our response to being able to provide really great packages of support for small businesses right the way across Queensland. Um, the big, big plans for small business was also um, covered in detail, the $140 million plan. That's some um, fantastic work again by a Palaszczuk government. We also heard about the small business roadshows that the ministers conducted right the way across the country and how informative they've been and how much of a part they've had to play in inputting into the design of how the budget is spent. We also um, heard in terms of our TAFE investment and our skilling Queenslanders for work being two very key pieces um, in our skills and training. In the education and um, IR and racing, again, a record investment, $15 billion um, in infrastructure, maintenance, and investment in our schools, investment in our children's future. 
I know out in the Redlands, air conditioning and solar is, being, is, being, is nearly finalised for all of our schools. That's fantastic. And I know the local schools and local jobs, um, the halls programs and the maintenance work is doing fantastic work, and particularly um, for Capalaba, they're getting a new hall down there. And also we have to um, commend the work that's being done um, within, within, within the budget at looking at students' mental health and wellbeing and the programs around implementing GPs and homework hubs, all very, very important programs to make sure that we position all of our kids for success as they, as they move through the education process. Um, in terms of um, industrial relations, we're also doing some work that um, is very, uh, that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Um, we've had a renewed focus on gender equality and improving women's economic security arising from the Australian Human Rights Commission's landmark respect at work. Um, it was the National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. And since the release of the Respect at Work report, the Palaszczuk government has announced a five-year five review of the Queensland Industrial Relations Act 2016 that we heard about, and the Queensland Human Rights Commission um, are undertaking a review of the Anti-Discrimination Act 1991. Um, these, are the, these are really important programs, and it was quite interesting to read the LNP's um, dissenting report. Um, within that, uh, the, the third point in the conclusion, I have to say, actually, the dissenting report was pretty light on, but it said, finally, workplaces should be, um, should be a safe environment devoid of harassment and intim intimidation and coercion. When reputable media ag agencies publish articles about workplace intimidation, these allegations should be investigated. And I sort of find that extraordinarily ironic on the day when the LNP's very own federal member for Bowman, Mr Lamming, uh, wants to give me another go in the Courier Mail today. And I'll, I'll table that article for the benefit of the House. I think, you know, you want to look in your own backyard first and tidy up that before you start, before you start having a go. Before, you know, about harassment in this workplace. This is a workplace too. So, um, the conclusion also talked about the, um, the, hearing, the, the hearings estimate and left many questions. And I look at the time frame that we, we had um, across the course of the day, the non-government side were given over 60 per cent of the time. It was, it, was, it was a fair and it was a reasonable amount of time to ask the questions that needed to be answered. And quite frankly, in the second paragraph where it said, um, you know, that they didn't, they didn't feel like there was reassurance from the departments, well, that's certainly not what I heard from all of, the, all of the officials that attended on the day. They answered the questions. They were happy to provide follow-up. And in fact, we, we, had, um, we had nothing taken on notice throughout the course of the day because the answers were so comprehensive from the ministers and from the DG. So on behalf of the committee, I thank everybody that was involved in the day. I think it was robust, and I think we got a, you know, a really good interrogation of the budget for uh, education and small Speaker. business. Speaker. Um, Member for McConnell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Wait your turn. Um, I commend the Education, Employment and Training Committee for budget set. Order, oh, members. Order. Just listen to them. It's like, sorry. Last time I checked, the Speaker retains the right to make the call. If you want to have an opinion or move a dissenting motion on that, you're welcome to do it. I call the member for McConnell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And listen to them. They're, you know, they're worse than kids in the classroom, honestly and truly. If they would only grow up, it would be very good, Deputy Speaker. I commend the Education, Employment and Training Committee for Budget Estimates Report. I want to acknowledge the work of the Chair and the Member for Redlands, who did an excellent job, and the members of this committee, along with the clerk and the parliamentary staff. Speaker, the 21-22 budget is delivering another record education budget, with a $15.3 billion investment in schools and early education. Importantly, as the Queensland Government seeks to rebuild our economy, we're spending almost $1.9 billion in schools in this financial year, including 10 schools in 23 and 24, as well as supporting over 4,000 jobs for the state. Um, these schools add to the 18 we have already delivered, and I look forward to um, delivering those schools and the other schools which are first rate and most certainly are state of the art. The budget also features a $235 million halls program, which will deliver new and upgraded halls at 37 schools, supporting 775 jobs. And it's always interesting to hear those opposite. You know, they go on about a hall in their electorate or whatever. They didn't go to the election with one hall, with one infrastructure um, 
discussion at all. Um, and um, now there was no plan. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Mr. Pause the clock. Speaker. Resume your seat. Uh, member for Nanango, what is your point the of order? The member for McConnell is misleading the House. I take personal offence and I ask the Minister to withdraw because she knows full well that Kilcoy State High School all right. Hall was Member, resume your seat. Election. I've taken your point of order. Member will resume your seat. Uh, the taking of a point of order is not an opportunity to debate. Uh, personal offence has been taken. The members ask you withdraw. I ask the minister withdraw. I withdraw. Um, but we went with a $235 million halls program, and I don't recall any comprehensive halls program. Maybe one here, maybe one there, but no comprehensive halls program. And let's see them take offence over that one. And we are upgrading training facilities at 27 schools as well. Um, we have Order an members. opposition um, um, spokesperson on education, the member for Mogul, talking about student and wellbeing, saw nothing in their program, a $100 million student and wellbeing pro program is what we are rolling out and we're already employing those specialists in schools. A GP program in schools, we want to trial 20, we've got 50 and we're looking to see what we can do to help that mental health and wellbeing. Homework centres at 120 primary schools, all the applications are in, we're rolling it out, helping those students to, um, in, um, in primary and high schools to get across their homework and to do better at school. And it was great to visit Dara and to see that um, homework centre in action and those little kiddies loving every single second of it. Employing 6,190 new teachers, 1,135 new teacher aides and $20 million to help us boost our teaching profession. And I know the member for Bundaberg and other ex-teachers and principals in this place very much welcome that. And that's our $20 million turn to teaching program where we'll offer internships and we'll guarantee 300 people a job after they undertake that. We've included extra money for early childhood education and care, and can I say that um, it is excellent what we are delivering here in education. Look, we have responded, Deputy Speaker, time and time again to the questions with regards to asbestos, and no one takes asbestos more seriously than this side of the House. And no matter how many times, whether it's your estimates, whether it's in this House, how many times we answer the same question questions over and over again. They only hear what they want to hear, but they don't hear the truth. In racing, it's an incredible provision for them. We are delivering around $41.3 million over two years, with a 35 per cent guaranteed point of consumption tax now going back into the industry, and um, we will be ensuring that that's invested in local infrastructure, in prize money, and I know the racing industry has welcomed this with open arms. In industrial relations, we have a proud record with some of the best industrial laws in the state, and leading industrial relations, industrial manslaughter laws, health and safety laws, wage theft laws, and the list goes on and on. And it's almost getting to the point these days where the opposition spokesperson person in industrial relations is almost harassing the public servants um, who do their hard work. Not one of the allegations raised by the member for Kiwana has been substantiated, and I feel for Helen Burgess. Order, member. He keeps writing about and has had not one case substantiated that has been raised by those opposite. Trespass charges against union officials thrown out of court and upheld by the Supreme Court. Right of entry disputes between ENCO and the CFMEU dismissed in the first instance. ENCO has been fined and they've had incredible fines because of the manner in which they um, injured their workers. They are the truth. That is the way it works. And yet we get nothing from those offers but baseless allegations. Speaker. I call the member for Butterham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to address the Education, Employment and Training Committee report into the budget estimates process. This is the latest budget that fails small business and it fails our communities. Small and family businesses are the engine room of the Queensland economy and small and family businesses are the backbone of communities right across Queensland. The Treasurer has acknowledged that Queensland small businesses, and I quote, bore the brunt of the COVID-19 downturn. Despite this acknowledgement, Labor again decided to ignore them in this budget. In fact, the budget courageously ignored the impact of COVID-19 and was built on an assumption that there will be no significant lockdowns across Queensland. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's ironic that much of Queensland was in fact in lockdown on the 1st of July when this budget came into effect. In fact, since the 1st of July, we've seen further lockdowns across much of Queensland, which just highlights that the budget was built 
on a very thin foundation indeed. Deputy Speaker, as was demonstrated during the estimates process, and I hear the chirping from the Minister for Education over there who likes alternative facts and isn't prepared to address the truth when she comes in here. She likes to repeat alternative facts and falsehoods because she can't get her facts straight. Chirp away, chirp away. Mr Deputy Speaker, as demonstrated during the estimates process, it is clear that despite the obvious looming threats from COVID-19 and the potential for future lockdowns, this Labor state government had completed no planning or preparation at all. The impact of recent lockdowns on small and family businesses has been writ large over recent weeks as businesses in the seat of McConnell go under while many others fight to keep the doors open. Businesses down the road in the seat of McConnell going under, but the Minister for Education, the member for McConnell, doesn't care. OK, Deputy for Speaker. Pause the, pause the clock. Member will resume his seat. What's your point of order? Order, members. I'll take Member the point of order in two. silence. First of all, the point of order that I take um, offence to and ask that it be withdrawn. And the second one about glass straw, I take offence and I ask that to be withdrawn as well. The minister has taken personal offence and asked to be withdrawn. I should withdraw. I'll withdraw twice, Mr Deputy Speaker. You have the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The state government's failure to plan for such a scenario is appalling. Mr Deputy Speaker, during estimates I asked if any modelling had been undertaken in relation to the impact that lockdowns were having on small and family yeah, businesses. The answer? None. None. It's not good enough. The Minister for Small Business either does not care about the impact on small businesses or she is incapable of winning the argument around the Cabinet table to get support for small business. Which is it? She should come in here. She should come in here today, Mr Deputy Speaker, and she should tell the 450,000 small business owners and their employees which it is. Is it that she doesn't care or is it that she's ineffectual? If the minister did care and she did have influence, then we would have seen a small business support package in place before Queensland went into lockdown. As it is, applications for the $1,000 grants for sole traders only opened today nearly a month after the government announced their already woefully inadequate and late package. When the Treasurer announced the COVID business support grants, he said, and I quote, we need to set up the process for the applications to be considered and dealt with by government. We're looking to set up the, process, the processing administrative process for this within two weeks, end quote. He went on to say, we've looked at that very carefully inside government and we aim to get the application process going within two weeks, end quote. Well, after standing up in front of the people of Queensland and telling him that he would get applications started within two weeks, what happened? He failed. The Treasurer failed. He failed to deliver yet again. It is the latest in a long line of failures by this government. And that's just for applications to start, Mr Deputy Speaker. How many small and family businesses have received funds in their bank account yet? The answer? Not many. Small and family businesses across Queensland deserve to know what support the state Water government members. will provide when we go Water. into the next lockdown. The next lockdown in the seat of McConnell. Or the one after that. Which is it? How much money is going to be on the table for small and family businesses in the next lockdown member for, Con for McConnell? You're around the Cabinet table. Speak up. It's time for that information now, not after the next lockdown when businesses are dealing with the uncertainty that comes from a lockdown. Businesses need certainty and this government is failing them on that count. In the short time I've got left, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to address the government's social enterprise job fund, which was announced in last year's budget. Eight million dollars and it's stuck in neutral. Of the three million dollars in grants in that fund, exactly zero dollars have been distributed to social enterprises at the time of the estimates hearing. In relation to the remaining five million in the fund, the committee was advised that it will be spent, and I quote, developing the sustainability of this emerging sector. No details were disclosed on what that means, how the money will be spent, or any measurable outcomes for the social enterprise sector. Like so many Labor policy proposals, the State Government's Social Enterprise Job Fund is heavy on photo op, but light on, follow light on follow up. Mr Deputy Speaker, this State Government is failing small and family Deputy businesses, Speaker. and Queensland's small and family expired. businesses deserve better. Time's expired. Resume your seat. Uh, call the member for Stafford. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to endorse the committee report for the 2021 estimates for our portfolio committee. And as I've said uh, here before, 
one of the core cool driving motivations for my involvement in our great party, um, and then of course in putting my hand up for public uh, office, is the power of education and training. It gave me my good start in life, and I work every day to give opportunities to others in our communities so that they can uh, have their lives improved as well. This is a government that recognises the fundamental power of education and training to change people's lives. And that was made abundantly clear by both Minister Grace and Minister Farmer during our estimates committee hearings. And for me, it was heartening to hear the investment in education and training uh, and TAFE right across the state and, of course, local services and projects in my electorate of Stafford. The Education Minister outlined some of the many important school upgrades across Stafford, including the $250,000 for the outdoor learning area at Kedron State School. And Minister, you can rest assured I've already been out there with the principal looking at designs and early planning work just to get that project delivered. Just as I've met with the Wilson State School principal and PNF, PNC, uh, where we're delivering new hall, Wavell State School where we've delivered new hall, up, uh, a hall upgrade, and Somerset Hills where we are investing in new sporting infrastructure. That's not to mention the half a million dollars for the refurbishment of science rooms at Kedron State High School um, and more than $650,000 across the electorate for maintenance and minor works that helps all of our local schools. I'd like to thank the Chair, the Member for Redlands, um, for her calm and very fair chairing of the hearings. Um, more than fair, I should say. In fact, I think the figures are that the non-government members enjoyed something like 60 per cent of uh, time for questions. Um, but despite being given significantly more time than government MPs, shadow ministers couldn't land a blow. One after the other, they filed through the committee but couldn't actually formulate a decent line of questioning. Perhaps best illustrated by the member for Everton, who complained that one of my questions was too similar to his. Without any sense of irony or self-awareness, the member for Everton proudly declared publicly that the veracity of his questioning amounted to a dixer. What type of intellectual rigour are those opposite bringing to the estimates process if, by their own words, they are asking ministers dixes? But don't worry, we were there to step up. Minister Farmer was able to talk about her recent visit to the Multicultural Centre at Newmarket, where we saw powerful stories, one after the other, of young people, many of them recent migrants to Australia, benefiting greatly from the government's partnership through the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. Um, importantly, as the Minister explained, um, for many of these people, uh, the jobs that are enabled through this training is their first source of independent income, which is so powerful, uh, for, particularly for the young women. Um, I know those opposite don't really like to talk about skill and Queenslanders for work, and I get it. It's hard to talk about such a fantastic program when those opposite axed it. And then, even, even in their opposition years, promised at election after election to cut it again. Um, well, I'm happy to talk about the Skill and Queenslanders for Work impact in my electorate uh, and right across the state. Another fantastic example is um, where Skill and Queenslanders for Work provides jobs uh, for local tradies and for um, upcoming apprentices through local sporting organisations. I know the member for Nun uh, Nudgee uh, has a similar program um, where local it's a win-win-win. Um, it's a great program for the apprentices coming through uh, and delivers great results for uh, community um, sporting, uh, sporting clubs. Um, it's a fantastic program. Uh, and again, proud that we can um, deliver that uh, as part of our Skill in Queensland's work program. Uh, finally, in the short time I have left, can I thank the, uh, again thank the Chair for her fantastic um, leadership of the committee. Um, I think more broadly our committee does work uh, in a fairly um, cooperative way with opposition and uh, crossbench uh, members. I thank them for that work often behind the scenes. Um, can I thank the attendance on the day? Um, as the Chair said, it was pretty tricky circumstances, but we got through it. Uh, to both ministers, their officers, their directors general um, and other important staff bodies who were there, including TAFE Queensland, thank you for the comprehensive and very informative engagement that they provided on the day. Um, as the Chair has pointed out, not a single question, I believe, was taken on notice because there were fulsome um, answers provided and there were um, uh, extensive time provided, uh, as we've said, 60 per cent for non-government members. It was a comprehensive process um, and I endorse the, uh, the report to the House. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the member for evidence. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. I rise to um, enter the debate as the Shadow Minister for Racing. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, if there's any more example that we need of mismanagement of the racing industry, of course it is the Eagle Farm Racetrack. Yeah. Eagle Farm Racetrack, over the last seven years, I think, has had around $14 million spent on it. 
Uh, it was uh, out of action for uh, an extended period of time. Our iconic state leading race course that was not available uh, because of the mismanagement of this Labor government with regards to the track. Now, this track has been a nightmare since the Labor Party has uh, tried to upgrade it, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's been report after report, anecdotal reports, because you know, the industry is very afraid to speak out. They always worry about repercussions. They always worry about if they speak too heavily against the government, it will affect their future funding. So we hear these anecdotal reports all the time about their concerns, about the safety of the track, the quality of the track, interstate trainers not wanting to come up here and bring their horses, uh, local trainers not wanting to do that as well. And so uh, I asked questions of the Minister about this, and, and she proudly boasted on how fantastic the track is, how everybody comes up to her all the time and tells her uh, how happy they are with the track. Uh, I tell you what, she must mix with a very limited group of people that have been commenting that way, because lo and behold, just a couple of weeks after these estimates hearings, where the Minister said everybody's happy with the track, there's no problems with the track, that they had a crisis meeting, that stakeholders had a crisis meeting with Racing Queensland. And this is, this, they said the meeting was not bad. They said it was a pretty good meeting. But this is very interesting from the Australian Trainers Association and their representative Cameron Parkington said, we are very pleased that Racing Queensland uh, finally have finally acknowledged that the track needs to be fixed. They've finally acknowledged that. So despite what the minister says, the track needs to be fixed Fortunately, it doesn't need to be dug up again, but uh, it needs work on it. They've admitted that race in Queensland, and that seems to, that will happen over the next um, short period of time, and hopefully we'll get to the stage where this track can be returned to be the premier track uh, in our state, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, there was a couple of other issues as well. Uh, Curic, Curic, thank you. I'll take that uh, interjection from the member for uh, interjection from the member for Mermaid Beach, uh, a, a keen racing uh, fan. Curic is something that I don't think anybody in the industry thinks is going well, and I think it's 30 million dollars that's been invested in Curic, which compared to the other states is nearly double that investment. And this is again the minister will go and uh, defend Curic and uh, how well the uh, the industry supports it. Well, in the government's own papers. Only 59% of stakeholders have confidence in Curie. Only 59% of people have confidence in that body that is supposed to um, pr protect the integrity of the racing industry in this state. Now, I don't regard that as a ringing endorsement. 59%. Uh, nearly half the people, the stakeholders in the racing industry, do not have confidence in, in Curic's competence and their integrity as well, um, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's another fail uh, for the racing um, the portfolio. And, and then the last one, which I thought was very amusing, Mr Deputy Speaker, and this is typical of any Labor government, if you go to the service standards effectiveness measures, so how do we measure the effectiveness of the vast investment that we make into the racing industry every year? Well, they've got two performance indicators, and one of them is the percentage of country race meetings in the approved schedule that are conducted. A process, not an outcome, a process, a tick-the-box process. This government would not know what an outcome is. They would not know how to measure the effectiveness of taxpayer money in an industry that employs tens of thousands of people. That effectiveness measure is an embarrassment. And how can anybody apply a KPI like that and expect the Queensland public to have some sort of confidence that their taxpayer money is being spent wisely, Madam, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker? Mr Deputy Speaker, I've travelled around many racetracks over the last uh, few months, uh, regional and metropolitan, and uh, it's a great experience. I've yet, to mention, I've yet to meet one person that says that they support the Labor government, of course, they have to keep their mouths shut because they want the money, but I tell you what, they have zero confidence in the government and zero confidence in the Minister. Mr. Speaker. Order members, I call the member for Rockhampton. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak in support of report number eight of the 57th Parliament for the Education, Employment and Training Committee regarding the 2021-22 budget estimates process. 
The committee made one recommendation, and that is it be agreed to by the Legislative Assembly without amendment. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the great work of the Honourable Grace Grace MP, Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations and Minister for Racing, and the Honourable Di Farmer MP, Minister for Employment and Small Business and Minister for Training and Skills Development, for their responses to the committee's examination of the budget estimates and the passion that they bring to their respective portfolios for the people of Queensland. There are so many great programs being delivered, and I'm going to talk about a couple that have made a significant difference on the ground in my electorate. The Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. I think I can speak on behalf of all members of the House on how great this program is being received. I welcome the $80 million per annum uh, ongoing from 2122. Skilling Queenslanders for Work is targeted to help disadvantaged uh, job seekers gain the skills and knowledge they require to enter and stay in the workforce. I've been to many graduations and it's always pleasing to hear that graduates not been able to attend their graduation as they've already gained employment. Another great program that has been well received is the Back to Work program with up to $140 million over four years from 2021-22 to help eligible businesses take on a person who has been unemployed for an extended period of time and help people into employment. This is great in assisting um, particularly our younger people enter the workforce. The dignity in working can never be underestimated. A total capital purchases uh, for the Department of Education for 2022 uh, is forecast at $1.447 billion. The capital works budget is largely for construction and refurbishment of school educational facilities. This investment supports thousands of jobs across our state, and within this expenditure is the school's halls program. And I'm very pleased that the Hall School in Rockhampton is receiving funding for a Hall multi-purpose centre. The, um, the school currently has no shaded area where all students can come together for assembly. Another area uh, is advancing clean energy schools program, and I'm aware there are a few schools in my electorate that have received funding under this program. Programs like this make a real difference to our students and teachers. Another area of interest for me is the increased support of the Queensland racing industry uh, through the allocation of the 35% of um, predicted point of uh, consumption tax, which um, is estimated to be an additional net funding of $41.3 million over two years. It amazes me that the opposition say that they have not received their fair share of time. When you look at it, they had 60 minutes, 60% uh, of the time, which was 223 minutes, where they were able to open, ask questions. The other pleasing note was our ministers were able to answer every question and there was no questions taken on notice. It shows how well prepared our ministers are in responding. Yeah. The committee uh, has recommended that the proposed expenditure, as detailed in the Appropriation 21-22 Bill, uh, for the committee's area of responsibility be agreed to by the Legislative Assembly without amendment. I commend the report to the House. Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, <coughs> having, um, having Minister Grace in charge of the Industrial Relations Department is like putting the, putting the fox in charge of the hen house. You know, she can have a mask on, but I can see the giggles and the smirk because she knows, she knows what's coming. Um, being a former union official herself, now in charge of industrial, industrial relations, is it any wonder, is it any wonder why now the opposition Com uh, completely and keeps getting the complaints from her own staff in her own department about the issues. Now, let me address some of the issues that Minister Grace just talked about in terms of the allegations. So, 
uh, she talks and interjects now about some of the allegations. I can inform the House that there is a current investigation into the Office of Industrial Relations... Order, Minister. ...that the Crime and Corruption Commission have sent... Order, Minister. Yes, I did. But guess what, Minister? Guess what, through you, Speaker? The Crime and Corruption Commission wrote back to me of the allegations and said... If what, is, if what the allegation is proved would amount to corrupt conduct, hence why, hence why the Crime and Corruption Commission have now asked an external body to complete the investigation. I've already been contacted by the external body in terms of the investigation, so there are serious issues. Now, what I do want to though say, Deputy Speaker, about the Crime and Corruption Commission, I am, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am disappointed in the Crime and Corruption Commission in the way they handle these things. I received a public interest disclosure which I tabled at last year estimates. In that public interest disclosure, you can clearly see, any reasonable person can read it and see, that it is from someone within the department, making allegations of departmental officials in the minister's department liaising and working with the CFMEU, that bullying union thugs, right? They, they, clearly the allegations are from people, staff members in the Industrial Relations Office. The Crime and Corruption Commission, I begged the Crime and Corruption Commission, I wrote to them, Speaker, and I said, I have spoken directly. Now this is, this is new for the minister, and I'm going to disclose it in the House. I have spoken directly to workplace health and safety inspectors in the minister's department who pleaded with the Crime and Corruption Commission that they want to go to the Star Chamber. They want the protection of the Triple C to have their case heard. They want the allegations heard by the Crime and Corruption Commission. I wrote to the Crime and Corruption Commission. I said, we have these workplace health and safety and other staff members of the Industrial Relations Department here ready to give evidence to the Crime and Corruption Commission. The Crime and Corruption Commission said, no, the Industrial Relations Department is best placed to deal with these complaints. What sort of, what sort of protection are we giving whistleblowers when the Crime and Corruption Commission are handed everything and they still say we want an external HR department to investigate these allegations? The current HR department investigating the Minister's Office of Industrial Relations, do not, they do not have the investigative powers of the Crime and Corruption Commission. They do not have the power to compel witnesses. They do not have the power to ask witnesses to go to the Star Chamber and give evidence. We are not seeing the sunlight, the disinfectant in the Office of Industrial Relations. Where there is smoke, there is fire. And there is lots of smoke coming out of the Industrial Relations Office. The very quiet. And, Deputy Speaker, I can assure you, these people, these staff members, current staff members, public servants of this Minister's Department have come to me, they've had enough, and they've said, we want to expose the truth to the Crime and Corruption Commission. But the Crime and Corruption Commission have dismissed it and said, no, the Industrial Relations Department can look at it themselves. I call on the Crime and Corruption Commission to do their job properly, because I guarantee if they do their job properly, this minister would not be a minister. With the allegations that have surmounted, the allegations that I have read, the allegations that I have heard, this minister would not have a job because of the issues and the relationship between Order the minister. CFMEU and the Office of Industrial Relations. It is happening. It's disgraceful. And if the Crime and Corruption Commission aren't going to do their job, then we need a royal commission into the Office of Industrial Relations Order in minister. Queensland and the relationship between the CFMEU and the donations of the CFMEU to the Labor Party. Uh, time has expired. House will come to order. Speaker. I call the member for Keppel. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this side of the House is passionate about a great start for every student in Queensland. Those opposite only whinge, and that was obvious at the estimates hearing for the Education, Employment and Training Committee. Can I thank the committee chair, the member for Redlands, and happy birthday to her as well, and all of the committee members, the committee secretariat. Can I thank the minister? The minister did a wonderful job talking about all of her achievements as Minister for Education. When I go to schools, teachers and students say to me, we love our Minister Grace. She's fun, caring, she's funny, she cracks, she, she cracks me up. She's warm and a great education minister who also knows how to run a tight ship. 
Can I also thank our outgoing Director General Tony Cook for his service to the Department of Education. He's leaving us in Queensland and heading back south to the ACT. I recall when I was at Education Council representing Minister Grace a few years ago in Adelaide and uh, Professor Gonski pulled me aside and said that Tony Cook is the best Director General in all of Queensland and how lucky we are in Queensland to have him. So I thank uh, Tony for his service and uh, his replacement will certainly have big shoes to fill. Can I also thank all of the departmental staff who worked tirelessly with the Minister to prepare for estimates. They prepared for a range of possible questions, but unfortunately a lot of their preparation was untouched on the day because of a lack of good, detailed and targeted questions from those opposite about the Education Department and about how our government is delivering for schools, students and staff right across Queensland. Deputy Speaker, during the estimates hearing, there was not a single question from those opposite about pedagogy, about the department's inclusion policy, about how schools are supporting students with a disability or intellectual impairment, not a single question about teacher recruitment in, in teacher or student wellbeing, not a single question about schools in Indigenous communities or the application of the Australian curriculum in our schools. The LNP didn't ask about how the 2021-22 state budget continues the Palaszczuk Labor government's proud record of giving every child a great start and engaging young people in learning no matter where they live in Queensland. The LNP didn't ask about the Palaszczuk government's record education budget, a $15.3 billion investment in schools and early childhood education, which continues to deliver for Queensland children and students from far north Queensland to the Gold Coast and beyond. I'm proud that in this 21-22 state budget, the Palaszczuk Labor government is investing almost $1.9 billion in school infrastructure spending to maintain, renew and build new facilities, including 10 new schools, supporting more than 4,100 jobs across the state. Deputy Speaker, the LNP didn't ask about school halls either. They didn't want to know about our fantastic $235 million program which will, deliver our new, which will deliver new or upgraded halls and which will support 775 jobs. Deputy Speaker, we know it makes a big difference for children starting school when they've been to kindy in the year before prep, which is why I'm proud that the Palaszczuk Labor Government is investing $202.9 million from 21-22 to the 24-25 financial year and $64 million per year ongoing after that to support the continued provision of universal access to early childhood education in the year, year before school. In 21-22, this will result in a total investment of $187 million to ensure Queensland families can access affordable, quality kindy programs, no matter their life circumstance. And Deputy Speaker, while I'm on my feet, can I take this opportunity to wish all of the Early Childhood Educators a very happy Early, child, early Childhood Educators Day tomorrow and thank every single Early Childhood Educator from right across Queensland for the work that they do to improve the lives of young people and their families to give them a bright start to their education. The Pal Palaszczuk Government is not just investing in school infrastructure. This year's budget is about investing in Queensland's people and our future. Our teachers truly are the foundation of the world-class education system we have here in Queensland, setting up our kids for a great future. We have committed to employing 6,190 new teachers and 1,139 new teacher aides over the next four years. We're investing almost $20 million in our Turn to Teaching program to provide 300 aspiring teachers with financial support, mentoring and paid teaching internships to complete their teaching qualifications and take up uh, and take up a guaranteed teaching position, a program I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of. I'm also re really looking forward to chairing the new Queensland Resources Council Trade to Teach Working Group, where we're encouraging people who might be working in a trade to consider uh, changing over to becoming a teacher. The 21-22 education budget will also provide $40 million towards our $100 million three-year student wellbeing package to provide every state school with access to wellbeing professional and to pilot GPs in 20 state secondary schools across the state. Mr Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Speaker, I commend the report to the House. Thank you. I call the member for Southern Downs. Thank you, sir. It's nice to get the mask off and have a chance to speak. Uh, I too rise to speak on the uh, committee report on uh, the, uh, particularly the Department of Employment, Small Business and uh, Training at our estimates. Uh, and it gives me a, an opportunity to talk about a very contemporary issue for my electorate and the mem uh, people at Southern Downs is the border closures. Now we heard my honourable friend, the uh, member for Budrum, uh, recount how it transpired at the, uh, the hearing that no planning had been undertaken, no modelling by the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training into the effects of 
COVID lockdowns, COVID measures on small business. Now, to give you an example of how that matters on the ground, in an electric bike mine, which has 500 kilometres of border country with New South Wales, where on either side of the border we have communities that are connected socially and economically, where the community of interest is um, continuous regardless of the presence of the border. Just like the Gold Coast, I take that injection from member for Theodore. Um, the failure to plan, the failure to understand the implications of border closures and the failure to plan for exemptions for small business operators, small business owners and the staff of small businesses to be able to cross the border, as is intended by the Chief Health Officer, uh, causes great economic and social hardship in the, electric, in the, uh, the communities that I represent. For example, um, I was speaking to Ray and Connie Taylor, who run a, um, a fruit and vegetable growing business on the Granite Belt. Now, Ray had prepared paddocks on the other side of the border in Liston in a very remote area, a long way from any other centres in New South Wales. And on the Monday when he went to start planting, he had $2 million worth of work to do, uh, he couldn't cross the border. And the exemptions for essential agricultural workers were not properly considered. They weren't properly implemented, and as a result, he and many others have lost a lot of money. Now, Mr. Taylor told me that it's cost him $350,000 just uh, to this point, with much more to come, and most importantly, 10 people lost their jobs as a result of that. Um, the Wollongarra General Store. Now, the operators of the Wollongarra uh, General Store provide not just food and takeaways, but gas and fuel. They are a very important service in the town of Wollongarra and for the people of Jennings as well. The operators live in New South Wales, and they have on several occasions been turned around at the border and told, no, no, you are not essential workers, because the police on the border are forced to make a value judgment without having the necessary support and qualifications about Just, the Just uh, pause the clock, please. Uh, member, I've been listening carefully to your contribution, um, and I'm, it, it seems to me that you're talking about the impacts of the um, uh, government policies in relation to border uh, restrictions. Uh, I'm struggling to see where that's relevant to the uh, debate around the estimates uh, report. Thank you for your, uh, your guidance, sir. Yes, uh, um, I'm speaking specifically about the impacts of the Department of um, uh, Education, uh, Small Business and Training, uh, Employment, Small Business and Training, to plan for and have the needs of small business accounted for in the plans for border closures and lockdowns and so forth. It's in entirely relevant to the revelations in the... Um, the uh, can I ask that while I respond to the point of order that the, uh, the clock be stopped? Yes, sure, please. Uh, I should have had another 20 seconds, I think. Yeah, please pause the clock. Um, it is, in my view, um, very relevant to the question of the department which is supposed to lead the government's understanding of small business and the needs of it should be there on the ground, should be there in the planning for... Thank you. You've made your point. I'll just take some advice. You resume your seat, please, Member. Order, Members. Thank you, Member for Southern Downs. Uh, can we put some uh, time back on the clock, please? Uh, we're 220, 2.25, I think we're... Uh, t two minutes, yep. Thank you, Member. You have the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yes, um, so they have, because of a, uh, the flimsy regulations, the flimsy descriptions of what is an essential worker, which should have been the, the Department of, of um, Employment, Small Business and Training should have been onto this because it's small businesses that are being impacted. We, uh, I talked to um, an auto electrician in Gundawindi who is cut off from his uh, customers on the other side of the border. Now, he is a highly essential um, member of, uh, of the community. His business is essential. So why is it that this government, after having locked down the border before, this department wasn't able to plan for people like the Gundawindi oil electrician who needs to go over to the other side into New South Wales to work on equipment in cotton farms and other uh, primary production businesses? Farmers, families, small businesses and workers their livelihoods, their, uh, their welfare is at stake when borders close. Now, the, I'm not disputing that the borders need to, uh, to be closed, but what I am saying is that this government has been at it for long enough. The department, if it's true to its, its title, ought to be considering the needs of small business in communities like those that I represent along the border between New South Wales and Queensland. Um, they are the people who work very hard 
invest their own money with no guaranteed outcome, who work hard to employ people and generate taxes that they themselves pay and that their staff pay in order that we can have hospitals and police stations and schools. And I think the fact that the uh, department has been silent on this and that all of my correspondence with the government indicates that they're not having a go internally to get these problems sorted out. My communities are suffering. People are suffering um, severe economic and social hardship. I ask that the department, through the minister, does something about that and starts thinking about the impacts of their decisions on water closures, on small business, to make sure that the impacts are minimised. Order, order. You had time on the clock. You could have continued your contribution. You've chosen to sit down. We'll have the House in order now. I call uh, the minister. Um, thank you, Speaker. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to rise to speak to the appropriation bills and uh, to hark back to that great day when I could share with the members of this committee um, the tremendous um, results that we are getting from our investment in skills and training, um, Speaker, and the support that we've given to small business um, in the last financial year. But before I do that, I do want to thank the committee and our excellent chair, and happy birthday to the excellent chair. I want to thank the committee secretariat and the Hansard staff. I want to thank my director general, Warwick Agnew, and the team of public servants who worked tirelessly uh, to put um, the work together to support me um, at estimates, and also the staff of my ministerial office who also worked incredibly hard. And, uh, Speaker, can I just say it's an absolute um, privilege to serve as the minister for my portfolio. Um, two out of the six pillars of the um, COVID-19 economic recovery plan are small business and skills and training, because they are absolutely critical to our econ economic recovery. And, Speaker, of course, in Queensland, we know we are seeing the absolute effects of the fact that we have had a strong health recovery despite the opposition wanting to open the borders 64 times. We have had a, a strong health response in Queensland. The Premier has stayed strong. Queenslanders have done the right thing. And it's because of that, Speaker, and because of our strong economic uh, plan that we are in the position we are in now where businesses are open and trading, That's Speaker. Right. Yeah. And as the Treasurer said only this morning, um, we have actually created more jobs in Queensland since the pandemic began than all of the other states and Order members combined. But, Speaker, there were just a couple of things I wanted to um, really highlight from my uh, report to Messimates. One of them was about the $1 billion of investment in skills and training. And, Speaker, it was fantastic to actually see the outcome of that investment that we have actually seen an almost 50 per cent, 57 per cent increase in apprenticeship commencements in the last year. And that is a direct result of our investments in TAFE, our, our free TAFE and apprenticeships for under 25, and our other excellent um, training and skills programs. And I know you sort of read the statement of reservations from that lot over there, and I think they were just in a different no, estimates, no, or I, I don't know, they, they kind of didn't hear that 57 per cent, and, uh, which in anyone's language speaker is really quite significant. That is literally thousands of Queenslanders getting the right training to get the right job, and, uh, and we are incredibly yeah. proud of that. I, was, I loved right being able to talk about our Skilling Queenslanders for Work and Back to Work program, yep. right. and uh, that's worth about half a billion dollars, and of course we, we've made Skilling Queenslanders for Work. Um, it is permanent funding for that now, Speaker, and, uh, and I noticed that the opposition didn't actually ask about that, and they, they wouldn't really, because it's actually a bit no, embarrassing for them, because we know when, we, uh, when they came to government in 2012, and it was showing at the time, for every dollar we invested in skilling Queenslanders' work, there was an $8 return. It is the most successful um, program of its kind in Australia. They actually um, got rid of it straight away. And, uh, and in fact, when they went to the last election, Speaker, um, there was nowhere Skilling Queenslanders of Work was nowhere in sight. And so a bit embarrassing for them to talk about that. Um, speaker, in terms of small business, um, Look, we, um, small business are so important. They employ a million Queenslanders. It's why uh, we put $200 million uh, in loans to small businesses when the pandemic hit, almost a billion dollars uh, in loans. 
Uh, earlier this year, I announced our $140 million Big Plans for Small Business strategy, and in fact, just recently, we announced $600 million support. Uh, for member for McConnell and member for Gregory will cease their interjections across the chamber. And of course, Speaker, um, I know that the uh, I understand the member for Budger made a few nasty little comments. They sort of have to go personal when they haven't really got anything else to say. But, um, but Speaker. It's actually, I'm surprised they even want to raise small business because, you know, they didn't actually go to the election with a small business plan. And I think when the Leader of the Opposition gave his budget reply speech, he barely even mentioned small business. So it was a bit funny. I saw an invitation from the member for Southport to have the member for Budrum, the Shadow Minister, come and do a small business yeah. breakfast. Speaker, it was $75 a head, oh, and they were going to talk about their plans for small business. And I thought, well, I hope it's a 10-course breakfast, Speaker, yeah, because they're not going to get much out of the, out of the member for Budrum because they actually have no plans for small business. We are here to look after small business, Speaker, and we are going to be there now and for the future for small business. I call the member for Hinchinbrook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I take great pleasure in rising and speaking to the Appropriation Bill 2021. Uh, as a member of the Education, Employment and Training Committee, I was able to attend the committee hearings this, um, this term and uh, go through the process of scrutinising not only the budget but being having the opportunity to, uh, to question ministers and had an opportunity to question the Education, Industrial Relations and Racing Minister. Also had an opportunity as a member for Hinchbrook to question the Employment, Small Business and Training and Skills Minister, which is sitting in the House. And, Mr Speaker, before I start, I would like to acknowledge my other committee members uh, who worked with us uh, through the estimates process, our uh, chair, uh, member for Redlands, deputy chair, from, uh, member for Southern Downs, member for Theodore, member for Rockhampton, and make, member for Stafford, uh, all make up the Education, Employment and Training Committee. Also, Mr Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the departmental staff and the DGs and all that sort of stuff that came down and gave us uh, their best answers, I guess. Um, if I could first get into, though, the committee process and how it ran through this year, and very similar to how it's run through in previous years. Uh, unfortunately, um, this, the crossbench, which is myself in the committee, uh, gets allocated an amount of crossbench time. Um, unfortunately, if we have any other uh, visiting members from the crossbench that turn up to the committee hearings or seek leaves from the committee to sit there and, uh, and ask questions, that actually comes out of my time. And I think we need to readdress that into the future, whether we actually allow uh, visiting members to actually come in and use crossbench time or better allocate that time. I will acknowledge, though, our chair being quite generous uh, in the time that she did allocate to the opposition and crossbench questions this time, though it, I must admit it did um, add a little bit of aggravation between the argy bargy between crossbench members. Uh, so I think that needs to be re revisited. Mr Speaker, while we were, um, I was in there, I was able to ask some questions. Firstly, I'd like to ask questions that relate to the Hinchinbrook electorate, because that's what's most important to the people that I represent back home. And one of the biggest questions around education I'm asked constantly in the northern beaches of Townsville is what's being done to ensure that the exponential uh, population growth in the northern beaches of Townsville, or southern Hinchinbrook as I like to call it, uh, will be, alloc be allocated enough resources to look after the expanding high school cohort. So whether that's expanding and refurbishments over there at the Northern Beaches High School, uh, which I'll get into in a sec as well, but also uh, the allocation of perhaps land or purchasing a land uh, around the Mount Lone Bushland Beach area. Uh, Mr Speaker, one incident that we have had recently at the Northern Beaches High School involved where people were trespassing and threatening students with a piece of rubber pipe. Very scary stuff. And this, the school has previously put in uh, for perimeter fencing to make sure those students are kept safe. Unfortunately, they've missed out and they missed out in this budget. So I'll be asking for a ministerial meeting over the next com com coming weeks to ensure that there is a funding or an income stream to help protect these students. Mr Speaker, I also took my time um, while t uh, questioning the Education Minister on what would be seen as an alternative view in this parliament, I guess. And I was asking about the, the teacher ratios which in, within our state schools, male and female teacher ratios. Uh, member, the time for debate has expired. Uh, I'd ask you to resume your seat. Order, members. Order, members. The question is that the report of the Education, Employment and Training Committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. 
The question is that the report of the Health uh, and Environment Committee be adopted. I call the member for Tharangawa. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. And um, I rise to give my contribution for the 2021-22 uh, budget estimates uh, in relation to the portfolio areas we cover in health and environment. On behalf of the committee, can I start by thanking the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services and Minister for the Environment and Great Barrier Reef, Minister for Science and Youth Affairs, and all departmental officers for their cooperation in providing information to the committee throughout the estimates process. I also thank uh, members of the committee for their work and uh, contributions into the estimates process. And I saw that's our uh, um, breakdown of non-government questions uh, exceeded government questions by an hour and a half. So I think I was a little too generous there. We'll have to rein that back perhaps next year. We'll see. It depends on how people behave, I think, and, uh, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I'd like to start, everyone knows the, the health crisis that has uh, uh, been referred to by the opposition. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute, but COVID-19 has been a, had a serious impact on Queensland, and the way we've managed it has been outstanding. And I wanted to uh, especially mention our Chief Health Officer, uh, Dr Jeanette Young, who, who did her last estimates. Um, she's kept Queensland safe uh, and, uh, and also kept our uh, Health and Environment Committee informed on changes of managing COVID through the relevant extensions of COVID-19 public health orders. We wish her very well in the future, and I also acknowledge QS Commissioner Russell Bowles. It was his last uh, estimates as well, as he goes into retirement after 40 years and 10 years as Commissioner. I uh, thank the uh, uh, Secretariat and all, all who participated in the estimates process. Um, we note in the budget um, uh, there was an increase of $685 million, or almost 3.4 per cent, for health in the 2021 budget, and that uh, related to increased expenditure, including workforce requirements to meet the ongoing growth of the demand in frontline health services, including the ongoing response to COVID-19. And uh, an additional $480 million uh, uh, included to continue the COVID-19 response, which will deliver, or is delivering, those fever clinics, contact tracing, testing capability and the vaccination program, compliance activities, facilitation of quarantine and government arranged accommodation, COVID-19 contact centres and wellness checks for people in mandatory qu uh, quarantine. Um, there were some definite highlights, but I've only got a couple of minutes to go, uh, including um, $482 million to address pressures and emergency patient flows through public hospitals. And I think I'll just go straight to the statements of reservations because uh, from the non-government or the LNP members, they talked about uh, our um, uh, waiting lists have ballooned, uh, time taken to be seen in emergency departments has lengthened, but throughout their entire questioning, of which they had ample time, not one question was asked about uh, why the impacts of um, uh, more people going into emergency departments is experienced th throughout Queensland uh, and, in fact, throughout this, the nation. And uh, we, you know, perhaps they could have asked, what's the, what's the percentage of people that can afford uh, private insurance in, um, in Queensland? Well, 55 per cent can't. It's just unaffordable. So that increases uh, pressure on our public hospitals significantly. They didn't ask about uh, the funding for uh, aged care, the people that are, are waiting um, for aged care packages. What happens when they don't get the aged care packages? They generally call Queensland Ambulance Service and they end up in an emergency department. They didn't ask about the 600, I'd say, and the Minister would probably give us closer uh, numbers, of beds being used by um, aged care people that, that could get care in residential aged care facilities that are taking up public hospital beds. They didn't ask about that. They didn't ask about uh, increased funding from the federal government, member for Mudgery Bar, around um, and, and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, here we go again, just behave just like you did in estimates. The, uh, they didn't ask about the funding um, for federal government for palliative care services in Queensland, and they are responsible for some acute and aged care uh, funding in that uh, Cohort, nothing. They didn't ask that. Um, they continue to blame the Labor state government, who I think have done an outstanding job 
in Queensland in managing COVID-19. Just look at what's happening across the border. Uh, I commend our report to the House. Order members. I call the member for Mudrabar. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to contribute to the Appropriations Bill debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, everyone in this chamber will remember those opposite exclaiming that this was a typical Labor budget. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, yes indeed it was. The budget estimate process revealed this typical Labor budget for what it really was, a sham, and it's a sham which lets down the people of Queensland on so many levels. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite it being a record health budget, more ambulances are being rammed to our hospitals than ever before. It's at 41 per cent statewide. That number is the worst in living memory. Queensland's elective surgery waiting lists have ballooned and the time taken to be seen in emergency departments has lengthened. Whether it's on a hospital ramp, surgery waiting list or inside our emergency departments, more and more Queenslanders are waiting longer than clinically recommended to be treated, and that's to the detriment of all Queenslanders. Mr Deputy Speaker, who could forget on the morning of the estimates hearing the Health Minister hastily announcing $163.7 million to increase capacity across the system? Mr Deputy Speaker, let the record show that the funding for additional capacity was not new money, instead already earmarked in the 2021-2022 budget delivered only weeks earlier. That announcement was more about the health of the government rather than the health of Queenslanders. Seriously, where are the priorities of those opposite? They care about themselves more than they care about honest Queenslanders. At the estimates hearing last month, the much-hyped $2 billion hospital building fund announced by the government on Budget Day was shown to be a furphy. When asking hospital and health service CEOs about what funding was available to them through the fund, some recalled funding which was made up from regular capital expenditure. Now, that was deeply concerning to me, and I'll tell you why. It was apparent the government had not clearly communicated the details of the fund to hospital and health service chief executives. The health minister actually had to intervene and correct the record. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a slight on the HHS's CEOs. That's the Health Minister's failure to do her job properly. The Health Minister is losing control of her grip on the health system. This lack of detail didn't come as a surprise, Mr Deputy Speaker, as the hospital building fund, reportedly worth $2 billion, was not even notated on a budget paper line item in the 21-2022 budget documents. Imagine that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Imagine a $2 billion fund without a line item. It's something out of a comedy. It's pathetic public administration. When and how the funding will be used remains a mystery, not only to the opposition, but apparently also to the hospital and health service executives as well. The Director-General advised that the fund is being held by Queensland Treasury and that Queensland Health was not privy to further information on how funding would be released over time how the department can effectively plan to increase capacity in the system without understanding what funding is available. The hospital building fund was always a fund without funding based on accounting without principles. The estimates hearing revealed that it won't deliver a cent to build a single new hospital in Queensland this financial year. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was also revealed that none of the government's seven satellite facilities will contain emergency departments or overnight beds. The LNP believe that these facilities will do little, if anything, to alleviate the current capacity pressures which have beset Queensland's public hospital system. Queenslanders who voted for the government in October 2020 based on their promise to build hospitals should rightly feel aggrieved that these facilities will offer services akin to a health clinic rather than a hospital. Mr Deputy Speaker, finally I want to round out my contribution with the issues about ambulance ramping. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is widespread acknowledgement that the Queensland Ambulance Service is under significant strain. Reports in the mainstream media have indicated that ambulances are often delayed, sometimes significantly, when responding to triple zero calls. At the hearing, it was confirmed that the Commissioner of the Queensland Ambulance receives a live feed of ambulance ramping on a monitor in his office. That data is reported monthly to Queensland Health, but is now only released on a quarterly basis. Mr Deputy Speaker, what is the Health Minister trying to hide? Those opposite are embarrassed about their record on ambulance ramping, and so they should be. And as a final note, I too would like to thank, I too would like to thank Order. all those frontline healthcare staff who have endured so much over the past 18 months. They've been asked to do more with less by this government. And we thank them all for their dedication. We Order, thank members. them all. 
for their dedication and devotion to keeping Queenslanders fit and healthy in these of uncertain times. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I rise to make a contribution to the debate on the Health and Environment Committee's report into the recent estimates hearings and in doing so thank the Chair, the Committee, the Secretariat, Parliament staff and Hansard for their attendance and efforts in ensuring the smooth running of the 2021 estimates hearings. And uh, just picking up on the member for um, Madhubar's uh, comments about uh, health workers having to do more for less, I think she was reminiscing about the LNP days, uh, because we have, we have continued to increase our workforce, increase their budget and support Order. them in the roles that they perform. We don't stand up saying that they're they're falling behind in vaccinations despite the hard work they're doing. We don't uh, criticise uh, what they're doing in emergency. Member for Marjorie, you're warned understanding orders. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government understands the importance of a strong health system, and that is why we have delivered a record health budget, providing $22.2 billion into the system to enable our hard-working and dedicated hospital and health services the ability to get on with the job of protecting Queenslanders. Our HHSs are designed to make local decisions regarding the health care of Queenslanders in their region. With the funding provided, we know that our amazing Queensland Health and Queensland Ambulance Service health heroes are there to support you. I have indicated previously that our health system is under pressure, but so is the rest of the country, and something that the LNP fails to recognise. COVID-19 is putting pressure on the health system like never before, and most states have publicly recognised this, including the Liberal Minister for Health, Brad Hazard, in New South Wales. New South Wales have advised that they have cancelled their non-urgent elective surgeries, including in some private hospitals, to deal with COVID-19. In Queensland, even during the worst pandemic in a century, our health system continues to operate at a high level, including in the delivery of planned care and elective surgeries. While it is unrealistic to think we can avoid the disruptions to our system generated by COVID-19. Our frontline health staff and the processes that support them continue to stand up to the challenges of the virus. And I acknowledge the health workers who are still in quarantine uh, since the start of that Indrapilly cluster outbreak uh, because they were connected as close contacts and family members of school students. In May last year, the number of Queenslanders waiting longer than clinically recommended for an elective surgery peaked at 5,166. Our government made a decision to invest $250 million to reduce that list. As at 1 July this year, I'm advised that number had fallen to 629, from 5,166 to 629, a decrease of 88 per cent. Uh, and I can say that that figure of 629 was never achieved by the LNP when they were in government. I take this opportunity to thank each and every Queensland healthcare worker for their efforts, not only dealing with COVID-19, but dealing with business as usual activities, to continue to provide health care to Queenslanders. We are also getting on with ensuring that Queenslanders have the health, the health infrastructure they need. In this year's budget, we'll see a number of infrastructure upgrades across Queensland, including in Camarillo, St George, Morven, Charville, Charleville, Blackwater, Bundaberg, Toowoomba, Townsville, Atherton, Serena and Kingaroy, just to name a few. Those opposite have been running around the state all manners of, claiming all manners of things. They have been attacking the health system which in turn is an attack on our hard-working health professionals. And I must say on the record that the way the member for Marjorie Barr conducted herself in the hearings was appalling, borderline bullying of our public servants. It was unprofessional and it was disrespectful. It was disrespectful. I'll take that. Order. The member for Marjorie Barr says it's her job. It's not her job to attack public servants. It is her job to certainly put questions but it's hard to put a question and get an answer when you're constantly interjecting and badgering the people that you are asking questions of. The member from Mudjibar's bedside manner has a lot to be desired, and I'm glad she's no longer a practising nurse, as her patients would most certainly not have a pleasant experience. The member from Mudjibar's deliberate misquoting of public servants, her, her aggressive style of questioning and um, verbaling them, leaves a lot to be desired, and I call on the member to apologise and correct the record. Although I must say her shark mask got many chuckles. I don't know if it was supposed to be serious, but everyone else thought it was a joke. I thank for my hard-working Director General, Dr John Wakefield, and his entire team for everything they do. It's been a tough period in the health space, and 
but the leadership of Queensland Health are focusing on one thing, strong and positive health outcomes for Queensland, keeping Queenslanders safe. Can I finish by acknowledging the former Queensland Ambulance Service Commissioner, Russell Bowles, for his many decades of service and his leadership of the Extreme Professional Organisation, and thank Dr Young for her leadership as well and keeping us Acting safe. Speaker. I call the member for Bonnie. Thanks, Acting Speaker. Uh, once again, we've seen this as a government who always promote their environmental credentials, but it's all talk with very little delivery. We started the estimates hearing day with the release of the Climate Action Plan 2020 to 2030. Turns out it was just a website. I have no idea how that took nine months to put together. The action plan didn't include any new policies, strategies or interim targets. This was one of Labor's key Order. commitments to the environment and there was Order. nothing to it at all. What the new website does clearly show, however, is that Queensland's carbon emissions are still higher than when Labor came to government in 2015, and that they are not even halfway towards reaching their 2030 reduction pledge. I did struggle to get the Minister to admit that emissions are higher under Labor than when they came to government. The closest I could get was confirmation that the 2019 figure of 164.5 million tonnes is a larger amount than the 2015 figure of 162.7 million tonnes. Uh, the government can set all the targets they want, but when it comes to achieving them, they are having very little success. They need to admit to the issues they're having if they want to genuinely drive down emissions and do our fair share of reducing Australia's impact on the environment because we are lagging behind every single other state. We found out that the Environment Department itself is not even carbon neutral and it doesn't have a plan to become carbon neutral an astonishing admission for the arm of government responsible for directing Queensland's climate action. Becoming carbon neutral would signal to the community that they are willing to take measures to reduce their impact and not just ask it of others. The 17 per cent target for protected areas was reaffirmed, and again the government is not even halfway towards achieving it. With protected areas increases of just 0.01 per cent a year, the hearing revealed that the department couldn't even give a time frame on when they would achieve this commitment simply saying it was a long-term ambition. They are, there are again no interim targets, no more information or plans on how they will get there. They've just set a target with nothing to back it up. The election pledge to, re, to investigate re-establishing a standalone environmental protection agency has seen little progress, with consultation not even starting and no timeline as to when we'll see any progress on it. The flagship land restoration fund has uh, so far, only expended $2.7 million of the $500 million committed to it over four years ago, and that is not even a rounding error. That is just 0.0054 per cent. Worse still is the government is using the LRF to say the federal government should match their funding to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Not only had they not spent the money they're calling on the federal government to match, when you look at the Great Barrier Reef funding, it is clear that the federal government is leading the way. Over the same time period, the federal government spent over $2 billion on the reef compared to the state's $970 million. It's just playing politics to present themselves as the ones taking environmental action when all they've really been successful in doing is making announcements. The organic waste strategy was due by June and still has not been released. Councils and industry are crying out for policy certainty and support to help better manage what is almost half of our residential landfill. Even the Director General admitted during the hearings, it is clear, frankly, that we are behind other states in terms of the processing and beneficial reuse of organic waste. Organic waste is one of the practical steps we can take to reduce our impact. Other states are putting millions and millions behind this, and estimates show that what all that we are doing in Queensland is FOGO trials uh, for curbside collection totaling just $770,000. Other states have sorted this out and are investing serious money we are so far behind and there seems to be no urgency to get us to where we need to be. We are also waiting on the waste to energy guidelines following the release of the strategy, which again makes it impossible for industry to plan. That means the Ramondas waste to energy plant could take 10 years from conception to opening, which is twice as long as it would in any other jurisdiction. When it came to the waste levy, the Minister recommitted to it having no direct impact to households despite not committing to the annual payments to councils, which are preventing this $70 to $90 cost per household from being passed on. While the Minister was happy to promote and comment on the Resource Recovery Industry Development Program, she couldn't comment on why so little of this fund had been spent. Just $34 million of the $100 million, even though $811 million worth of applications were made to it. 
And that's in the context of businesses typically spending fifteen dollars to $50,000 on their applications, so it is not good enough. Overall, Speaker, Queensland's environment is our biggest asset and it deserves so much more from our state government. I call the member for Gavin. Acting Speaker, I rise to speak to the report of the Health and Environment Committee following the 2021-22 budget estimates. Uh, the Palaszczuk government budget is delivering for our environment and for the economies and jobs that rely on it, with a record $1.4 billion investment, as well as important projects in other portfolios like energy, transport and agriculture that support our new climate action plan that this budget delivers for. Uh, and it was interesting to hear the member for Bonnie's contribution just then, because he's been very, very quiet so far. In fact, uh, we heard virtually nothing from the member for Bonnie on the estimates process. No, no media statements, no happy snap on Facebook like we usually see. He just sent a select email to a small handful of people. It's slightly confusing until you look at uh, who the member for Bonnie's state and federal colleagues are, because, of course, we know that they hate talking about the environment. When you look at their record, it's obvious why that is. Uh, so, of course, uh, Mr Speaker, it was interesting to hear some of the remarks during the estimates process uh, and just then around the signal around emissions reduction, particularly from Order. those opposite who have no single signal because they went to the last election wanting to actually scrap our emissions reduction targets altogether. So I'm not sure what signal that sends to uh, industry. Uh, and I mentioned during the estimates process that, uh, of course, here in Queensland, we are seeing a reduction in our emissions, but we had a period of time where we saw no large-scale renewable energy projects in this state as a consequence of the Newman government. We actually saw we actually saw uh, greenhouse gas emissions rise as a consequence of many of the policies enacted by those opposite. Uh, in fact, uh, when you look at their vegetation management uh, uh, track record, we saw a rise in emissions from that sector as a consequence of the repeal of those vegetation management laws, something that the member for Bonnie voted against in the last term of government. But comes in here and cosplays as a progressive, talking about emissions reduction, but actually doing very little. Uh, of course, on this order. Side of Members to my left, you will seize all interjections. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And then, of course, we have uh, the former leader of the opposition who said that people who had rooftop solar were inner city latte sippers. Uh, of course, on this side of on this side of the house. Order. On this side of the house. We are doing what we can to try and reduce emissions, and that's why we launched a new, uh, new climate action plan that has a range of new measures associated with them, and I encourage the member to read it in more detail. Of course, uh, so far we've seen a 14 per cent reduction in emissions since 2005, and emissions in areas like energy and transport are stabilising despite significant population and economic growth we've experienced recently. Uh, investments that we've made in this budget, like our $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund, will continue on this trend. And another core component of those efforts is the flagship restoration fund, with Queensland being the first sub-national government in the world to pursue carbon farming in this way. This budget locks in ongoing funding for this program through the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund that those opposite seem to be struggling to comprehend with, ensuring a sustained certain funding source for years to come. Uh, and this is especially important as the project under the LRF are long-term projects that will deliver economic and environmental benefits over many years, uh, with the most recent round uh, focusing on reef catchment areas. And I know uh, the Acting Speaker is particularly passionate about protecting our Great Barrier Reef as it's an important economic driver in far north Queensland. Uh, so I was really pleased that this budget also delivered $270 million over five years for our reef water quality program. Uh, that's uh, in addition to the $130 million field management program, of course, we know the two biggest threats to the reef are both climate change and water quality. That is why we are acting and is why we are investing, and it's why we've asked the Commonwealth to merely match our funding to show the international community, the World Heritage Committee, that we take their very real concerns seriously. Uh, and so, as always, we would, uh, we would uh, welcome any commitment from the LNP to match us at a, at a state or federal level uh, when it comes to some of these policies. Of course, when it comes to our national parks and other protected areas, they're critical 
for our economic recovery for the tourism sector as well as protecting our rich biodiversity. And since 2015, we've increased the amount of protected areas across Queensland by 1.2 million hectares. Uh, the estate is now more than twice the size of Tasmania. And the waste sector, we've allocated, uh, allocated $254 million over five years to continue Queensland's waste management and resource recovery strategy. Uh, we want Queensland to become a zero waste society, not Australia's dumping ground, which is what happened when those opposite repealed the waste levy. Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that delivers for our environment. I'm very proud of it. I want to thank all of the staff members who participated in the estimates process and for putting in place the budget. I commend the report Madam to Deputy the House. Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Southport. Madam Deputy Speaker, I raise, rise to uh, speak uh, in respect of the, um, the estimates process and uh, the report of the Health and Environment Committee. And uh, at the outset, I also want to add uh, to that of uh, uh, my colleagues here in the House, uh, the thanks, uh, my thanks to all those frontline healthcare staff uh, and workers who have endured so much over the past 18 months, the length and breadth of this state. And while we've seen uh, a lot of evidence of COVID in the southeast, uh, and it has certainly had more of an impact and been a bit more um, visible. Um, nonetheless, it has had a huge impact on people working in rural and remote hospitals in terms of uh, their need to be prepared, uh, in terms of their need to set aside facilities and space uh, in case. Uh, and that has had a huge impact on health workers right across the state, not just here in South East Queensland. But Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I have real concerns about the health budget. And um, at the outset um, of um, the committee hearings and discussion, I raised concerns around the actual uh, budget for the current year. And uh, while the budget is absolutely an increase over the budget for last year, uh, it, is, it actually represents about a $70 million underspend compared with actual expenditure for last year. And it concerns me that uh, those, the budget figures for this year have perhaps not factored in, as they should have, uh, the extra costs uh, that, that, that could have been planned for and foreseen around COVID. Um, on the Gold Coast alone, uh, the budget is actually some $50 million less than the total expenditure for the Gold Coast Health and Hospital Service uh, in the previous 12 months. Um, while the budget figure is up on the previous budget figure, uh, the reality is the budget figure is down on actual expenditure for the previous year. Madam Deputy Speaker, we should be concerned about the health system across Queensland. It is struggling. And uh, earlier this year, um, the Queensland Audit Office uh, tabled a report uh, with the Health Committee, and it's since been tabled here in this House, uh, which refers to uh, called Planning for a Sustainable Health Services. And they raise significant concerns about the lack of forward planning um, uh, for Queensland Health into the future years. And uh, I, like many other members of this House, have had uh, briefings and discussions with healthcare workers and, and administrators and, and, and others within our health services across the state. And the story is the same. Everywhere you go, there is a need for more beds. There are issues around ambulance ramping at hospitals. Uh, there are the pressures, quite understandably, that COVID brings. Uh, and now, more recently, with consideration of um, uh, greater support and the announcements of the government around palliative care and the uh, budget for additional palliative care services, there are significant concerns right across the state around the delivery of these services. And uh, one of the concerns that, that hasn't really received a lot of airtime in the House is the concern raised by the Queensland Audit Office about the lack of workforce planning across the state. And uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've visited hospitals in, in rural and remote Queensland, uh, some of which haven't had a permanent doctor based at them uh, for, as, uh, for up to 10 years and are completely reliant on locums uh, and uh, fly-in, fly-out uh, services uh, to support their local communities. Um, so, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, we should be concerned. Um, I don't believe that um, this budget goes far enough in terms of its commitments to Queenslanders. Uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the $2 billion building fund that we heard about uh, really has much substance behind it. It was an a, uh, a interesting, a, a great announcement by uh, those uh, on the other side of the House in the lead-up to the budget and during the budget sessions. Um, but when we looked for the detail in the budget documents, 
it simply isn't there. In terms of the Gold Coast um, and my local patch, uh, I'm incredibly proud of the work that uh, the many health front, frontline workers and healthcare workers do at the uh, Gold Coast uh, University Hospital and Romina Hospitals and some of the other health service centres that we have. Um, but they too are under enormous pressure. Uh, and it's not just um, the pressure of COVID. We've seen a significant uh, migration of um, residents from other parts of Australia over the last uh, six to 12 months, particularly. Uh, we're being told in forward estimates that we could expect um, almost the entire population of Townsville, or the equivalent of that, to move to the Gold Coast. And I have to say in closing that Queenslanders deserve better. They deserve better planning, and we have a lot of work to do in terms of workforce planning across this state. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Lytton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise today to speak to Report 9 of the Health and Environment Committee. The committee has recommended that the proposed expenditure, as detailed in the Appropriation Bill 2021, for the committee's areas of responsibility be agreed to without amendment. May I begin also by acknowledging the amazing work of our frontline workers, health, retail, transport workers, national parks and wildlife officers and, of course, our teachers. Without each of them stepping forward, we would not be in the fabulous position that we are today, and I thank them. I also acknowledge the wonderful work of our great Chief Health Officer, Dr Jeanette Young, and this was her last estimates hearing. I'd like to thank her for keeping us safe and for her guidance and her measured approach. Also, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge um, our Premier, the Honourable Anastasia Palaszczuk, and thank her for staying strong standing up for Queenslanders and working to ensure that we have a strong and healthy and economic recovery. I'd also like to acknowledge the Health Minister and Minister for Ambulance Services, Honourable Yvette Dar, and the former Health Minister, Honourable Stephen Miles, and thank you both for your current and previous work to ensure the health of all Queenslanders. And of course, Deputy Speaker, our Treasurer, Honourable Cameron Dick, who has delivered a budget that ensures our safety um, of Queensland so ensures the safety of Queensland health, environment and our economy. As I've already said, I want to thank our health workers. They have done such a great job and put themselves at the front of the pandemic. That's why, Deputy Speaker, I was so terribly disappointed by the approach the LNP took towards the estimates. The member for Mudrabar, and I note that the um, Minister for Health has already spoken about that, the display on the day was nothing short of disgraceful, Deputy Speaker. From the moment that she walked into the proceedings wearing what I take to be, I'm not really sure, a statement, ironic, quirky, probably not quirky, who knows, but it was a shark's teeth mouth, mask. <laughs> and I'll take that interjection. And from there, the member's manner towards the hard-working, committed and professional public servants was, as I've already said, absolutely and utterly disgraceful. The members' bullying and verbaling of the witnesses was so very disappointing, Deputy Speaker. Today, we have heard so many complaints from those opposite about the estimates process, and yet when they had an opportunity to question the budget, it was just a witch hunt by the member for Mudrabar, and it was a witch hunt against our hard-working public servants. I was actually incredibly embarrassed, Deputy Speaker, my community would expect better behaviour from me, and I would assume that the constituents of Mudrabah would likewise. The dedicated women and men and their hard work, they go to work hard working every day for Queenslanders. They too have they, these hard working public servants, they too that were in attendance at estimates, have to pivot and adjust and make changes to Queensland health, living under and making those changes under a pandemic lens. And they deserve respect and are entitled to respect, which was not on display by the LNP on the day. The ongoing lack of respect for the chair, the witnesses, ignoring the chair's guidance, as well as talking over the top of committee members was appalling. Deputy Chair, it was just terrible and one that I'm ashamed to say took place here in our Queensland Parliament. I do not accept that behaviour. My own community does not accept that behaviour and neither do Queenslanders, Deputy Speaker. At community events that I have attended since the hearing, I have been approached by a number of constituents who watched estimates and they shared with me their dismay and it reminded those public servants of how little regard the LNP has for them as hard-working public servants. And they, these public servants have advised me 
that this behaviour by the LNP on the day only reinforced and reminded them of the terrible history that the LNP has of the lack of respect and of the sacking of public servants. Do I need to remind everyone here present about the opposite's appalling history in health just alone and the appalling health cuts that Bayside has experienced firsthand? Speaker, I'd also like to acknowledge um, all of the work that's gone into the budget, the SDS, for both the health and uh, environment, and acknowledge the great work by Minister Scanlon, Take, acknowledge my colleagues on the committee and thank them to the committee secretariat for their great work, and um, I commend the report to the House. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Ujuru. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to contribute to the debate of the budget estimates of the Health and Environment Committee. In terms of health and ambulance services, what is becoming clearer every day is that this government is losing control of health. While there is no doubt that COVID has stretched the system, we, could have been, we, could, we would have fared far better if Queensland Health had not already been a basket case under successive Labor governments before going into the health crisis. For example, in the Redlands, we still have no intensive care unit or ICU at the Redland Hospital. Redlands residents were not kept safe by this government and still are not safe. For the last six long years, the Palaszczuk government has ignored community calls, they've ignored the medical grounds and basis for the work to be done, and they've ignored my calls for an ICU. Six years, six years calling for it, no ICU. They're the facts. There is not one ICU bed to service 150,000 Redlands residents. Not one bed, one ICU bed to service a region, a growing region of 150,000 residents. The Redlands community was vulnerable and susceptible to the pandemic because of this government's inaction on health. The, the government members might not like the facts nor the truth, but it is what it is. But the government has been dragged into agreeing finally to an ICU, albeit a small one, but a good start, somewhere in the future. As I said in my budget reply speech, over the last six years there has been little state funding to upgrade Redland Hospital, other than the normal funding to maintain it. This government, for many years, has ignored the health needs of our growing and ageing region. I want to thank the federal LNP for leading the way with their catalytic funding that got things moving on the upgrade. The federal LNP funding got things moving again. The $30 million commitment to the ICU and upgrade and additional funds to the car park. Relatedly, the Palaszczuk government has caught up and agreed to matching funding. The state government now needs to fast-track these projects and not drag their, their feet and re-announce it on an election eve in 2024. And bigger, a bigger ICU will soon be needed. A helipad for island emergencies, as previously promised, is needed too. Order. Labor committed to the helipad back when the former member for Lytton, Paul Lucas, was the health minister. In terms of the car park, again thanks to the federal LNP for the funding to get this finally underway. The state government has to now build it and they are yet to announce what the parking costs will be. The parking costs will be and whether any free... Order members. Member for Woodbury, you have the call and any free uh, public spaces will be removed. In terms of palliative care, we now know how underfunded palliative care has been across the whole state. This has resulted in many terminally ill people suffering needlessly. The LNP government started the palliative care service at Redland Hospital and boosted the in-home services. We are keen to know what future investment will, will happen at Redland Hospital in palliative care, and I encourage the minister to provide that information. It has also been reported that Redland Hospital's capacity to undertake adult dental surgeries that require anaesthesia has been reduced, with some patients having to be referred to other hospitals, some hospitals with already extensive waiting lists. Then there has been the Cleveland Satellite Hospital debacle that I mentioned in my budget reply speech. Previous budget documents say that says the government will build the Cleveland Satellite Hospital. The people of Cleveland took that to mean Cleveland, funny enough. Then another budget said it meant Redlands. And then we find out Cleveland's, uh, Cleveland actually equals Redland Bay. The two are entirely distinct cities, just if, if the government members you know, wanted to know. The government plans for health and the Redlands are a shambles. Then there's ambulance ramping that's growing rapidly across, again, across South East Queensland hospitals, and Redlands Hospital, uh, sadly, is one of the worst. 
terms of environment, uh, in terms of the committee uh, and, and, and estimates, when we look at North Stradbroke Island, we, the issue of the headlands overdevelopment is still there because of the, uh, the Kwandamooka revolt about it. Uh, and the, the, the Truth Embassy at Point Lookout and invite government members to come and visit and see it live. Uh, Order, the members. The Whale Centre that will be built on sensitive environmental land. Conservation groups. Co conservation groups are opposed. The Kwandamooka people largely are opposed. Local businesses are opposed. Very few people want this development, a development like this, on pristine and environmentally sensitive Point Lookout headlands. That's why the government only got 5, 6 per cent of the primary vote at the Point Lookout booth. There are lessons there, and I hope they'll listen. The Premier moved the project to less environmentally sensitive land Deputy areas. Speaker. I call the member for Palmerstone. Deputy Speaker, it's such a privilege to follow the member for Ujiru, but I'll come to that later. I rise to endorse the Health and Environment Committee's 2020-2021 budget estimates report. This year's estimates report process was similar to last year's estimates in many ways, the same careful and thorough preparation from both the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services and the Minister for Environment, Science and Youth. We saw the same commitment from our chair, the member for Thurrongower, to providing a fair and balanced estimates with ample opportunities to explore the important issues covered in the portfolios. And again, the opposition received 1.5 hours of additional time for their questions, but again, never managed to find anything particularly on point to ask about. What was more striking than last year's estimates, though, and unfortunately less edifying, was the conduct of visiting LNP members. Not, I will note, the opposition committee members who were, to their detriment, not provided with any opportunity to ask questions whatsoever. The downright contempt for the public servants who came before us, the bullying and verbaling behaviour was not what the public would expect from a shadow minister, but sadly precisely what we on this side of the House have come to expect from LNP members. This was particularly the case when it came to the member for Mudjeruba, whose shark mask may possibly be the most outlandish prop ever to be produced in the history of estimates. In terms of the appropriation bills, particular highlights in the 2021-2022 budget are, of course, the ongoing investment in response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Whether it's resourcing the State Health Emergency Coordination Centre, increasing our intensive care capacity, standing up fever clinics or stepping up the vaccination rollout when the federal government failed so miserably, our very first priority has and will always be keeping Queenslanders safe. Compare that to the LNP members whose policy approach to COVID-19 is summed up well on a billboard that remains on the side of Bribey Island Road in my electorate, reminding motorists that the LNP called to open Queensland's borders 64 times. I note the member for Ujuru's comments about losing control of the health system and that Queensland would have fared better under some mythical alternative. And I'm, I'm reminded of the statistics today of the 1,900 total COVID cases that Queensland has experienced in the course of this pandemic, compared to the 20,000 current active cases in New South Wales across the border. And I wonder under what mythical universe the member for Ujuru considers that Queensland is losing control of our health system. 23, uh, 23, 23 active cases. Order, Member Fujiri. 23 active cases compared to the 23,000 active cases seeded by an out of control outbreak allowed to escalate by the New South Wales Government. And that attitude continued through estimates. No questions about the historic global pandemic we find ourselves in, no questions about how the impact of the GP crisis in our communities. No impacts about how the, that shortage of GPs impacts people's ability to get vaccinated in our outer metro and regional areas. As ever, LNP members went for the cheap shots, the exploitative stories, they blamed public servants, they pretended COVID doesn't exist. Again, I don't refer to opposition committee members given they didn't get any questions. As we saw today from the Shadow Minister, the LNP's approach was to give syrupy, insincere thanks to staff, but punch down with attacks on the work of whole hospitals and health areas. The LNP demand more funding, yet when that funding is provided, they say more funding isn't the answer. And of course, their tragic record of sacking doctors, nurses and health workers leaves their pronouncements in this space distinctly hollow. 
They never planned a single hospital when in government, but they attack and undermine our world-leading program of seven new satellite hospitals. On our satellite hospitals, unlike the LNP, I'm absolutely delighted by our progress on those satellite hospitals. With the people of Bribie Island and Caboolture um, knowing that those new facilities will make a huge difference in providing more health care closer to home for our communities. $105 million in this financial year sees this commitment well on the way to delivery. The Building Better Hospitals program sees an investment of $283 million, including $103 million toward the over $400 million massive redevelopment of Caboolture Hospital, a new NICU a new orthopaedic surgical unit and, and so very much more that is making Caboolture Hospital the very best hospital that it can be. Thank you to our parliamentary staff and secretariat and I particularly want to wish our committee secretary, Jackie Dewar, well as she embarks on a period of leave. I commend the 2020-2021 estimates report of the Health and Environment Committee to the House. I call the member for Morani. Madam Deputy Speaker, as a member of the Health and Environment Committee, I rise to speak on my committee's budget estimates report the 2021-22 financial year. I would like to first acknowledge the enormous contribution made by all our health and ambulance workers over the past 18 months in response to the COVID-19 crisis and to thank them all for their hard work and dedication. In total, this year's budget included $480 million to continue the COVID-19 response, which will deliver fever clinics, contact tracing and testing capability, the vaccination program, compliance activities, facilitation, and government-arranged accommodation, COVID-19 contact centres and wellness checks for people in mandatory, mandatory quarantine. I also bring up that um, the government has been uh, petitioned by Mr Petrovsky from the Flinders University. We did speak to, I did speak to one of the professors from the QMIR. I'd like to see that uh, uh, probably a joint venture between them to maybe manufacture Mr Petrovsky's vaccine if it does become available and it uh, meets all the requirements, which is looking very promising. It gives people choice and it gives them another option. Despite this outlay, however, I don't think it's so secret in anyone in Queensland that our healthcare sector has reached a point of extreme crisis in certain areas, Madam Deputy Speaker. Much of the rural and remote Queensland relies on fly-in, fly-out workers, with some dependent solely on locum workers. In some areas, we see a real crisis in the workforce. This means there are many co communities that are critically underserviced, or some rural hospitals have no doctor to cover one on duty and no effective emergency service. Currently, we have thousands of local do locum doctors and nurses who are unable to travel to regional, rural and remote towns in Queensland due to border closures, which has made our health workforce staff levels uh, much worse. The shortages mean communities are missing out on health care and some rural hospitals may be forced into bypass with inadequate staff levels to function. Queensland's hospital system is buckling under certain areas and the patients flooding out of its doors. We are seeing critical shortages of GPs in the regions and major shortages of bulk billing and no beds. We need hundreds more beds and lots more funding and resources, a lot more. I know in my own region, hospitals are struggling to cope with the clogged emergency departments, chronic ambulance ramping, too few beds and a lot of burnt out staff that are struggling to stay in their jobs. We are seeing record numbers of patients and they just don't have to start, have the staff or beds to cope. The simple, the, the simple thing is that the system is swamped. One big thing I think the government could do is help fix this problem would be to grant exemptions for health workers and alternatives to mandatory 14-day 14, 14 hotel quarantines. There are actually a range of strategies which the government could use to support staff and make sure Queenslanders have access to high quality clinical care during this latest crisis. And some of these suggestions I've heard, including escalating virtual health platforms, redeploying clinical staff to higher risk areas and appointing locums from other areas of the state. A big part of the problem is the way our health sector has become a political football when the state and federal governments, the feds say it's a state issue and the state say it's a fed issue. And nothing seems to happen in the middle of the, in the mix of all that. I don't really care which government does it, as long as someone needs to start freeing up hospital beds or we'll see the sector move past crisis mode into full meltdown, and we don't want to see that at all. And we don't want to put our hospital staff and frontline workers under so much pressure and duress that the system fails for them as well. In closing, I would like to thank the other members of the committee. Um, I'd like to also wish uh, our head secretariat, Jackie Dewar, all the best with her operation that she's just recently had. Um, my, my thoughts go out to Jackie and thank you to all the staff. The other members, 
played a, a very important role in hearing and helping provide much needed oversight and scrutiny to the process. There was a little bit of a kerfuffle there, as other members have spoken about. Um, we need to keep things cordial and also make sure that it's worthwhile and meaningful. The health system and environmental systems that we have in Queensland are very important to our state and need to be treated as such. And thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Deputy Speaker, I support the 2021 um, Budget Estimate Report Number 9 uh, for the Health and Environment um, Committee. Um, I'd like to thank the committee members, especially the chair, the member for Tharangara, and the parliamentary support secretariat minister, and the minister Yvette Darth, her staff, and also the hardworking departmental staff that tirelessly prepared for a successful and robust estimates hearing. Um, Deputy Speaker, Queensland Health has continued to play a leading role in the state's um, response to and recovery. Um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Queensland Health has pivoted the health system to ensure that the health of the community is protected to prepare for any of the outbreaks that may occur. Um, I was just listening intently to the member for Moreni talking about his concern for um, healthcare workers. Um, the best thing the member for Moreni could do is stop running freedom rallies, which, encourage, which encourages people to not wear masks, don't vaccinate, open the borders, which would put a huge impact onto the health workers. It just would be, um, it would be a huge Im impact on our health system. Just look at what's happening at New South Wales. If we were to have the freedoms that the many for, member for um, Moreni is out there banging on about in the community. Uh, Deputy Speaker, um, we can only speculate what the effects of the LNP's reckless tirade of complaint and negativity is having on the morale of our health workers. Um, just imagine how they must feel month after month how, when they are staring down the greatest threat to the public health that we face in this century, only to have those opposite label their efforts as a failure. We must, um, it must be dispiriting to be working so hard into keeping fellow Queenslanders safe, only to have those efforts so carelessly disparaged by those opposite. Well, Mr Speaker, on this side of the House, we stand with our frontline workers and we pay tribute to the great contribution that they make every single day to improve the lives of those in need of our health care. Queenslanders have so much to be, feel proud of. We have crushed the latest outbreak of Delta. Queensland, this is your achievement. This has been your compliance and your responsiveness and your endurance that has helped us to, at least for now, suppress the virus and avoid the catastrophe that is unfolding to our south. And that's why the member for Moreni needs to think about what he's doing when he's out there campaigning um, for freedoms. Queensland's record on health budget will focus, um, has focused on recruiting frontline staff, building health infrastructure. We've got runs on the board when it comes to infrastructure. I've visited some of our um, upgrades and rebuilds at Longreach, um, the upgrades to the surgery department, the maternity department, that now has been overrun by bonnie babies, that, with mums in the region choosing to have their babies close to home, the new hospital at Roma. We are also reducing emergency and surgical wait, um, wait times and continuing to protect our state against COVID-19. This budget is focused on delivering Queensland's economic recovery from COVID-19. It is one that will ensure that our state public health system remains well resourced, financially um, sustainable to cope with the current and future demands. Since March 2020, our health system has um, faced an unprecedented challenges that we, as we manage this pandemic. Our health system has responded strongly to the threat of COVID-19 from our early response of testing, treating and now contributing to manage outbreaks and vaccinating Queensland. It's our um, largest mass vaccination 
push to the state's history. I've had both my AstraZeneca doses, one at a community pharmacy and the second at my GP. We have um, rolled out many ways of getting um, vaccinations into people's arms. Get out there and encourage your communities to go online, book their vaccination. This is what we can do for the whole of Queensland. Queensland Health delivers world-class health care now, and this budget will ensure that it continues well into the future. Um, our budget has grown once again. Madam Speaker. I call the member for South Brisbane. Madam Speaker, this time last month we sat in estimates hearings for the Health and Environment Committee. Between the state of our health system and the state of our environment, two issues crucial to Queenslanders. You'd think the inquiry would be an opportunity for transparency and accountability in government decision making. But the entire estimates process in Queensland is pretty embarrassing for the government. The sessions are dominated by Dorothy Dixes from government backbenchers mixed with some very adversarial debates with the opposition examples. With the crumbs of time left over for the crossbench, I asked about funding for eating disorders, Members to my right, order. funding for rural maternity services, crucial access to pregnancy terminations and pressures on our ambulance system. By and large, we received indirect and filibustering responses. And it wasn't ever any better for my colleague Michael Berkman asking questions about the environment portfolio. Estimates shouldn't be a waste of time, but it's hard to see what the government is trying to achieve with the system we currently have. With, with changes like a ban on Dorothy Dix's, providing enough time for Order. MPs to ask questions, expanding ac access to questions on notice, we can ensure that estimates deliver some real transparency and accountability for Queenslanders. Like transparency in our health system. Madam Speaker, there's a crisis in our health system in Queensland with the pandemic further disrupting a system that's already stretched to its limits. I've had nurses, patients and healthcare workers visiting my office to raise the alarm. People dying while waiting for ambulances, overworked staff and ballooning waiting lists. To give you an idea of the decision making that got us here, when the government realised its bottom line was out after the first shocks of COVID-19 pandemic, it froze the wages for healthcare workers instead of doing things like raising royalties or levying property developers. And this wage freeze is still in effect, meaning nurses, allied health workers and frontline workers are being paid less than what the government signed them up for and less than what they deserve ripping millions of dollars out of our economy and out of the hands of essential workers right when we need it most. The same mindset led to a 2 per cent efficiency dividend being slapped on Queensland Health at the same time as the government was talking up its health commitments ahead of the election. The example the Treasurer gave here was pretty visceral. He said, imagine we're asking Queensland Health to do 100 endoscopies a day. And he said, now we're just asking them to do 102 with the same money. I say, why not just tax mining billionaires properly? Tax property developers properly. Tax those companies that have profited over the pandemic. Those companies that you get Order members. donations from and fund the health care that Queenslanders need. And it's not just the hospital system in crisis. Even before people get to the hospitals, our ambulance system is stretched to its limits. During estimates, I asked about single officer stations and how the ambulance services plans for the safety issues associated with those. The incidences of ramping were well covered during hearings. If we raise revenue from the big end of town, we could create tens of thousands more hospital beds, a thousand more ICU beds, and raise Queensland to world best standard. We could, include, we could employ thousands of new nurses and doctors, expanding much needed emergency department capacity and improve nurse to patient ratios. This morning, we heard about the vital importance of voluntary assisted dying in Queensland, alongside the need to urgently boost investment in palliative care. The budget commits just $171 million for the palliative care strategy through to 25-26, sitting starkly against the extra $247 million per year that we actually need for a functioning palliative care system. I asked about funding for eating disorder treatments, 
and I urge the Queensland Government to ensure that the federal funding flows through com to community services on the ground. I asked about the Rural Maternity Task Force and plans to ensure good access to maternity care for all Queenslanders. I asked about the lack of access to pregnancy terminations. Despite decriminalisation, abortions remain inaccessible to most Queenslanders. Abortion, like all other health care, should be safe, legal and freely accessible in our public health care system. And against this backdrop, we've got a government allowing NRL players and families over the border instead of Queenslanders stuck interstate. Thank you. The question is that part of the report of the Health and Environment Committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the report of the Transport and Resources Commi Committee be adopted. I call the member for Kawonga. Thanks, Speaker. I uh, rise this evening to speak to the estimates report tabled by the Transport and Resources Committee. This report's number 10 from our committee. Our committee started, we had a long day ahead of us. Sadly, it did start poorly with a cheap stunt about one of our committee members who'd been stood down and replaced for the day and whether he was still being paid. The issues were completely beyond the control of our committee. The Secretariat, myself, or the Transport and Main Roads Minister, who, who was there to answer questions and was quite bemused that his time was being wasted and the committee's time in this way. The opposition members knew full well the issue could not be resolved there and then, and it was a disappointing way to start the day. I sincerely hope there's no complaints about time being wasted, as they were guilty of this from the get-go. I've just also got to pass comment on some of the visiting members, um, Everton, Broadwater and Maroochydore, who, in my opinion, they blatantly disregard the process, constantly spoke over the minister and tried to speak over the chair. Um, the member from Maroochydore in particular is a former speaker who many in this place, including myself, look up to. And it was certainly disappointing this occurred not only in, in our session but in others I watch. Um, speaker, I made a point of allowing just about every question to proceed to ministers and officials. Despite imputation and arguments in most of them, I allowed the ministers to answer as they saw fit when a question was deliberately inflammatory, and if the members from Maroochydore, Broadwater and Everton had waited to hear the answers to their obviously loaded questions, the sessions would have gone a lot smoothly, more smoothly. As it was, non-government uh, 97 questions, the government did 49, uh, four and a half hours to three and a half hours respectively. The questions during the day highlighted some great achievements of the Palaszczuk government. One in particular that grabbed me um, was the backing um, of Queensland Maritime Jobs by supporting the establishment of a new coastal shipping service, which not only provides stimulus to regional Queensland, but invests in skills and training capacity to help grow Queensland's maritime workforce. And Speaker, when our previous committee did an inquiry into this industry, we saw that the training for future maritime workers, who will become our tugboat and pilot boat captains, Maritime Safety Queensland officers who protect our reef, that should be a priority. As a lot of vessels that use our ports are non-Australian flag vessels, they certainly aren't the best training ground for maritime workers who navigate ships around our reef. Our reef's unique, and we want industry-trained local people who care about its future working around and protecting it. I could go on for ages about the fantastic things our government's doing in the transport space, but I'll move on. I just have to say, um, Cross River Rail had reached a significant um, milestone and now both Else and Merle have broken through and we as a committee will be visiting that project soon and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing those boring, not boring, boring, not boring, boring machines. Um, in the portfolio area for the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen, Minister for Public Works and Procurement, the highlight for me was the money which includes undertaking design and costing studies for a pumped hydro project at Barumba. Um, coming from the electricity supply industry myself and seeing how efficient Wyvernhoe is, this body of work really excites me. Uh, these renewable clean power stations are not only great in an emergency, as was evidenced recently during the failure of the coal-fired power station at Calide, they also work as a battery to provide stable power during our evenings when solar doesn't generate. The resources portfolio questioning was a decent process and I commend the Shadow Minister, the Member for Condamine, for his civil manner and decent questioning in both this and the energy portfolio areas. I also must commend the Shadow Minister for Transport, the Member for Chatsworth, who came in via video for reasonable questioning and respect, respect for the process. I'd like to thank our committee members, our Deputy Chair, Member for Gregory, committee members, members of Mount Omni, Ipswich, Toowoomba North and Calloid for their participation on the day. 
I'd like to thank the ministers, their staff, directors general and their departments, GOC executives for their participation on the day. We had a number of non-committee members who attended. Um, I'd like to thank them for their participation. I hope they can be more professional next time. And also, I'd just like to say, I would like them to see our committee members get some more questions on the day too. They work hard and deserve that. Um, thanks to Hansard parliamentary staff and everyone who worked hard on the day. We were a hybrid speaker of the estimates process because of the uh, Delta strain outbreak we'd had. And I've got to say that we're in the Undumbi room. I think it worked really well. The setup was as good as, if not better, than the normal process. I commend all the parliamentary staff who facilitated this so we could get estimates completed. We had a good day, a very, very long day, but I think, I think we got a lot done. I commend the report to the House. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Chatsworth. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, evidence provided to the Transport and Resources Committee demonstrate that this government is losing control of major transport projects. Now, there's no larger example of the government losing control than the Cross River Rail project. The true cost remains a mystery. We do know that it is higher than the 5.4 billion number that is often quoted by Minister Bailey, with the budget documents stating that the capital project cost is closer to 6.9 billion. Questions remain, however, about other components of the project, like Clapham Rail stabling yards. These are separate line items in the budget. When you add these separate line items, the total cost could be closer to $7.4 billion. Now, during the estimates hearing, representatives of the Cross River Rail Delivery Authority advise that passengers will start using Cross River Rail in 2025. This is contrary to previous government statements, such as a ministerial statement from April 2019, and I quote, Cross River Rail would be ready to service the South East by 2024, end quote. While Order. Cross River Rail is certainly shaping as the government's greatest project management failure, it is not, sadly, the only one. Despite previously stating that the Coomera Connector would start construction in mid-2021, a contractor is yet to be appointed for the first section of Stage 1. The full completion of Stage 1 by 24-25 is looking indeed very doubtful. Madam Deputy Speaker, last Wednesday's truck rollover on the M1 at Pimpama shows why we desperately need the Coomera Connector. The incident happened at 1.45pm but wasn't cleared until around about 8.15pm. Traffic was backed up 20 kilometres. The TMR website used to say that Stage 1 construction would start in mid-2021. The website confirms that the project is still in the pre-construction phase. The Minister for Transport and Main Roads needs to advise the House for the reason for the delay. How will he get the project back on track and exactly when motorists will be able to actually use this road? The Transport and Main Roads Department has also refused to commit uh, to the stated 2024 completion date for the Beerburrum to Nambour rail duplication. That project currently has a $10.5 million underspend and the planned 21-22 expenditure has almost been halved. The Gold Coast Light Rail Stage 3 project was meant to start construction by Christmas last year. The contract for the main work is yet to be signed. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's not just major construction projects. This minister has Order members. In delivering. The government also previously announced the development of a regional airfares tracking tool, but has since decided that it's not needed. The department couldn't advise what resources were wasted on this initiative before it was cancelled. South Australia has had digital driver's licences since 2017, New South Wales since 2019. When Queenslanders will get them remains unknown, despite a successful trial being completed in 2020. Integrity also remains an issue for this government. Again, the minister has been unable to answer questions about a matter because it was before the Triple C. It always is, or commercial incompetence. This time, it related to the appointment of the CEO of Gladstone Ports Corporation. The board had made a unanimous recommendation, unanimous recommendation for the appointment of an individual, but the reasons why the minister didn't agree with this decision remains indeed a deep mystery. The department was also unable to provide any details on the appointment of Owen Dugan, who was the former head of the Rail, Tram and Bus Union, a major Labor Party donor, to the board of North Queensland Bulk Ports. The almost 
$6 billion maintenance backlog continues to hinder economic development in Queensland. There's no better example of this than the Barron River Bridge. Bridge restrictions were meant to be in place until September, while serious structural issues were addressed. The Department has now said it will be at least October 2021. I inspected the bridge last week when I spent time in Cairns, and I was stuck on the Coranda side of the bridge for nearly 14 minutes. Queensland Rail. Even though the Department Order, said members. Order. Two, two Order, member minutes. for Pine Rivers. I'll repeat that. Two minutes was stated in estimates was the average delay time. Yet there's a sign 200 metres up the road from the bridge which says expect, and I'll speak slowly for the member for Pine Rivers, 15 minutes. Another order big members associated with this minister. I call the minister. Oh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. That was entertaining. Um, you know, the, uh, it's fascinating, the committee, because uh, from what I hear, uh, the member of Chatsworth was basically opposed to the member for Calide saying anything or asking any questions. That doesn't surprise me because it's well known that the member for Chatsworth and the member for Calide don't get on. But what surprised me is that the member for Calide actually acceded to it, was compliant to it, Mr Speaker. Uh, so what we saw was a committee member uh, who was paid $24,000 extra uh, to be on the committee and then did not say a word to me as the Transport Minister, did not, did not ask uh, a single question, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, so what we saw, what we saw, look, we, we saw the member for Bonnie run out of questions in his session, and look, but, but at least that was better than having no questions whatsoever, Mr Speaker, the, the member for Chatsworth. I mean, uh, he might be the squealer from, Bill, uh, from Billa Wheeler on Facebook, but, but in, in Brisbane, he's silent and compliant, Mr. Speaker. Order, members. Uh, Minister, I'll remind you of the correct use of titles. I'd ask you to withdraw. Uh, I withdraw. But mem member, uh, the member for Calide, silent and compliant in Brisbane, talks big on Facebook. That's his story. So, you know, uh, I look forward to another Marcel Marceau routine after he loses, uh, l loses Flynn, Mr. Speaker, because I don't think the people of Flynn are going to send somebody who is quiet and silent when they come into the halls of power. They're going to elect somebody who actually gets things done. So, Mr Speaker, let me just run through a few Order things. Member let, for me, mine. let me rebut um, some of the rather silly contributions from the member for Chatsworth. We, may, we, we remember the member for Chatsworth. He, he was the Assistant Minister for Public Transport in the Newman Government when they ordered non-compliant trains made overseas, uh, cut drivers by 48, uh, stopped driver training, uh, it was, it was a, an absolute botch up, Mr Speaker, and they've still got him in transport on main roads. You know, how do you figure that? Um, but you know, in terms of Cross River Rail, we have seen the reporting of Cross River Rail consistent over three budgets. If you'd have listened to his speech, you would have thought there was some great revelation this year. But the fact is it cost $5.4 billion uh, with $1.5 billion in private uh, contributions from the private sector, 6.9 billion. It's been in three budgets: 2019, 2020, 2021. Uh, and yet, so I, I don't know what the member for Chatsworth was doing in the previous budget because he didn't he didn't pick up on it whatsoever. It hasn't changed. The independent order office has said that they have no issue with this project whatsoever. Uh, I think the independent order office has got a lot more credibility than the member for Chatsworth or those opposite. It's been announced and known for a long time, a long time, Speaker, that the construction will, start, will cease in 2024 and it will open in 2025 after an extens extensive testing regime. This has been established for a long time, Speaker. So those opposite, they cut this when they're in power because they hate this project, and then they promised to cut again in 2017. How did that go? Member for Chatsworth. How did that go? So, Mr Speaker, Coomera Connector, it was blocked by the LNP when they were in power, as was well reported in the Gold Coast Bulletin, when the, when the member was an assistant minister. Uh, it's this government that's gazetted all three sections of it, got $1.5 billion lined up in joint funding, and we're getting on with the job. So if you want to get roads under or rail done, you go with Labor. If you want cuts, you want nothing, you get the LNP, Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, I, we're spending 50 percent of for infrastructure now than when we were first elected. So I'm glad to hear the member for Chatsworth has been up, up at the Barron River Bridge. I hope he drove his BMW uh, convertible up there, Speaker, with his cravat sort of flapping in the breeze. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope, I hope he, uh, I hope he uh, had a good look up there, Speaker. Um, but what we're also looking at here is 
Uh, the beer bar to Nambour rail upgrade, half a billion dollars worth of rail upgrade coming. It's, we're looking for some federal approvals. Uh, that, if the member of Chatsworth had any sincerity at all, he'd be lobbying the federal government to get the approvals done. This was reported at estimates, but once again, they never stand up for Queensland, do they? They never stand up for Queensland. Gladstone Port Corporation, they're going to sell it off. Strong choices, uh, absolutely ri ridiculous. So, Speaker, we've got the sixth record infrastructure budget in, seven, in, in six years under this government. Order Member Theodore. Yep. We know that those opposite only cut when they get in. They cut, they sack and they sell. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Pause Nothing's the clock. Changed, Pause the clock. Uh, Minister, resume your seat, please. Member for Theodore, you're on a warning. I call the Minister. That's all they do when they're whatever they say, Speaker, we know. They cut projects, they sack workers, that's in their DNA. We know that's we know they're struggling over there. Look at the by election result. One of the worst by election results for an opposition in 150 years in Queensland. They're going nowhere under the member for Broadwater, and aren't they frustrated? I call the member for Condamine. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to the debate on the Transport and Resources Committee report, the Budget Estimates 2021-22. Mr Deputy Speaker, as Shadow Minister for Natural Resources, Mines and Energy, the Committee were good enough to allow me to participate in the hearing and put questions to the Ministers regarding the expenditure that come under the two relevant Ministers. I would like to thank the committee members, beginning with over this side, the Deputy Chair, Member for Gregory, Lachlan Miller, Member for Toowoomba North, Trevor Watts, and the Member for uh, Callide, Colin Boyce. I would also like to thank the Chair, Member for Kwongba, Shane King, Member for Mount Omni, Jess Pugh, and the Member for Ipswich, Jennifer Howard, who substitute for the disgraced Member for Mundingmurra, Les Walker. I will acknowledge... Uh, pause the, the clock. Um, pause the clock. Uh, we won't be referring uh, to members in that manner, and I'll remind you, to the member, that the standing orders in relation to sub judice uh, apply. I call the member for condamine. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, I, know, I would like to um, actually uh, commend the, the chair for the way he uh, handled uh, the committee hearings. It was it was better than some of his colleagues, I've got to say. Mr. Deputy Speaker. It was very disappointing to only have been allocated 45 minutes for opposition questions to the Minister for Energy. So what were we able to find in that limited time? Well, we discovered that the Minister has no plan to reach a 50 per cent renewable energy target. The Minister was unable to answer any question on what the energy mix will be at any stage of the transition. But, Mr Speaker, we did discover that the Minister does have a plan to develop a plan. But the Minister was unable to inform the committee when that plan may be developed and made public. This is something all involved in the energy, energy sector are crying out for, some confirmation that there is a plan or a roadmap to reach a renewable target or there is a very real possibility of chaos in the network. Madam De uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the most significant announcements in the budget was the announcement of $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund. Despite this commitment, the Minister was unable to inform the committee how this figure was arrived at and how much of the money, how the money would be spent. To make an announcement of this magnitude with no idea of where at least $1.5 billion would be invested is staggering. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the Minister was asked as to the accountability and transparency around this fund, the Minister claimed the question was completely outrageous. Fancy that, Mr Deputy Speaker, the audacity of asking a question about the use of public monies at an estimate hearing. I'll just now switch to uh, the session which was devoted to the resource sector. Here, once again, we have a minister without a plan, but there is no need for concern as the minister is working on a plan, or a team of consultants are working on a plan, as they work their way through the $771,000 budgeted for their input although the minister was unable to give the committee a date when that plan might be finalised. This is at a time that West Australia is powering ahead of Queensland. Whilst mining investment has declined under this Palaszczuk government, West Australia has increased by 10 per cent. This is a similar story regarding mineral exploration. Previously, Queensland attracted one in four mining dollars, exploration dollars. For 2021, that was only one in every eight dollars. With rare minerals fueling new technology, that number is incredibly low. This also places a question mark 
about how viable the budget revenue figures are in the long term as royalty revenue is a sizeable chunk of the revenue base for this government. We did hear that the Minister still has no plan to approve the Ackland Coal Mine and is happy to see that mine close along with all the job losses that will come with that. Mr Deputy Speaker, during the estimates hearing, I spent some time questioning the Minister and the Department regarding some issues that have emerged as a result of Arrow Energy's CXT GFT activities at Nandai, just outside Dalby. The Nandai area is high-value agricultural land which also sits on top of a large deposit of gas in Arrow's tenement. This is the first time gas extraction has, has occurred on intensively farmed land and was always going to be a challenge. Unfortunately, things could have been done better, as was revealed during estimates. It also raises some questions as to the effectiveness of the Regional Planning Interest Act. We were informed that the Gasfield Commission is conducting a review of this Act. We await the findings of this review, as amendments are all, were always going to be needed, not just regarding resource activities, but other uses that have emerged conflicting with agricultural uses. Resources are a vital part of the Queensland economy, and we need to get that mix right. Deputy Speaker. I call the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen, Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak to the Transport and Resources Committee report for the 2021-22 budget estimates. And I thank the members of uh, the committee uh, and those who participated in the hearing uh, for their time. And I thank them for their uh, somewhat varying levels of interest in the portfolios of energy, renewables and hydrogen, public works and, and procurement. I also want to acknowledge the ongoing leadership of the committee chair, the member for Kuangba. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government's 2021 budget delivered the single largest investment in energy in Queensland's history. And I acknowledge the committee's recommendation that the appropriation bills be agreed to without amendment. That endorsement is yet another vote of confidence, a vote of confidence in the Palaszczuk government's economic recovery plan. And I thank and acknowledge the committee for that. And thanks to the questions put by members on this side of the House, Deputy Speaker, I have the opportunity to talk about a number of things. Member for Kuangba has already mentioned the $22 million uh, towards uh, pumped hydro at, Bur at Burumba Dam. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk about the rollout of Queensland's renewable energy zones and the $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund. And whilst I'm on my feet, uh, Deputy Speaker, I might uh, respond in the same way that I did during the estimates hearing to the member for Condamine. It is incredibly weak, incredibly weak to rely on parliamentary privilege to suggest uh, uh, to uh, impugn the character of the leadership of our government-owned corporations and suggest in some way that they might engage in the misappropriation of taxpayer funds, Mr Speaker. And I'd recommend to the member for Condamine that he be very very careful in future, Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it was also very uh, disappointing, yet under, unsurprising, those opposite uh, sought to use the estimates process to undermine Queensland's renewable energy potential. They've done it here again today. We know that the opposition sent an MP, so they sent an MP that doesn't believe in renewable energy to ask questions about renewable energy. A fantasy. That same opposition member calls it. That same. Order, Member for Gregory. You're on the speaking list next. Call the Minister. And I remind the member for Gregory, Deputy Speaker, that not one renewable energy project, not one single renewable energy project was delivered in three years under their leadership. And yet those opposite sat, sat in the estimates uh, hearing criticising how Queensland's renewable energy targets will be achieved. And Deputy Speaker, I was a little shocked. And I think we're all probably a little shocked that those opposite actually know what a renewable energy target was. We were quite surprised, and I'm, and I'm hoping that one of them might take the opportunity to inform Prime Minister Scott Morrison about targets. And Deputy Speaker, it was equally disappointing for those opposite to undermine the work of the Queensland Building Regulator. Uh, it is the same old LNP still attacking the public service. Clearly, they have learned nothing since 2015. Now, even though facts are lost on people like the member for Everton, uh, here are a few more. Uh, the data shows that the Queensland Building and Construction has delivered reduction in the number of defects in new homes in Queensland, reduction of industry insolvencies, reduction in underpayment and non-payment to Queensland tradies. There are more construction companies licensed in Queensland now under their leadership. Building approvals, in fact, up 49.5 per cent as at May 2021. And importantly, by working with construction companies, suppliers, unions, 
unions and the QBCC, we have kept Queensland construction sites open and tradies at work in this state. And I remind the LNP that there is no turnover for tradies doing renos in occupied homes in New South Wales once, uh, uh, right now. And so I once again place on my record my thanks to all members uh, for their somewhat varying interest uh, in these portfolio areas. And I referred in my opening to the varying interests of the committee because uh, the current member for Callied sits on the Transport and Resources Committee. And so profound, so incredibly profound were his contributions during the hearing in relation to this portfolio, Deputy Speaker, that I've scoured Hansard, worked with my office and placed all the member for Callied's remarks on this piece of paper. And I'm happy to table a collation and summary of his contributions at that estimates hearing, but this place deserves a higher level and a higher standard than those set by those opposite. So I will resist, I will resist Deputy Speaker, but it must be incredibly disappointing, incredibly disappointing for households and businesses in towns like Billawila, in Calliope, in Chinchilla and Jinjin, incredibly disappointing that their elected member, the member for Callide, has completely tuned out of this place. He is tuned out of the Queensland Parliament his eyes are on his next job, not the job that he was elected to do. And, Deputy Speaker, I'm sure that all members can agree regional Queenslanders deserve better than that and better than the LNP. Uh, before I call the next member, I just remind members that we have very broad uh, latitude when it comes to tabling uh, documents um, and that attempts to table documents and then withdraw them could be viewed as a, a breaching standing orders around the use of props. I call the member for Gregory. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, an opportunity to talk about the estimates process, but just listening uh, to the minister before, they must be absolutely worried about the, the seat of Flynn. You've got the number one attacker, the Minister for Transport. He spends more time talking about the member for Calide than he does about transport, about fixing up roads in regional Queensland. We just had the minister before talking about the member for Callide. I think the member for Callide, Colin, would be absolutely pleased at the moment. I mean, I wish he was in the, uh, uh, the chamber with us now. You just continue to talk about the member for Callide. How about focus on your job, fixing up the roads, providing the energy and doing your job, not focusing on the member for Callide? Do your job. You spend more time talking about the member for Calais than you talk about your own portfolios. Mr Deputy Speaker, first of all, I'm going to give some credit. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the chair of our committee, uh, Shane King, the member for Kuang Bar. He did an excellent job. He did do an excellent job. And he allowed us to ask the questions in block. He didn't interfere on each question when we put it across. He allowed our 20-minute block and he allowed that to do. So I call on the member for Logan and the other chairs. Have a look at the chairman of our committee. Order, members. The member for, the member for Kuomba did a great job as being a chair. And he allowed us to ask more questions than we needed to, as in he allowed us to do more with our questions than his own government members. So, member for Kuomba, thank you. Thank you. But the reality is, if you've looked over the last two weeks, even though we had that break because of the lockdown, the estimates process is broken here in Queensland. It is broken. When you have chairs of committees and government members interfering with opposition questions and trying, Order, members. trying to delay an opportunity for the opposition to ask a question, that is the right of opposition members in the estimates process is to ask questions of ministers department heads, DGs and people involved with those portfolios. They have a right, and Queenslanders expect us to have a right. Now, I'll take the interjection from the member for Logan. Go and ask the journalists here in Queensland Parliament. Go and ask people, what do you think of the estimate process? They think it is an absolute waste of time. In fact, <clears throat> I'll be sure that most journalists, when it comes to the estimate process, dread those two weeks. They know they are going to get nothing out of it, and the government, the minister, the government members and some of these committees obviously um, don't treat the estimates process what it was designed to be set up for. The estimates process is broken, and if everyday Queenslanders had an opportunity to see exactly how this estimate process, if they, if they, if they wanted to see it, they would say this is not how it should be done. 
Um, uh, finally, Mr uh, Deputy Chair, uh, one thing I do want to raise is the Labor government decided not to proceed with the establishment of the personalised transport ombudsman uh, and obviously wasting around $430,000 to set up the office. So basically we spent $430,000, taxpayers' hard-earned cash, and we abandoned the personal transport ombudsman. OK, that's fine. You were told by that, by the industry, by the taxi industry and the limo industry, it was never going to work. But yet you proceeded with it and wasted $430,000. I mean, what could have half a, almost half a million dollars done for the people of Gregory? Well, we could have properly funded the school bus drop-off at the Emerald State High School, for a start, which we've been calling for the last five years. And we could also start a proper school bus drop-off for Denison School in Emerald as well. That would have been better. Obviously, one of the issues that I continue to talk about is the almost $6 billion in maintenance backlog continues to hinder the economic development of regional Queensland. You've only got to go on the Dorset Highway, and I call on the Minister for Transport. Go for a drive. Come with me. We'll jump in a car, and I'll drive the Dorset Highway. I'll have to give you a crash helmet in the car because you'll be hitting your head everywhere on the road. It's the same with the Capricorn Highway. And finally, to the Minister for Resources, Please give ample consideration for Ackland to go ahead. We need that economic development in the Darling Downs. There is no reason that Ackland shouldn't go ahead when you have mines going ahead in central Queensland. So please approve that mine. I call the Minister for Resources. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the tabling of the Transport and Resources Committee report into the proposed budget appropriations for 2021-22. I acknowledge the committee's recommendations that the proposed expenditure as detailed in the budget bills be agreed to without amendment. I'd also like to thank the chair, the committee members, my department and all those who participated in the hearing for taking part in this important role of our parliamentary system. Mr Speaker, the resource industry is a traditional strength of Queensland and it's shown how essential it is during the global pandemic. It's a key part of Queensland's economic recovery, and right now it directly supports 85,000 people in work and more than 15,200 businesses. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a record. The largest number ever of people employed in the resource sector in Queensland. And it is evidence that the Palaszczuk government effective leadership supporting the industry as a job creator and an economic driver. The industry has worked closely with the government through these uncertain times, and to date, Mr Deputy Speaker, there has not been one single case of COVID in the resource sector, which is testament to how serious they treat this. The resource sector generates billions of dollars in royalties, which allows us to invest in our health system, our schools and our roads. To set a strong vision for the sector, the Palaszczuk government is investing more than $42 million into Queensland's resource sector and land programs as part of the 21-22 state budget. The government will continue to support the resources industry with this investment, which will help the sector continue as a key driver of our economic recovery plan from COVID-19. We will continue to help explorers discover new opportunities through a popular collaborative exploration initiative, with the latest round of this awarded in July this year. These grants are important because supporting the exploration industry is for finding vital new deposits, creating new opportunities and developing new projects, which means more royalties, more exports and more jobs for Queenslanders. Mr Deputy Speaker, gas is also a key part of the resource industry, and that's why we're looking at potentially new opportunities in that space. In June this year, we announced the initial concept phase of the $5 million Bowen Basin Pipeline Gas Study which is now underway. This work is continuing and will investigate the potential pipeline and infrastructure to improve delivery of Bowen Basin gas to the domestic and export markets. There are already thousands of jobs in the gas industry and this work could provide hundreds more. Just this month, Mr Deputy Speaker, Senex Energy announced a multi-million dollar expansion of its Project Atlas, Atlas operations. This $40 million investment means the company will increase gas production by 50% or 18 petajoules of natural gas per year. 
More importantly, the expansion will create 100 jobs and inject around $15 million into nearby regional communities such as Wandoan and Roma. Mr Deputy Speaker, we're also providing relief in, areas of my, in other areas of my portfolio, which is particularly important during COVID-19. We've given rent reprieve to weather-affected primary producers in our state because we know how important they are in our economic recovery. The 21-22 budget will deliver $3.2 million in land rent rebates to support landholders who are still struggling with drought. In addition to this, drought-declared landholders will be granted a hardship deferral for required rent payments. This is important and tangible on-the-ground support as a key part of this state's economy. Also, as part of my department's work, we continue to engage with stakeholders as we develop the Queensland Resources Industry Development Plan. This important work will help shape the resource industry in years to come and will examine not only new challenges but also new opportunities for the sector. QRIDIT will provide a clear vision for industry regarding the exciting future of mining in Queensland and provide greater certainty for investors, both domestic and international. Under the Palaszczuk Government, there has been $21 billion invested or committed to resource projects, which has created more than 8,000 jobs. The search for new economy minerals will continue with the assistance of our Collaborative Exploration Initiative grants. These new economy minerals are increasing in demand as the global energy transition continues. The 2021-22 Queensland budget provides the Palaszczuk government, uh, proves the Palaszczuk government understands the importance of the resource sector and will continue to back new opportunities in the industry. It provides investment, opportunities, jobs and vision for the resource sector and vital for delivering our COVID-19 economic recovery plan. Before you resume your seat, Minister, could I ask you you move that the debate be now adjourned? I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those that have opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. It being uh, almost 7pm, I notify members that it is time for the automatic adjournment of the House in accordance with Sessional Orders 2.2. I call the member for Glasshouse. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was wonderful to attend events in the community over the weekend, such as the Wamuran State School Circus Carnival and the Woodford Historical Society 41st Villeneuve and Newham reunion. It's great that we have zero new cases of COVID and that as a result we are enjoying a freedom that others in this nation are not. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it has come at a very heavy cost. I've spoken on numerous occasions about the challenges and stress the small business owners of Glasshouse have been experiencing, and I've shared the devastation felt by our local wedding venues in having to tell brides and grooms their special day can't proceed as planned. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased the media is now starting to ask questions about mental health and report on the well-being of Queenslanders. Announcing COVID cases and deaths is one thing, I fear the number of deaths related to lockdowns, bankruptcies, isolation and uncertainty is so much higher. As reported in today's Courier-Mail, there is deep distress over the impact of lockdowns, with 90% of Queensland, 30 per cent of Queenslanders revealing the emotional well-being of themselves or their families has suffered in the past three months. Most Queenslanders worry less about catching COVID-19 than losing their jobs, with business closures and job losses topping the list of concerns for 58 per cent of people as the financial costs of lockdown hits home. Mental health is the second biggest concern. Just over half of Queenslanders know someone whose mental health has suffered during the pandemic. And the recent decision by the Premier and the Government to now lock out Queenslanders from returning to Queensland is adding to the anguish. Essential workers like Stephen Cross are locked out of the state. Stephen wrote to, the, to me with the following. I'm working on a project that is crucial to the Queensland New South Wales Electricity State Interconnector, and I'm caught up in the Queensland border restrictions on a constant basis. My company has applied for example, exemptions without success, and I've also applied personally for an agriculture border pass as I am a primary producer, also without success. I've received no feedback from any of the applications and even to advise that they have received the application. I've spoken to multiple people in different government departments, including Queensland Health, and I've received numerous comments without anyone able to give me concrete answers as to how the system works. And now, Mr Speaker, we have the inconsistencies of allowing the NRL entourage in, in and keeping locals like Stephen out. Lloyd and Cheryl Kavanagh wrote to me to express our disgust at the recent granting of exemptions to enter Queensland for sports teams. This is truly sickening when ordinary Queenslanders are unable to return from interstate because of the supposed shortage of quarantine facilities, but all the sports teams 
uh, have no problem doing so. This rubbish has gone on far, en far enough and it's high time this government full of seat warmers was made aware of how many people in this state are feeling. Premier, your internal polling has got this one wrong. When Queenslanders are locked out of their own state, you've gone too far. If there's room for sporting families, there's room for Queensland families. Speaker. I call the member for Edlands. Deputy Speaker, Skilling Queenslanders for Work um, is a program that was cut by the LNP when they were in government and they unfunded it going into the last election. Deputy Speaker, it is one of the most important programs in my community. It's changing lives. And I want to share um, the speech of a recent graduate, Erin, because this is priceless and you just can't put a value on the change that it makes to the lives of our young people. Erin says, courage, persistence, structure, honesty, support, five key ingredients that have laid the foundation of our future. I knew a girl who was once af afraid to be seen, doing everything in her power to make sure no one knew her name. She travelled without direction with a heavy heart of hopelessness and the ongoing feeling of never being enough. There was no stride in her step. She worked dead-end jobs and searched within her comfort zone for work that she didn't love with people that she didn't like. In spite of her broken spirit, there was still a piece of her that refused to give in. Weary and tired, with nowhere to go but up, she decided to move into an area where she thought she might again find herself. Searching for work, she stumbled upon a community organisation called Running Wild, a traineeship in conservation and land management. Unexpected and unfamiliar, she went for it, and lo and behold, she got the traineeship. She said, this was the beginning of my future. I never expected then that the girl I was would become a distant memory of the woman that I am today. We spent the first few weeks solely focused on team building, and this would be the most crucial part of the program. It built the foundation. As the weeks passed, we fought and overcome challenges. We didn't do it alone, but together as a single unit. We learnt patience for one another and how to utilise our strengths to empower ourselves and each of our teammates. We are a people made up of the most diverse cultures with the craziest stories and consisting of personalities that some would say fit together like chalk and cheese. But the leadership standards and dedication the Running Wild role modelled from day one influenced us to love each other with a mindset that we are all equal. We have all created bonds that build us up and inspire us to be what lies in our potential and not our perceptions. I would like to personally thank Skilling Queenslanders for work supervisor Sheridan and Rose. A key piece that was missing in my life was structure and discipline, and that's exactly what Rose brought to the table. To all the staff at Running Wild, I hope you know how grateful we as trainees are to have had the privilege to work under you. You empowered us with hope, you taught us things we will carry with us for the rest of our lives, and you gave us a home where we will always be welcome. There is always a place for us, and that is only because of the faith and support given by the beautiful people in this community. The time I spent here was not long lasting, but it has reignited my spirit. I have found freedom to move on from the trauma I've struggled through, making new mem memories shaping me for the better. Running wild uncovered the pieces of me lost that is more than I could ever have asked for. So thank you to Erin. You've turned it all around. This is what skilling, work, uh, skilling Queenslanders for Work does. It really, really changes lives. So um, uh, again, I'm privileged to, to chair the um, est estimates for ed skills and training and everyone raves about it. There's not a person in this place that doesn't rave about skilling Queenslanders for Work. It is a fantastic program. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the uh, member from Roochidaw. Thank you. There are so many people who are facing distress and disruption and we've seen and heard more and more stories from small businesses. I've heard the Treasurer claim that short, sharp lockdowns have seen a bounce back in the economy like there wasn't an impact, whereas when I've been going through my community and talking with so many people who don't have full accommodations, who have lost bookings, who do face the prospect of losing their businesses. They are in distress and they feel like the state Labor government treats them as their political pawns. Uh, we believe that the health advice uh, has to be released and that we do want to see people kept safe, but we don't want to see them kept in the dark. Uh, for too long, we've seen this government uh, use the fact that uh, they wouldn't release the health advice how on earth can you have health advice that says it's safe for NRL players and their families, not just the players, but their families, to have priority over Queenslanders coming home? How ridiculous and unfair and wrong that is. We're hearing more and more stories of people in distress who've got genuine need to get home, who not only are being cut off from their families, they're cut off from their jobs, Meanwhile, the family of footballers and their entourage are allowed to come into Queensland and they're given priority. There seems to be uh, two sets of health standards, but we don't see the health advice. It's time that it's released because Queenslanders 
are being asked to do a lot for the public good and public health, and they will do it, but they will not uh, be treated as mugs where you don't release the health advice. There must be accountability, must be consistency, and there has to be compassion. I want to address the issue of the need for fast rail to the Sunshine Coast. The Camcos Heavy Rail Corridor is preserved to Maroochydore, but there is no current plan, transport plan from this government to build it. And I'm calling on the state government to not allow this corridor to be compromised by the lack of work being done on it when there are other pieces of infrastructure and growth happening around that corridor. It's important that work is done now to bring this project forward to allow the business case and design to be done so it is not orphaned, which was the reason, as I understand it, Infrastructure Australia said it was risky because there was no owner. The state government did not have it in their current transport plans and that was identified as a risk. So the, the state government can't blame other people. This is their responsibility to build the state infrastructure but to put those plans forward and to do the work. It's vital this happens now. If we're to see the right infrastructure to take growth forward into the future, let alone what's needed now, this project needs to be uh, not orphaned to go into the current transport plans and have the ownership of government to take it forward. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Bundamba. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased to announce another big win for Bundamba. A lease has been signed for a brand new Transport and Main Roads Customer Service Centre in our local community. The centre at 28 Brisbane Road, Bundamba, will offer a full range of transport services, including licensing and registration. It will be a great asset for Ipswich as the Palaszczuk government continues to revitalise critical frontline services for our local community. The former Red Bank Centre was too small and offered limited services, and the new expanded and improved facility means more room for more customers to access more services. Work is underway on the design, and we expect the centre will be ready to open next year. Deputy Speaker, we're also investing in essential public transport infrastructure. Our record transport budget also included 400,000 to uh, progress the park and ride business case at our busy Red Bank train station. This is an exciting development and follows our commitment to a full $38 million upgrade of Bundamba train station and the recently completed $3 million upgrade at Ebbyvale train station. I want to acknowledge and thank the Minister for Transport and Main Roads for listening to our local community and my advocacy for improved local transport services. In another big win for our local community, it's being delivered as part of the biggest health budget in Queensland history. Speaker, our more than $750 million for Westmorton Hospital and Health Services includes $2.5 million for the new 24-7 Ripley Ambulance Station. This brand new $5 million facility at the corner of Ripley and Montero Roads is great news for our rapidly growing community. The design phase of the project is set to be complete by mid next year and stage one construction is expected to be finished by mid 2024. We'll support pre-hospital ambulance response services and will be an excellent addition to our new state-of-the-art South Ripley Satellite Hospital. Our ongoing commitment to more health services also includes 25 million uh, 26-bed ward at Ipswich Hospital and our $177 million, 174 public bed expansion at Marta Hospital Springfield. It's a pleasure to work with the members for Ipswich Jordan and Ipswich West to deliver record world-class health services for the Ipswich community. Speaker, we recently held our Vietnam Veterans Day commemorations in Goodna and Ipswich, and I'm very proud to say that the thoughts and support of our local community remain with all Australian Defence Force, Defence Force personnel. Our thoughts and condolences are with the families and friends and colleagues of the two Australian Defence Force personnel who were killed in Monday's vehicle rollover near Mingella, west of Townsville. This is a terrible tragedy for our ADF community, and our support also extends to all Australians and Afghan allies involved in past and present military operations in Afghanistan. I, I call the member for Burdekin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Just over three years ago, I stood in this House to speak of the amazing achievements of boxers from the Burdekin PCYC. I spoke about Emma Lawson, who has won her division at the Australian titles, won gold at the Oceania Championships, earned a spot in the Australian team at the Youth World Championships, and was selected to participate in the road to Buenos Aires camp, a pathway to the Summer Youth Olympic Games. I spoke about Damon Pitcher, who has claimed his division at the Australian Championships. 
how he had won gold at the North Queensland Games after stepping up an age division and how he had secured selection in the Boxing Queensland Development Squad. I spoke about Alex Chuck Lawson, Emma and Damon's coach, and the small group of dedicated volunteers, including Russell Dingle, who travelled thousands of kilometres each year to help these young people achieve their goals. I spoke of the pride that our community felt and how Emma, Damon and other boxers from the Burdick and PCYC Club were role models for our youth. And it wasn't just the Burdekin community that was proud. Chook and some of his students were featured in last year's PCYC annual report. Mr Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, that sense of pride and those role models are now gone. After 26 years as a volunteer coach of boxers of all levels, Chook has hung up his gloves and not by his own choosing. The Burdekin and our youth have been let down by the PCYC, not at a local level where staff go above and beyond their duty and where volunteers are constantly fundraising, they have been let down by head office in Brisbane. Mr Deputy Speaker, is it a disgrace that when youth throughout Queensland are losing their way, when they're stealing cars and they're breaking into houses, the hierarchy of the PCYC are standing by at best and watching centres close and programs diminish? The fact is, Queensland taxpayers cover a substantial portion of the costs of our PCYCs via the provision of police officers. Both the police minister and the Minister for Youth Justice should be asking some questions. The contribution by taxpayers to these centres is an investment in the safety of our communities and the future of our youth across the state, regardless of whether they live in the city or in smaller centres like the Burdekin. And it is certainly my fear. Mr Deputy Speaker, that the PCYCs have lost their way over the years and have now become money-driven ventures at the expense of programs like this, like the boxing. But can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, to Chook and all of the volunteers involved with the Burdick and PCYC boxing program, thank you. Call the member for Rockhampton. Mr Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> last week I had the the um, pleasure of having the Treasurer and the Minister for Investment, the Honourable Cameron Dick, in Rockhampton, announcing that Alliance Airlines would establish a facility to maintain its growing fleet of aircraft that are currently um, being maintained overseas. This is an absolute win for Rockhampton. The new $60 million aviation maintenance, repair and overhaul facility will be constructed at the Rockhampton Airport with the support from the Palaszczuk Government's Jobs and Regional Growth Fund. This will mean local jobs. In addition to the administration positions and the apprenticeships, there will be 81 highly skilled aircraft maintenance engineers. These are good paying permanent jobs for Rocky. There will also be approximately 125 uh, construction jobs in building the new hangar, which will be three bays, it's 130 metres wide, 16 metres tall and 65 metres deep, uh, with construction expected to commence in the next few months. I'm sure there will be other flow-on industries that will be establishing themselves in Rockhampton. These are jobs, real jobs for our region. Alliance continues to grow from the resource-based operations uh, to conventional passenger and freight services, and they will see their aircraft fleet expand from 43 to 75 planes over the next 12 months. They also operate flights on behalf of most of Australia's largest airlines and del deliver services across all of mainland Australia, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, and has currently a full-time equivalent staff of 820. As reported in the morning bulletin, when Alliance was looking at doing their fleet maintenance in Australia, the, the choice was narrowed down to a location in Queensland, as the company is already based in the Sunshine State, which then led to Rockhampton being chosen. Alliance Managing Director Scott McMillan said the airport is owned by the Rockhampton Regional Council, so we were talking to the owners, rather than having to talk to the Commonwealth if we did in a capital city. Alliance needed an airport that was not on the coast, and Rockhampton is unique, that it is the largest airport 
in Queensland that isn't on the coast as we were going to have aircraft that were going to sit on the ground for a while, so they need to be in an area where there's non-celluline environment. Mr Speaker, this is a great win for Rockhampton. Another job's bonanza. Deputy Speaker. Before I call the member for Crumbin, can I just remind all members that you must remain in your own seats, uh, and if you want to have conversations in corridors, you need to take them outside. I call the member for Crumbin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My Corumba community is shouldering the burden of the state border closure for the rest of Queensland, and they feel abandoned by the Palaszczuk Labor government. There is no targeted financial support for border businesses who are currently on their knees and falling through the cracks because the current state lockdown package does not cover the impact of rolling border closures. But instead of trying to help my community, instead of trying to find a way to deliver targeted support, Instead of trying to find a way to reinstate the previously successful and safe border bubble, the Palaszczuk Labor government is playing politics with the border, fighting with New South Wales over checkpoints. And to add insult to injury, today we learn that the Premier is opening our state border to NRL families from Sydney while our constituents are locked out of their homes. Two days ago, Corumban Valley constituent, who is in New South Wales for work, was denied entry back into Queensland to be at her dying father's bedside. Yesterday, Deputy Speaker, he passed away. So while the Palaszczuk Labor government was making plans to allow NRL families to come to Queensland, my constituent missed out on saying a final goodbye to her father. You have not called for and we are father. still trying to get her home. Oh, I remember for not Logan. so she can say goodbye now, but so she can be at his funeral. NRL families can have a league bubble. Then the border community can have their border bubble back. And maybe my Tullabudra Valley constituent could have said goodbye to her dad. I wish the Premier would accept my invitation to come to Coolangatta, Mr Speaker, because my community desperately needs the state government to support them. If the Premier were to come to Coolangatta, these are just some of the stories she would hear. Graham is a doctor in Coolangatta. His Queensland surgery runs a COVID vaccination clinic. His cross-border medical support workers are not considered essential. He writes, we are unable to operate or give vaccinations without these support workers. This is sheer insanity. Harriet, a Corumban Valley local, writes, we run a business in the Tweed. 70% of our staff live in Queensland. We employ 64 people. Our Queensland staff are not able to come to work. The Premier has caused so much confusion and anxiety for Queenslanders who live on the Gold Coast, with no roadmap and little detail on how we move forward from this point. Order, members. Kate, who owns Kira Beauty Collective, writes, I haven't been able to pay my rent this month. You all should care about this. I have no clients. Stop Order, members. Listen, my business needs help. The same thing is happening to businesses all over Corumban. Corumban constituents cannot continue to bear the brunt of this border closure without support. Institute the border order bubble members. again. Corumban needs it Resume your seat, member. Time's expired. House will come to order before I call the next speaker. I call the member for Bundaberg. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, this role is full of experiences, that's for sure. And I've had some great experiences already. I've um, been able to commandeer a VMR vessel. I've uh, done a lap around the, the sprint track in Bundy. But I've got to say, there's probably no better experience than my first ever CWA morning tea. Let me tell you, that was something else. That was fantastic. I was very, very excited to be there and have the famous pumpkin scones. I have to say, they were absolutely top notch. So thank you so much to the, the Bundaberg branch of the CWA with our president, Lynn Tucker, who invited me along to the AGM. I've got to say, I enjoyed the experience so much. I may have skipped along to the Burnett AGM that afternoon as well and indulged in a couple of extra scones, some great jam and cream and, and some cream horns as well, which I've never had before. So I've got to say this role full of experiences and great things. But while, while um, I do you know, have a little bit of a laugh about the, the world-famous scones and the pikelets and so forth, at the end of the day, the CWA is a fantastic community group. And well done to the ladies, especially of the Bundaberg branch, who celebrate 97 years. It was their 97th birthday this year. And they were there in the 2013 floods when the community needed the most. And they were there last year as well when we had the, the horrible fire of the federal backpacker hostel and the spotted dog 
but they were there to help those uh, itinerant workers that needed that support. So well done to those ladies, well done to the CWA, and don't worry, I'll, I'll be back. Uh, there's some more cakes and scones there for me to consume. I think 10 kilos is what they say in the first term. Uh, as well as that, also, we had a fantastic day on Sunday where we celebrated the Bundaberg Rugby League. So we had the junior grand finals played on the iconic Salter Oval, and then we had the senior game as well. A big thank you must go to Mike Ireland, who's head of the Bundaberg Rugby League. He's been doing it for a long time. He puts in a lot of hours, a lot of uh, his effort goes towards that, and he's got a fantastic team behind him. And I said to Mike today, is there anyone that you'd like to uh, put out there especially and be thanked in the parliament? He said, look, I could not thank just a couple of people because it's a whole effort. From all of the clubs that are involved, from all of the volunteers, from Wendy, who's down there doing the ticketing as well. So it's a fantastic job done by the Bundaberg Rugby League. And with the last couple of 50 seconds, what I might do is also just mention the great work of the Brennan PNC as well. So the Brennan Road State School PNC, who have worked really, really hard going through the Gambling Community Benefit Funds to get new uh, ceiling fans installed for their school hall. And they've been led by uh, Patricia McCulloch, who's done a fantastic job as the president there. I was very, very happy to go along and uh, listen to that wonderful PNC group who put in, again, time and effort, lots of hours to make sure that they're looking after the school community. And at the end of the day, there is no better town. Sorry, uh, new member for Streatham, but I have to say, Bundaberg is the town of communities. It absolutely is. But we all love our communities. We all love our community groups. Well done to the CWA. Well done to Bundaberg Rugby League and our wonderful PNCs in the electorate as well. Thank, Thank you, speak. Member for Bundaberg. There really should be a standing order against mentioning cream horns in a room full of ang uh, hungry MPs. But I call the Member for Coomera. Oh, Mr Speaker, I uh, just wanted to uh, advise the House that I uh, had the pleasure of speaking, uh, sorry, doing a tour of the new Coomera Special School uh, in the state seat of Coomera uh, with uh, the new principal, Kate Hucker, uh, the other day. It was a long time coming, a little bit of organisation uh, needed to be arranged, but uh, it was a great tour. Uh, we did note that we are in desperate need of a set of traffic lights on the corner of, of Foxwell uh, and the new road going into the school. Uh, we'll definitely need that with a special school with so many buses coming in and out of the school. Uh, you can't rely on the traffic on Foxwell. It is so busy at all times of the day, let alone around, um, around school, school drop-off and pick-up time. Um, the project manager advised me that their target date is late November, early December for the completion of the project, which is absolutely wonderful. It's going to give uh, Kate plenty of time uh, to get in there and, uh, and fully fit the place out, uh, do what she needs to do in that, re that regard. Uh, moving on from that, um, I met with Ian Langdon um, uh, regarding the hospital for Coomera. Uh, the meeting was very, uh, very positive. Um, we, we agreed that we need a short-term, medium-term, long-term um, strategy for the Northern Gold Coast with the massive growth that we've got up there. Uh, we need to get some of the services uh, that simply aren't there at the moment. An example of that is uh, the special buses that, that pick up people uh, going for their cancer treatments and what have you. For them to come to the Coomera electorate to pick up people from Pimpama or Ormo or, or wherever it might be, take them back for their cancer treatments can be a four-hour round trip. In that same time, those same buses can transport any, anywhere between four and six patients. So it's just not affordable for those sorts of things uh, to continue in the long term. So we do need some short-term fix, medium-term fix, long-term fix, and we'll continue to work uh, with Ian Langdon and, um, and Gold Coast University Hospital uh, and Health Board uh, in that regard. Um, great news that the police station is well underway now. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it was a hard-fought uh, project uh, by the local community to actually get the police station in the first place. Uh, it's well and truly underway. Uh, also, the hard-fought 36 additional, absolutely brand-new police officers for the Northern Gold Coast, none of them coming from anywhere around the, um, uh, around the other, other uh, police stations in the area, none from Coomera, none from Beanley, none from, indeed, any of the others. It was great news to see that. It was hard-fought for once again by the community. It's going to take the number of uh, police on the Northern Gold Coast to more than 100, and it's absolutely been desperately needed. Uh, can I just finish with, if every other arm of government was doing as well as Education Queensland, it would be amazing in the state seat of Coomera. 
I call the Leader of the House and the Member for Redcliffe. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about a wonderful organisation in my community called ROPE, R-O-P-E, which provides opportunities and choices for people living with an intellectual disability to reach their full potential. Recently, I had the honour of attending the ROPE TV premiere in partnership with Trending Media in Redcliffe. This is a new online TV show which will be produced monthly by the ROPE participants and will highlight the wonderful things the organisation and its members are doing. You can check it out on YouTube. The first episode was hosted by Michaela and Billy with field reporter Grayson, and it was a marvellous show indeed. They featured tailor-made boot camp where some of the members are getting out and active and caught up with the CEO of ROPE, Wes, to discuss what the organisation is doing for people with disability and what it means to him. This is truly a remarkable initiative. I cannot wait to see the next instalment of Rope TV. I also would like to give a shout out to the mighty Redcliffe Hospital who each and every day go above and beyond for our community and the people of Queensland. Recently, a number of staff were recognised at the annual Staff Excellence Awards. The hospital's MRI team took out the People Focus Award a special thank you to them for installing the MRI machine, uh, funded and delivered by the Palaszczuk government. And can I say the federal member for Petrie should stop claiming that he delivered it. Uh, James Bowden and Rosie Brown took out the Innovation Award for Improved Patient Experience in the ED. Intensive care nurse Luke Tung and the COVID vaccination implementation team took out the Excellence in Performance Award. Nurse unit managers Karen Chippendale and Louise Joyce shared the Leadership Award. Fiona Packwood, Janita Edwards and the Facility Services team took out the Values in Action Award. Jodie Dyer received the Excellence in Integrated Care Award for improving access to midwifery care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. The Excellence in Training and Education Award went to Andrea Flint from the hospital's neonatal unit, another essential clinical area recently upgraded by the Palaszczuk government. The hospital's Executive Directors Award celebrated two essential hospital services for their dedication to frontline health care, the hospital's switchboard operators and their security officers. Deputy Speaker, I want to congratulate all of those nominated and to all award recipients. I say thank you again for all of our healthcare workers at Redcliffe Hospital. We thank you for what you do uh, for our community, for our region, and what you are doing to keep us safe each and every day. I know that it's been tough times, uh, and they are working so hard to deal with the pressures and demands on our hospital systems. They're also testing every day, people walking into the hospital, and now they're vaccinating, and now our First Nations people. I thank them for everything that they do. I declare the House is adjourned until 9.30am tomorrow.